Welcome to the new Chess 24 playing experience. Play in light mode or dark mode. Choose from a range of time controls or create a custom game and get paired with players from around the world fast. Enjoy a polished playing experience while making moves on a fresh, responsive board to claim your victories. Train and improve with over 80,000 puzzles. And that's not all. Download now and discover what more you can enjoy in our brand new app. It's time to take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Magnus Carlsen introduces Chessable, the definitive solution for studying chess. Move Trainer uses the science of spaced repetition to identify your strengths and eliminate your weaknesses. There's no need to set up a board, remember which page you're on, or keep track of all the moves you miss. Move Trainer empowers you to go from the opening to the end game with confidence. It's a seamless, effective, and fun way to study chess. Choose from one of the largest online chess libraries in the world, with hundreds of titles ranging from classic books through to our exclusive chessable courses, including over 100 free courses. Get expert insights from International Master John Bartholomew, Grandmaster Sam Shankland, International Master Christoph Sulecki, Grandmaster Simon Williams, World Champion Magnus Carlsen, and hundreds of other instructors. Get started now and join our growing community of over 100,000 chess enthusiasts at chessable.com. Chessable, take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Welcome everybody. My name is Jan Bomnyshi, former World Chess Champion. Are starting a new course here for Chessable. A very special Chessable course. Master your chess with Judith Bolger. You know what? I learned a lot. Okay, so let's send the challenge. Ah, here is challenging. Nice graphics, easy to see. Oh, what are you thinking about? You're looking how it can be the most painful? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. fine. <laughs> so that I give him up a phone. He wants to be even rude. Follow me, I'm a Okay, so let's send the challenge. Ah, here is challenging. Nice graphics, easy to see. Oh, what are you thinking about? You're looking how it can be the most painful? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. fine. 
said, I give him up a phone. He wants to be even rude. As a kid, I spent hours every day reading about chess. About openings, chess history, and games played between world champions, grandmasters, all of them. My apps make learning much easier. Everything I know you can find in my apps. Magnus Trainer, Tactics Frenzy, and Play Magnus. You can learn the basic rules of chess, train with our 400 lessons, and even play against my digital self. Download and try my apps for free. John. John loves to study chess. This is David. David loves to study chess as well, but efficiently. John spends more time setting up the board and figuring out what's on the page of his book than he gets to study. David likes to take it easy and use his time wisely. David has finished his exercise for today. John should try the same. Hi there, it's me, John Chess, inventor of chess. And are you sick of sucking at chess? Well, lucky for you, I have also invented aim chess. Look at this chess puzzle. Did you solve it? Of course not! That's because you're not using AIM Chess. AIM Chess is a digital chess trainer that helps you improve by creating unique lessons based on your recent games. Just link your chess.com or VChess account and feel that brain wrinkle. Yeah, see, you shouldn't have blundered your queen just there. <gasps> now I know! Thanks, AIM Chess! Now all that's left to figure out is how that funny horse moves. They even got acquired by that one chess player other than Hikaru, so you know it's good. Hi, it's me. That guy I just mentioned, and I am the best chess man in the world. But thanks to Aim Chess, I also have a girlfriend now as well. This could be you! Personalized training, game reports and analysis disease, study plans, thick, luscious hair, intuition builder, all this and more available on Aim Chess. Hello? Courtney, did you know that Aim Chess users improve their ratings 43% faster than average? So what are you waiting for? Join Aim Chess today. Links will be somewhere, probably. I don't know, I just made the video. Aim Chess. Sign up now and get 50k silver and two free months off your VPN. Now that's what I call a queen's gambit. <laughs> that's so fucking dumb. Aim Chess. For when you aim to chess. That's their slogan. It's what they say. Ready, aim, chess. That's another. It's... Look, it, just sign up for Aim Chess, okay? Just... Come on, literally, why not? Alright, just stop being a dick for like five seconds and just go, alright? Jesus Christ. Chessable, the definitive solution for studying chess. Choose from one of the largest online chess libraries in the world. With hundreds of titles, ranging from classic books through to our exclusive Chessable courses. With hundreds of players gathering from all over the globe, Chess Olympiads are something special. They're a celebration of diversity and friendship. And it really puts FIDE's motto into the spotlight. We are one family. With 187 teams in the open section and 162 in the women's section, the 44th Olympiad in Chennai, India is the largest Olympiad to ever take place. In this course, I'm going to provide for you daily highlights, key moments, biggest upsets. 11 rounds. There's a lot of chess. 
<laughs> I am extremely excited about this tournament. What I like most about it is we've got our top tier guys. We got the, the 2,700 plus crowd, including the boss, Magnus Carlsen. But you also have a lot of players that are north of 2,500 feet A that these guys are going to have to play against. And in the Super Elite tournaments, you see a lot of very solid openings. They have to take some risk. And as an openings guy, I'm super excited to see how the top guys handle those players a couple of tiers below them. Hello and welcome to round two of the Chennai uh, Olympiad uh, and we're, we're back with our coverage here. I'm Peter Swidler and with me is uh, uh, Peter Leko. We're very happy to continue covering this, uh, this exciting tournament. And already in round two, we have a lot of very interesting games to look forward to, right Peter? Exactly. Hello Peter, hello everyone. Super excited. I mean, Magnus Carlsen is back in action. It will be a very, very special focus on, on him because he's playing now with the white piece against Georg Maia. That's one of the big games of today, that's for sure. Yeah, I was a little bit... I actually had to do some research because uh, Georg Maier, we, we know him as a German player, but he's playing for, for Uruguay uh, uh, in this Olympiad and I uh got slightly surprised by this but uh his mother is uh for, from uruguay so he has uh he had the option and uh is choosing to represent uh, uh uruguay in this uh in this tournament so yeah we spoke about georg yesterday it will be interesting if he actually plays the the rubinstein today and uh some of his uh vast amounts of theoretical knowledge of the french actually gets to be uh shown on stream but there's plenty of other stuff to look forward to uh fabi who is actually 30 today is also was not given a rest day uh slightly what's your opinion by the way i don't think i have much experience but maybe you do do you like playing on your birthday well first of all yeah happy birthday to fabi well i fully share your thoughts and your worries yeah that uh, playing on birthday it should be some extra pressure, maybe, okay, Fabi is like unhuman, he is just a brutally strong player, maybe he doesn't pay any attention to it. I was always suffering, I was not happy, and, and the thing what I never liked, if somebody reminded the chess tournament and the, the mm. chess players before the game that I had a birthday, then, then I felt like I lost my game right there, yeah? Yeah, I think I maybe played one game in my entire life on, because, uh, uh, you know, my birthday is at that spot where none of the standard things which go on uh, in the chess calendar, none of them are in mid-June. So I think maybe I actually played like once in my entire life. I don't have much experience, but I have a suspicion I wouldn't like it. If, if it wasn't uh, like a usual occurrence, I probably wouldn't like it at all. So it's interesting that he's playing and he's also playing a very strong player. I think he's playing Bachmann, right? Exactly, Axel Bachmann. That, that's the other game. Very interesting because Bachmann is like a 2600 player. I see his rating now is 2588. He's basically a 2600 player. Uh, I don't know exactly how ambitious he is right now. I, I do remember that in 2015 in the World Rapid and Blitz in Berlin, in the very, very last round when already we were fighting for nothing on, on board somewhere very, very far behind, uh, we had a very long game and at the end I was, I mean, I was pushing, pushing, but at the end he was actually completely winning and he didn't win. It was a draw and he was so furious yeah, that it, it, I understood that how much it would have meant to him beating me regardless of the tournament situation. So I know that he was very, very motivated. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, another uh, South American team there playing against the United States, it's uh, it's the team of Paraguay and a very strong team with uh, uh, Buckman is now rated 2588, which is slightly surprising to me in my mind. He's definitely a 2600 player and an actual 2600 player on board too, uh, playing uh, against Wesley. So uh, uh, they've got a Ramirez and uh, a couple of, uh, I guess, it sort of falls off after that. Their board four is a, is a FIDE master with, with 2175, but the top two boards are pretty strong. And there is a lot of already very sort of familiar sounding matchups between, let's say, two European teams. I think uh, you, you get matches like the Netherlands are playing against Portugal and uh, uh, Germany is playing Finland. And th there will be definitely a favorite and an underdog in those matches, but this already sounds like uh, you know, a, a, a European team championship or something. And uh, we will see a lot fewer of uh, of the types of uh, matches we've seen yesterday, of course. And by round three, I think we will start seeing proper clashes of top, top teams. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when I was checking this pairing, of course, yeah, Germany versus Finland with special attention and I was searching for Tommy Nibak, yeah, because, mm -hmm. okay, the legendary uh, Tommy Nibak, but I, I didn't see him on the list, unfortunately, he's not playing. I mean, he's a wonderful player, very, very big strategist. He's truly missing from the fin Finnish team. Yeah, I'm guessing maybe he kind of phased out his uh, uh, his chess a little bit. I, I remember I, I played a very memorable match against him in one of the World Cups in Hante. Uh, where he just destroyed me uh, in game one in some Grunfeld and I had to win on demand to even stay in the tournament. And uh, then we had a very nice conversation with, after after the whole thing was over. And uh, I think he combined, chess, even in those years, he was combining chess with some other games uh, and arguably maybe doing better in the other games <laughs> than, than he was doing, uh, at least uh, in terms of, uh, you know, making a living out of things. I, I got the feeling that he was probably doing better in those other games he was playing uh, than he was in chess. So it's understandable that perhaps at some point he chose to uh, phase it out a little bit. But a very, very strong player and a, definitely a legend of, uh, of modern Finnish chess. Yes, and uh, one, one very surprising, I mean, not very surprising, but still a uh, very special moment uh, when I looked at the Norway lineup. Yeah, Magnus Karsets is in the team, but... Johann Sebastian Christiansen is given a chance to correct himself with the black pieces. So it's it's kind of a psychological... You remember oh. Urkedal on board for yes. crushed his opponent with white, but instead of continuing uh, with Urkedal, they still give the chance for Johann Sebastian to, to find his rhythm. I find it kind of quite interesting. What, what is yeah, your giving, take Giving on him a second black in a row, specifically after yesterday, is... It's like it's both a vote of confidence and also, like, it feels like a bit of a, you know, hazing ritual, like they're, they're testing him a little bit. <laughs> because, you know, yesterday, even though he didn't lose, which improves it very, very significantly, it still was not a very pleasant experience, I would suspect. Uh, so, you know, giving him white today, I would understand. Giving him another black uh, in, a, in a much tougher, I would assume, uh, matchup is... Is a choice, but uh, yeah, they 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 make them tough in Norway. <laughs> exactly, yeah, and we also have a very interesting clash uh, between Belgium and uh, and Spain. On board mm -hmm. one, the very young and very promising, talented uh, Daniel Darda plays against Alexei Shirov. I'm also looking forward to this game. I think we will see far on board in in that one. And the games are lift started. Magnus Kars and Georg Mai is going to be a French. Aha, okay, excellent. I'm 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 very much. I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, let's uh, let's see some Rubinstein because uh, yesterday when I when I brought up that story of Georg Meyer just publishing his files to prevent people from playing a specific line of the Rubinstein against him, uh, so that people don't bore him. Chat was saying the other way not to get bored is not to play the Rubinstein at all, which is sort of fair, but on the other hand, it is surprisingly sharp if White wants it. There's and we have it on line, the board. Yeah, there's definitely some lines in Rubinstein where play could become very, very concrete and very, very sharp. So uh, it, it is absolutely not a given that this will be uh, uh, some kind of a some kind of a boring game. Not at all. 
Wow. To be honest, I'm a little bit surprised by Magnus going E4 against Georg Maia because uh, we spoke about this yesterday and that everybody knows that he's such an incredible big expert here. And uh, Magnus, we know that he's capable of playing any kind of uh, opening, any kind of first move. And he's willing to enter this discussion and now he's spending some time. It, I feel that this is some teasing. Yeah, He definitely had to have something in mind. And C3 is played immediately. Okay, C3, C3 exists, but I'm, I'm a little bit curious about this. Like, what are we trying to achieve compared to, uh, to Knight of 3? It's difficult for me to imagine uh, the, the G1 Knight being developed to any square other than F3. Uh, yeah, like, how, how are we reacting to Knight of 6? Yeah, this is the very first... Well, basically... Ah, does he want to play Bishop D3, maybe? Yeah, but what does it change? Let's say we go C5 here. I I don't know exactly which move orders we should be aiming for, but let's say we go C5 here. Like, what's the... In comparison, what what did we gain? Yes, it's a big big question. I mean, I, yeah. I don't really see what yeah. we gain. If, if this was a round robin, I think we could have a very pleasant 15-minute conversation about this. But this being the Olympiad, and there's like yes. 20, 250 games to cover. So maybe we shouldn't really start discussing the position on move 5 in some French. Uh, exactly. What else do we have? Well, let's take a look at birthday boy Fabiano. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wow. Okay. So this is going to be some sideline of the Spanish with third move bishop c5. Fabiano yeah, no, Castles. I'm actually a little bit surprised by castling here. I mean, it's, it's obviously a perfectly legal move, but uh, c3 actually creates a lot of problems. I, I played bishop c5 once against uh, Sasha Grishuk in a World Cup final, actually, in, uh, in 2011. Uh, but I basically, I wanted to play bishop c5, castles knight of six, uh, which is probably what we will see now, although knight d4 also exists in the current position. But basically, <laughs> the reason I did it via this move order is extremely stupid, but also I'm kind of proud of it. Uh, because at some point, I basically promised myself that I will never, ever, ever play the Berlin with black. And even though I wasn't planning to take on e4, I thought if I play knight f6, I'm cheating. So I have to play bishop c5, and if he castles, I will play knight f6, and it's not really a Berlin anymore. So I can do this without breaking my word. But, but after c3, you are kind of in trouble. <laughs> it's not much fun. Uh, so I was, yeah, I, it was a kind of a stupid thing to do, but I mean, I, I, I do stupid things very often, so it's okay. Yeah, but then there is the big question that why Fabiano did not play c3. I, I also suspect that, you know, when suddenly your opponent plays bishop c5 and it's maybe unexpected, then you just don't want to fall into yeah, the provocation. I think yeah, it's that's yeah, because Black has some weird things to try here, like a 5 exists in this position, for instance. And if you don't know exactly what you're doing, yeah, d4, f takes e4, and uh, some really strange positions uh, could uh, could arise. Uh, and uh, yeah, if, if you're not sure what's going on, it's very easy to just say to yourself, I don't need this, I can just play normally, and uh, uh, whatever happens will happen. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Axel is uh, uh, thinking here. I think he's actually considering knight d4, because normally, I mean, knight g7 exists, but I don't think knight g7 is a particularly strong move. Uh, so your choice here, I believe, is between knight d4 and knight f6. And uh, both are perfectly legitimate, uh, and uh, both are quite playable. Yeah, but he's taking his time, like if he really wanted to provoke c3, right? It, uh, it feels like it. Yeah, maybe, maybe he expected c3 and had some ideas there, yeah. Wow, I, I run into a little technical problem. My mouse is uncontrollable somehow. So many games to, to upload for the system, probably. Now we are actually having all the games. I hope that it will run smoothly. Now I'm a little bit worried that I lost contact to my mouse. Luckily, well, it's, now it's, it's moving, back. But very, it's moving, but very slowly. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, now it's now it's back. Yeah, oh, okay, excellent. Okay, yeah. good. Ah, and Magnus, by the way, opted for knight gf6, bishop d3. However, I still don't know exactly what he wants. Yeah, yeah like we can start comparing this to uh, to the normal uh, normal lines because uh, like if you play knight of three, knight of six, bishop d3 is one of the absolute main moves there. Uh, and uh, we can maybe try to figure out 
what would be the difference because you can definitely do this yeah like knight of three knight of six bishop d3 is a very very serious move i think i played this myself more uh, more than once um yeah and uh if uh if we're having some issues we're having some issues those are those are the the, the breaks um yes exactly i i just can't play them yeah, I, I can see you trying to play bishop d3 and uh, <laughs> yeah. the <laughs> the machine telling you no uh which is a bit a bit frustrating but i'm sure we'll figure it out yes okay now for the i mean this is exactly what i thought like it's magnus's idea yeah that now he leads the bishop to fc and then again see if i maybe we'll go 92 or something mm -hmm. this this made at least sense for me but uh you yeah, immediately hit me with c5 and i didn't know what to do yeah, I know I think, yeah exactly and i was going to say we're also now we have the option of putting the bishop on c2 instead of d3 which is maybe a little bit better i still don't really know why it will make such a huge difference but maybe it improves it improves uh things a, a, a tiny bit and that would be the, the the difference between those two lines because now let's say c5 knight of three uh, we get a normal looking position but the bishop went all the way back to c2 instead of uh, uh instead of d3 which i guess magnus and and his team uh think uh it, it is an improvement so uh we'll we'll uh let uh georg figure it out although he still is playing quite quickly and honestly knowing georg it's very possible that he's looked at c3 at some point in his life while we're also watching uh, the, the footage from the playing hole. We discussed it yesterday when the playing hole was empty and it was even more obvious. But this is a very nice, uh, you know, spacious, uh, spacious hole, plenty of space between the boards, which is very important. And uh, yeah, seems like a very pleasant venue to be, to be playing in. And also while we are on this slightly enforced technical break, I want to uh, remind our viewers that there's a number of things you can check out on the on the chess 24 website first of all uh if you want to go premium uh for the duration of the olympiad at the very least there is currently a uh uh 50 discount ongoing premium with the code uh olympiad 2022 uh make sure to spell it correctly i would probably you know i i, I would need to <laughs> Make sure I don't make any spelling mistakes in that, but uh, it is a very good deal, obviously, with a with a fifty percent discount. And there is also some uh, very nice free coaching videos on chess24.com/free, uh, and also check out because there can never be enough social media. And I feel extremely strange saying those words when I'm on air with Peter Lecker, who famously does not really do social media very much, and I think he's you know much much the better off for it. Uh, but there is also the wall on Chess24, which is yet another way to to connect to other people and, uh, you know, doom scroll to your to your heart's content. Uh, so, yeah, plenty, plenty of stuff to check out on the website. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll figure out the kinks with the uh, with the viewer, because, yeah, at some point we would we would want to start showing you games, of course. Uh, and yeah, the, the 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 board on your screen right now is uh, Hare Krishna is back in action. He uh, he, he skipped uh, day one yesterday, but he is playing today um, against. Uh, let me check briefly uh, exactly who he is playing against. Uh, he's playing against uh, Ivan uh, Shitko, a player I uh, do not know. I have to say, but uh, clearly a young Moldovan player who is. Uh, uh, white against Harry, uh, Arjun uh, Ergaisi is uh, is going to be white on board two against Andrei Makave in that match. Uh, Vladimir Hamitevich is board three against Narayanan, and uh, uh, Yulian Baltag is going to be uh, on the black side against Sashi. So, um, a somewhat, oh, I mean, obviously a very similar team with only one reserve allowed. So uh, Harry coming in for India one. Uh, instead of Vidit and the rest of the team is uh, the same as it was yesterday. Uh, plenty of uh, plenty of matchups, as we as we uh, said already. Plenty of matchups to to look forward to. Uh, definitely, board one uh, is going to feature you know grandmaster duels in in many many matches today. Uh, 
I think like in the top 20, in the top 20 matches, I think uh, the, the, the majority of them will feature, uh, I don't know, majority may be strong, but definitely uh, plenty of them will feature uh, Grandmaster fights on top boards. Um, as we as we continue waiting for uh, for the slight technical issues to resolve, We're back, and we also have uh, new cameras. And you can, as you can see on your screen, this is uh, Georg Meyer trying to uh, finally pausing and uh, trying to figure out what's going on in that slightly different uh, French uh, that he got against Magnus. This is still, I believe, a theoretical position, but with the bishop on d3, right? So the difference is uh, the bishop is on c2, which I guess. If black plays naively, like if you castle here, for instance, yeah, and bishop g5, you play something solid like. Uh, weird that what's happening. Ah, uh, yeah. So bishop g5, bishop g7. You want to play bishop c6, you want to play queen d5, something like that. And now I play queen d3. And now there is a difference between the bishop on d3 and the bishop on c2. A pretty large difference. This position might be just straight up bad for black now, because I think maybe the best move is rook e8, just giving up the pawn h7 with check. Uh, because otherwise you have to play g6 maybe, and that's even worse. Uh, so this, I would guess, is the reason for what Magnus is doing. Uh, but Meyer still quite quickly uh, plays uh, b7, b6, which is an interesting move, considering that you can't really play bishop b7 with a king on e8, right? Because bishop a4 check will be painful. So what are we doing if I play bishop g5 here? All right. So I first of all I believe in Georg. Yeah. So yeah. I, have I mean, to... he, he he is on one twenty five after supposedly either a novelty or or a very rare move by Magnus. He is still on one twenty five, and Magnus is on one thirty two. Magnus hasn't spent any time yet. He's just accumulated time. But Georg is really not pausing either. Yeah, it's quite impressive how how much he knows about the French. 
Yeah, I think also a couple of information I know Georg quite, quite well. I mean, I was uh, teammates with him. The reason why I'm saying I was because actually he moved back to Baden-Baden for, for the last season already uh, from my team, Dejzau. And uh, I know that, first of all, he spent uh, his, his childhood in Uruguay. So he's uh, kind of uh, absolutely feeling himself at home there. Uh, and for the, the switching, yeah, there had been some big, big scandals in, in German chess between him and the Federation. And, uh, and then finally it resulted in him leaving. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's why he's not representing Uruguay. Another very interesting twist is that I believe that around 2010, he was kind of a training sparing partner of uh, Magnus Carlsen. Because mm. like I know, he played a lot on, uh, on internet. Mm -hmm. And then Gary, Gary noticed... Georg, that actually this Georg Meyer is, is a very tough guy to, to play, to play with. And uh, back then, Gary was working with Magnus and was suggesting Magnus to work with Georg. So actually, they have quite a lot of history from back then. Oh, this, this, this I didn't know. Yeah, the, the German Chess Federation is a topic I was aware of, but I, I thought maybe we shouldn't touch very, you know, very seriously because it, it's not, not a very pleasant topic for anyone involved. I, I, you know better than me, but even I, from from my long association with Gusti, I've heard some stories, and uh, I think people in general have had their issues with the with the Schachbund. Uh, and uh, yeah, the if you have the option, uh, as Georg clearly does, of playing uh, of playing for his uh, sort of uh, the, the the country of his birth, potentially, you can you can see why he's doing that. Uh, for sure. Yeah, and also we should mention one thing. Yeah, that now there is a new generation coming in German chess. Yeah, and and Georg Meyer is not a professional chess player anymore. Yeah, he's working mm -hmm. in Drenke Bank in Baden Baden. He's he's a very very strong twenty six hundred plus player. Yeah, in in his prime, I think he was very very close to twenty seven hundred level. A very very solid, uh, very good theoretician and and so on player. But he's not that professional. And now with all this, uh, Vincent Kaime, Matthias Blubaum, Dimitri Kolars, uh, Rasmus Vane, Alexander Donchenko, there is a completely new wave. So it's also kind of understandable that Georg probably was looking for an option, yeah, to mm -hmm. to to find he he loves chess. And uh, and yeah, this is a wonderful opportunity, and he can play on board one. It, mm -hmm. I think he's also kind of satisfied with this. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, you know for him, it's an opportunity to play against uh, against the best. Already today, he's playing. I mean, <laughs> he's not going to be playing against the world champion every day. <laughs> there's there's only one <laughs> world champion in this tournament. But uh, yeah, obviously, obviously, playing board one is uh, is very exciting and gives you it gives you a chance to measure. Uh, against the very best, so yeah, it's uh, it makes perfect sense from from his viewpoint. Yeah, and now let us go to the Indian first team because we have the debut of uh, Hari Krishna on mm -hmm. board one. Actually, you remember we got confused. I don't know if you have known. I I wasn't exactly sure that he's who is the official board number one for for India. And yeah, I said I said uh, I gave a speech about Vijay leading his country. Uh, I. I could maybe just take it back, but I, I will pretend that even playing kind of reserve board one is still board one. And, you know, I will I will issue a lot of apologies over the course of this tournament, but I decided not to apologize for that particular thing. It's <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah in... exactly. But, but, you know, I was also not exactly sure because it's, uh, I, I think that they are so evenly matched, yeah, that, and, and both are ready to, to be leading the team. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, probably the reason was that, okay, Harry is after all older, yeah, so mm -hmm. probably he's the one who should take the most responsibility. And yes, one, one thing about Vichy, I, I really want to say a couple of words about Vichy because, okay, Vichy is just an incredible legend and mm -hmm. a very, very good friend of mine and, and the other Peters. Uh, I think that it was it was a very, very nice decision from him, actually, to give kind of the freeway now for, for all the youngsters. Yeah, because if Vichy would be playing, we know that he's fantastic, but the other players would feel like, oh, of course, Vichy is playing, he's the commander, he will take care of everything. And this is a team event. It might be that this, this kind of support that Vichy is giving from the outside and he shows this incredible belief and he's uh, taking care of all the... He, he has done this incredible chess academy where mm -hmm. all the youngsters are developing and, and being trained and so on. I think that this was, this was a fantastic decision by Vichy and, and to, to me it, looks, it, it makes a lot of sense. 
I just wanted to to say it, and I think also for the players, maybe it's better that you know if otherwise Vichy the legend is playing, you feel like he's the absolute leader, but then maybe you are holding yourself a little bit back. Yeah, it's a lot of psychology involved. Now they know that they have to go, and they are the ones who who have to show everything. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good point. Yeah, it it does. Obviously, the team would be stronger with him playing tremendously. You know, much much stronger. But uh, it does give a very clear signal to the new generation that it's now up to you and uh, you know go and go and show uh, show your best chess. Uh, it, this is this being a home Olympiad as well. I think it's a you know tremendous honor and uh, you know very exciting time for for you know Harry Vidit and. Uh, uh, the rest of, you know, all, honestly, all three of Indian squads there, all three are extremely strong and, uh, yeah, very, very uh, exciting time for them to be representing their country. Yeah, uh, and now let's let's talk one more time about Shashi, because yesterday we have seen he was the one who produced this brilliant game with the black pieces. Now he plays with the white pieces and it feels like to me that they, they believe in Shashi. They, they just want mm -hmm. to give him as many games as possible. I don't know how much he will be resting. But what I wanted to actually tell you that when I was working Team Vichy for, for the Chennai match 2013, then I had the chance to work with, with Sasi. And uh, I mean, I was just completely stunned that he is a non-stop machine. I mean, <laughs> there is just no amount of work that that can uh, that, that can stop him you know asking for more it was it was mm. just unbelievable and not only this but during uh, the the training camp you know like we were working from 11 in the morning till like midnight or past midnight and uh, the gathering was like at 11 o'clock you have to be ready for the for the next day session and whenever we came like completely exhausted to the breakfast, like 9, 30, 10 o'clock, Shashi was already coming back from a big run. He already had shower, you know, he was smiling at us with all his energy, like, I'm completely ready, guys. It, it, was, it was such a nice, and he was a fantastic motivator. It was lovely to work with him. Yeah, he's a, he's a very, very nice guy to be around for sure. Yeah, and uh, we, we've all known him for, for ages and ages. I've never worked in, uh, you know, in the same... Uh, in the same team as him, but yeah, I've uh, I've played against him plenty, and he's he's a very very nice nice guy, and uh, uh, you know, an inspiration to uh, I'm sure that to the new uh, uh, generation of the Indian players. And we're also being informed that he's a very strong correspondence player, which uh, I didn't know. But yeah, some people have you. It's a bit of a kind of a left field topic, but have you ever? Like, did, did any research into uh, sort of the modern state of correspondence chess? No, I, I did, didn't really get involved, but I know that Shashi is such a fanatic, yeah, that, that he's ready to, you know, take on any challenge. Mm. And uh, he was always, you know, following every kind of correspondence game, every new development, what are the new engines saying, what, what are the, the fashions and so on. I, I was truly amazed. Uh, of course, uh, I have also seen some of his games in correspondence chess, and I felt very, very, uh, you know, how how to put it? I was kind of feeling sad for for Shashi that he played a wonderful game, you know, but opponent also played a wonderful game, and, <laughs> and he got yeah. neutralized. You know, can you believe he got neutralized? But yeah, yeah, he's enjoying it for sure. Yeah, for for me, it was a kind of a revelation because I've. Uh, I've never really. I, I, I'm of course aware of the of these things, and uh, you know that there is a kind of a very interesting scene. Like specifically, like only computer chess, of course, is a very interesting source in particular of opening information these days. And there's also a very uh, thriving uh, correspondence chess uh, theme. But for me, the kind of a, the revelation on this topic was I had a conversation. I think during one of the I think I played Italian Rapid one year and I started talking to, to Igor Kovalenko and he told me that he basically did like non-stop correspondence chess for a year uh, as an attempt to like open yourself to new ways of studying chess, new ways of looking at chess. And he said after about a year he just quit completely because it's like it's very, very different to what we're used to. And it also, like, it changes the way you look at things too much, maybe. 
But he said that this one year of just playing very, very high level correspondence showed him a lot of things he normally probably would not have figured out for himself because it forces you, for instance, one thing that impressed me a lot was, for instance, he said, it forces you to look at end games in a way that you normally don't have to look at end games because the end games you get in practical chess, both of you have 20 minutes, both of you understand that there is no way you will figure out what's going on properly. So you trust your, your feeling and you, you play the best you can, but you know that things are getting, you know, left behind, things are getting missed. But if you're playing correspondence end games, you sit down and you figure out what it is. Otherwise your opponent will do that and you will, you will leave points on the table. And he said that it, it forced him to approach endgames in a completely new light. And it was very, very interesting and very beneficial to him. Uh, so I remember that conversation very distinctly because I thought to myself, this sounds interesting. Maybe I should do this. And then, of course, I did nothing about it. But, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was an interesting conversation. But then I can actually reveal you a secret because I haven't been involved like this. But I recently, the last one, two years, because I was also doing a lot of coaching and, and so on, I was uh, building some materials. I was rechecking uh, some of my famous uh, old end games yeah, that I played. And I remembered that, yeah, they were special. And, and let's finally take a look. And you know how much you discover and yeah, you realize that everything imagine. that you saw during the game and after the game and after this uh, just very, very little analysis where you try to confirm what you were thinking. Yeah. I mean, it has nothing to do with reality and like some 10 pages of analysis were created with computer. And, and if he was doing it for a year, I can imagine how much he has benefited from it. Yeah, it's a, it's genuinely a, uh, I wouldn't recommend it like for, for people watching us uh, who aren't necessarily all professional chess players. I don't know how beneficial it would be for for amateurs, but for for somebody trying to take your uh, your understanding of chess to the next level uh, with already like a, a solid, a solid grounding, it might be a very interesting avenue of uh, of looking at chess differently for sure. Yeah, and now let me come to one of the most boring positions of the Olympiad uh, on, on round two. And uh, guys can easily ask me, what is uh, Peter thinking about it? I take full responsibility. I just want to explain a couple of things. And it's, I think, very, very important. Uh, now in this match between US and Paraguay, uh, Wesley is playing on board two against a 2600 plus player, uh, Delgado Ramirez. He, he used to be a Cuban uh, grandmaster. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's kind of, you know, you play from the black side. It's clear that United States is a clear favorite. Uh, Vesely so opts after e4, e5. So basically, it's his opponent with respect. He doesn't want to play some speculative opening. He expects his 2600 player maybe to play for a win, try something, because on the other boards, they are clearly outmatched, yeah? Mm -hmm. So he plays like this. And then suddenly his opponent goes for the four knights. And after bishop b5, bishop b4 takes on c6, d takes c6. Now, if he's going to continue taking on e5, basically, I'm, I'm expecting the game to finish in like 50 moves because there is just nothing to play on, yeah? Yeah, and black actually needs to be a little bit careful, even somewhat surprisingly. It's not, as is often the case in those types of positions where you, you have this, like, obviously, white begins first. So if, if it's like a full, full symmetry... It's not much, but sometimes you have to be a little bit careful. Maybe not here, though. I'm, I'm a bit surprised he took on c6, move 5 instead of move 6. I think exactly. including, yeah. including castles, castles, and doing it on move 6 is even safer. Because let's say if you castle here with white, and I mean, knowing Wesley, he probably just castles without thinking. But if you wanted to continue playing the game, you can play something like, I don't know, queen e7 or uh, knight d7 or some kind of a move like this. Uh, you're not going to be better, but at least you are not allowing those very, very equal positions, which are, oh yeah, like if, if Black Castle's here. Yes, I uh, mean, just to, yeah, just to mm -hmm. highlight, yeah, what we are talking about, yeah, that if Castle's, Castle's, Bishop takes c6, it's more forcing, yeah, that's mm -hmm. also kind of, maybe the Delgado does not want to uh, force uh, a symmetry, that's, that's another issue, but yeah. this is what uh, you, you and, mentioned, And also, right? maybe maybe we're actually kind of, uh, maybe we're lying about what Delgado wants, because honestly, in this position, if you, instead of knight takes e5, if you play d3 here, this is one of the 
like honest attempts to get something that exists in the four knights and then you play like knight e2 you play i don't know h3 king h1 rook g1 g4 knight g3 you know like uh you just pretend this is an anti-berlin with slightly different move orders and and you play for an attack on the king side because your pawn structure is so solid that black doesn't really get to develop much counterplay very quickly but the fact that he took on c6 on move five i think is a bit of a hint that he probably uh is playing it quite safe today yeah but now he's thinking yeah so yeah. Ba mm -hmm. basically no nothing uh, it was just like very interesting that yeah it's symmetry and and people might be wondering that uh why best is allowing this i just wanted to highlight that it's a team event yeah you you play with the black pieces against a strong mm -hmm. player you you don't want to take extreme risk yeah you just play your game if you have a chance you you push and you are expecting actually your teammates to because uh, they will get one extra white yeah that's uh, absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, another sort of in on that topic uh, you could mention that after bishop b5 i think these days the accepted wisdom is that you play 94 and you equalize right but that does allow what is kind of universally understood to be just an immediate draw with knight takes d4 and d5. Uh, if yes, white exactly. wants to, yeah. If but white but wants we to... also got an answer to our question. Yeah, and he plays d3. So yeah, we we yes. apologize for everything we said about uh, about Delgado. He is just trying to play a chess game. Yeah, and basically, you know, I have been working with Amador Rodriguez, a very very good theoretician and and a very very nice person. Well, he would say that a Cuban will always fight. Yeah, that, that yeah. is just uh, they, they take this kind of chess games very, very principled. There is no way that they're gonna force some draw with knight xd5 and symmetry. Yeah, and and then you have to ask yourself if he chose not to include castles, castles. Maybe he wants something like bishop d2, queen e2, and castle long. Ex exactly. That's also what closed my mind. That maybe he wants to try to make use of this bishop on b4, yeah, because it's a dif big difference compared to the bishop on c5. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah, it could it could actually become, in particular, if White chooses to castle uh, castle kingside, it could become quite sharp and quite uh, quite double edged. Uh, but yeah, it's very nice to see that he's playing d3 here because we, you know, it means that we have. We have very much uh, a game on our hands instead of potentially a very, very quiet affair with not very much happening. Okay, so let's also take a look at uh, the game that I have been speaking about, speaking about before already. Mm -hmm. Daniel Dard against Alexei Shilov. So what was it? It was e4, c5, knight, fc, d6. Yeah, Shilov was ready to go for the Nidorf. Bishop b5, check bishop d7. Yeah, somehow white players are so fed up of Nidov because even after millions of uh, of variations and and tons of uh, hours spent, you still don't have any advantage. And we, if you analyze very very deeply with computers, all the very sharp lines actually end in draw. Mm -hmm. And then you ask yourself, why do I need this? And then Bishop B five comes very handily. Yeah, but this is still. Uh, it's interesting that Sheriff goes for this because, in particular, I think this move queen c seven is connected at least one of the uh reasons people play queen c7 in this position as far as i know is if you play b3 here which looks like the most natural move in the position right there is this very long forcing line which goes like queen a5 bishop d2 knight takes e4 knight takes e4 queen e5 looks like we've won some material but actually we haven't because white can play i think queen c2 is the move here right maybe yes, queen b1 exactly. black goes f5 Bishop c3, take on e4 twice, we go knight b5, and the pawn on e4 falls eventually, and we get this endgame, which is supposedly a little bit better for white, but I think most of the games end in a draw. Uh, so... Yeah, you, you know, Peter, when did I encounter this for the very first time? When I was playing a match against Magnus Carlsen in 2018, Mishkolz, and he was playing the Dragon. Mm. And he he somehow solved his problem in the very first game. And I was thinking like before I get into some theoretical debate or I continue the theoretical debate there, let me try to test him with bishop b5 check. And then I was trying to find a new way. And it was exactly at that moment, I think, when uh, Michael Adams, Mickey invented this HD move order. And then I immediately I looked at it 
And I also discovered the, during the preparation that Black has this queen c7, queen a5, knight e4, and it's probably draw. And knowing how good Magnus plays all these end rings, I did not really believe that I will have any chances. However, luckily Magnus didn't know queen c7 yet. He just played some normal stuff, and I got a playable nice position. Mm -hmm. But that, that was the moment uh, that, that I first discovered this queen c7 business. Yeah, and I see something on my screen which actually <clears throat> made me open chess base because, you know, I'm not playing, so I'm allowed to cheat. And uh, because uh, a little bit further down from the position we're discussing right now, there is a very familiar picture uh, in uh, Nino's game against. Uh, uh, who is he playing? Yeah, against. Uh, uh, I will mispronounce this name horribly. <laughs> uh, Merivaut uh, Sim. Uh, uh, from from Belgium, yeah. I, I'm I'm sorry for the the horrible horrible way I've just pronounced that. I get the feeling that this is what I'm giving in the course, and I'm very curious because I think d5 I did not analyze, but I think up to bishop e6, this is still everything uh, everything according to uh, to what I suggested in the course, which is very very nice for me. I like uh, I like seeing that very very strong players uh, such as uh, uh, David Anton are. Seemingly in agreement with me on this topic, but I just want to check. Uh, yeah, so then maybe we can just go through from the beginning and you can literally explain us what happened. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, uh, this is the uh, the Queen A4 check uh, subline of the Grunfeld, which looks kind of weird, but has gained a lot of popularity recently because it manages to sidestep uh, what Black normally wants to do. Uh, we're getting checked before we can castle, so we need to put something, uh, I mean, on d7, probably c7, c6 doesn't look very attractive here. So all three moves here are possible. I played bishop d7, I played knight d7, definitely. I think I may have played queen d7 as well, although this one I don't remember. Knight d7 is by far the main move. And uh, after knight of three castles, there is now some discussion here, like I will probably have to update uh, this chapter at some point, because I think the most topical move in this position currently is Queen A3, uh, which is something uh, that I think Hikaru has done uh, a number of times online, and also Prague uh, played it, I think, against uh, uh, Niels Grandelius this year in an over-the-board tournament. I uh, can't remember exactly where. Uh, but the point was, yeah, in Vike, yeah, exactly, thanks, Satiris. But Bishop E2, instead of Queen A3, Bishop E2 used to be and continues being by far the most popular uh, move in this position. And Black used to, like, automatically play C7, C5 here without much thought. Uh, and then White castles, and it's not that you definitely don't equalize, but there's definitely questions to be answered there. I... I think black probably is fine, but I wasn't very happy with how the games were uh, coming out in this line. And when I was preparing the course, I thought, can we maybe move move away from this long theory somehow? And I settled on this idea of playing knight b6, where basically we are trying to uh, uh, go for slightly different setups. We will, of course, be playing c5 in some positions, but we want to play knight b6. We want to put the bishop on e6 in many cases. And also, we're, of course, we're asking the queen to go somewhere. A3, I think, in most cases, is the most natural square on the board. And then we immediately hit it with the move queen d6, making it kind of awkward for white to develop further, because you would like to play, like, bishop f4 would be a very good move next move. Bishop g5 would be a fantastic move next move for white. But now it's not possible because the queen on a3 is hanging. Uh, and taking on d6 is, of course, not very attractive for white at all because it improves our structure and uh, gives us a very comfortable game. Uh, and yeah, I think this is just fine for uh, for black. Castles bishop e6 followed in the game today. And uh, yeah, uh, d4, d5, I definitely don't remember looking at d4, d5, but it doesn't look like it's going to refute the idea. I think bishop g4 is very logical, but you can also make an argument for just playing bishop d7, I guess and then trying to push, I don't know, c6 or e6 and undermine the, the center. What do you think about all of this? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm actually really liking this uh, setup from, from Black Side. You know that I was also a big uh, Grunfeld yeah, of course, fan yeah. in, in my youth. Yeah, I was enjoying. And what I see here, I'm, I'm just very, very happy from the Black Side. I mean, 
White got provoked into d4, d5 too early. Probably this c4 square was really bothering him, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, and okay, now black should be perfectly fine. It's the question how black should try to fight to, to seize the initiative, I believe. I, yeah, exactly. Like, by this point, I would be feeling that maybe I should be fighting fighting to be better, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I did not look at d5 in the course. I, I, I discussed some other moves, but uh, d5 is, uh, is not mentioned because I really don't think it it's an improvement over, uh, you know, anything else. Uh, but yeah, this is this is nice for me because I looks like people have not refuted my ideas yet. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, let me tell you a few things about your course. I I haven't uh, watched your course. It's not about this. I I simply know your incredible knowledge and understanding of of Grunfeld, and I heard many people praising uh, what what you have been doing. And I think the whole chess world is always looking forward uh, to, to see what, what you are saying in, in the Grunfeld. And I believe that this is a very important point that people should get the, get the spirit of the opening, yeah? not to memorize all moves and, okay, now D4, D5 is not in the course. Of course, you don't have to mention a move like D4, D5 because you give the spirit and then yeah. the player has to, to, to find his way over the board. And this is very, very important because if you guys try to memorize every move or you, you are looking at why it's not in the course, no, no, if you get the spirit, then you will handle everything on the board. And I know that this is what you are always providing the, the spirit and the critical variations you analyze yeah. till the very end. I think that's the, that's the best thing. And, and it's so wonderful to, to have all this insights from you at least at least that was always my my intention i you know i'm <clears throat> i'm sure that you know in some in some lines and in some uh, in some positions it got it got across better in some, and in some less less well but my my dream was always not just to give forced variations but also to try and uh, uh you know get across some of the main points of the opening so that can be so that people can uh, you know pilot it themselves if they encounter something they haven't seen before yeah, and the, as for this position, yeah, I'm pretty sure black is completely comfortable. The question is whether you can already start pushing for for an edge, or if you're still just equalizing comfortably. But I would I would quietly start feeling very optimistic, even just bishop d7, and then yeah, as I said, start attacking the white center with I don't know c6, c6, maybe even f5 in some positions. That center does look quite vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, okay, I think it's up to, to David Anton now to find his way here to, to decide how he wants to approach mm -hmm. this game because I'm pretty sure he's happy. And what about the, the Magnus game? Because we have some yeah. development and exactly those things that, that we talked about and you asked that what will Black do after, after a move like Bishop A4 check later to Bishop B7? What did Magnus do? Magnus opted for Queen D3. Yeah, he played Queen D3. Team. Yeah, instead of bishop g5, which I think is a more flexible choice because it, it keeps your options more open. Uh, castling is still completely unplayable because of bishop g5. Uh, but we're also kind of hinting maybe at queen g3, which could be a very awkward move for black to face in some situations. And we also just very simply we're saying, okay, please, you know, choose something, make a move. And Georg, after some thought, finally... 111 on on black's clock means that he probably spent like 15 minutes on uh on that choice he goes bishop b7 and of course bishop a4 check comes in and now i mean knight d7 looks extremely ugly maybe just completely unplayable because of queen g3 in fact could just be close to losing so we're choosing between like being the 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 carp of students and playing king e7 which i don't believe in i think we're playing king f8 yeah, probably. And and it brings me back, you know, the very first thought that you remember you, you highlighted this, that castles and then bishop this and bishop c6. And mm -hmm. at that moment, uh, Georg already played the move b6. To my eyes, the move bishop d7 looked the most seven? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of weird to me because if I were choosing between b6 and bishop d7, I would pretty much always just choose bishop d7s here without without much doubt even in my decision because it feels like on c6 it's a lot more solid it never allows those checks from the uh, a4 a8 diagonal and yeah you you definitely want it on a long diagonal but this looks to me like a much more much more stable way of achieving what we want to be achieving here with black yeah i'm a bit surprised about b6
Yes, exactly. I mean, Bishop D7 looks very, very natural. And, and after B6, Queen D3, Bishop B7, Bishop A4. Yeah, if black somehow. But the problem is that this Queen on D3 is so nice against the usual typical way of <laughs> you, you can't even get to H7, yeah? No, no, you, you, you're going to be struggling here. But I guess maybe we play, like, we will have to play it very, very slowly, uh, like King F8. What does white do, though? Because I will be playing 95 against most things. And then maybe F6, King yeah, F7, Yeah, and then right? maybe F6, King F7. That's the dream, yeah. Achieving something like this is the dream for black. Getting the king out to F7, connecting the rooks. The queen will probably go to D6 or E7, uh, some of those squares. And, I mean, it looks awkward. But I also don't entirely know how white is supposed to you know, exploit the fact that we are uh, not castled and the rooks are disconnected. You can't really play bishop g5 because queen d5, I think, is very strong. As far as I can tell, this just doesn't work tactically at all uh, because of this double attack on, uh, on g5 and g2, meaning that you can't really stop knight g5 from happening. And with the knight on d5, the c file is open, but the knight on d5 covers the all important c7 square, so you can't really go like bishop f4, bishop g3, rook c1, rook c7. Um, which should give black time to finish development somehow. But on the other hand, white will be putting pressure on the e6 pawn, yeah, with some rook e1, maybe just even simple bishop d2, rook e1, and it will never be so easy to get f16. Mm -hmm. And by the way, our uh, absolutely uh, un un incomparable chat is explaining why not bishop d7. Apparently, Meyer had this position before, and he played bishop d7, and he was worse after e4, rook a3. Wow. Okay, that's that's. Thank you very much, because as a commentator with all these games, uh, spotting a4, rook a3, and knowing that this is so important, it's almost impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Skip60. Uh, this is very useful information because, yeah, you know, once again, if you spend ten minutes here discussing things, you will find this idea probably. But uh, we have so much going on that. Ah, uh, and this also explain why, explains why the bishop on c2 is so good, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. It just goes to g3, and it's actually very, very awkward to protect the pawn on g7. Uh, very nice idea, and, 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 does, uh, and, and, and does a lot of, uh, does, I mean, explains a lot from, from previous play. Yeah, and also just to highlight that, yeah, it's very important that the timing, yeah, that after Queen mm -hmm. D5, we have Rook G3 protecting, attacking yeah. at the same time, and, and thanks to this, White is having the upper yeah, if hand. Queen wow. D5, if Queen D5 was forcing us to play F3, this entire idea is dead. But yes. we're just in time to uh, to play Rook G3 here, and yeah, Black, Black seems to be in uh, in decent amount of trouble, actually. Um, and, uh, All right, okay. Now at least we understand uh, why Magnus actually felt like he, he's ready to enter this uh, territory, mm -hmm. the Rubinstein French, yeah? Yeah. We are learning. Finally, we are learning, yeah? <laughs> so it's a, it's a learning stream, yeah. Specifically for us. I don't know, I don't know about the viewers, but for, for us too, we are, we are definitely improving our understanding of many things. Yeah, thanks to the chat. And by the way, Delgado what is Fabi doing? exactly in the in the spirit, yeah, that he yeah. kind of prolonging his castles, he definitely hints at eventually going long castles. The move H the H6 also gives him the chance to, to go G4. In fact, I'm a little bit surprised that Wesley after H D has played the move H6. I think he is just not castling Kingside anymore. I think he will castle Queenside as well somehow. Yeah, but still, I mean, uh, especially after H3, I, I don't. Did he eventually consider that maybe this uh, plan of bringing the bishop to G3 disturbs him? Maybe, yeah. But I mean, uh, what you're saying is absolutely correct. Like, if you play H6, I think it makes castling kingside incredibly dangerous while White hasn't castled yet. So, uh, yeah, I'm expecting him to, I don't know, play bishop D7 here and just go queenside as well. But then the knight on f6 is so strange. Knight on f6 yeah? is awkward, yeah. Knight on f6 is not yeah. where it should be. I mean, for example, to, to my eyes, and okay, I, I used to play a lot of anti-Berlins. I mean, here the move knight d7 mm -hmm. would be almost thematic, yeah? Yeah, yeah, knight d7, you, you just start with this. You go knight d7, maybe f6, knight f8, and uh, you go from there. Exactly, uh, yeah. But I, I, mean, I want to attract your attention to something that like, I, I kind of just did a bit of a spit take there. What is Fabi doing? 
Come on, so let me get there. Wow, I mean, okay, he he got absolutely nothing, yeah. Like you can, I mean, they can't offer a draw until move, until move thirty, but uh, <laughs> now would be now would be a good time to start considering it. Like what? Like why is this? Maybe he doesn't like playing on birthdays. <laughs> but then he should have said to the captain, no? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, but but maybe maybe it's better to just not play instead of doing this. It's yeah. but it's really strange, yeah, because uh, uh, just to show the, the 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 viewers how we got here, uh, Axel did actually play ninety four and move four, which I as I mentioned is a very serious option here. <clears throat> uh, and then yeah, why did what the <clears throat> uh, what the most natural reply is, which is take c three and d four black once again very useful option always in these types of positions, you need to unpin the pawn on d7, and then you can play d6 next move. Uh, and interestingly, yeah, Fabi played bishop c2 here, which is a bit surprising, but fine, I guess. I would consider playing, I don't know, knight a3, knight c4, I think is very normal here, but bishop c2 is not anything unusual. <clears throat> and here, uh, Axel showed one of the differences between uh, the positions with knight on f6, and he went knight e7 here, uh, saying that I don't need to put it on f6, I don't need to subject myself to the pin with bishop g5, I can just go knight e7, the knight will be quite comfortable on g6. But all that is true, but Fabi's decision in this position still is extremely, extremely surprising to me. Because I think it just kills off the entire game completely, like there's nothing to play for if you take on e5 and you take on d8 here. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm also completely shocked. Yeah, that uh, D takes C five. I mean, it's absolutely not Fabi style. Takes takes, and after Bishop is the Bishop B six. He he took on. B I mean, what is he really hoping to? I mean, he's fighting against the knight on E seven. Yeah, that this knight is yeah, little bit dubious. It, it, it comes out very car. I mean, like it goes to G six and then it goes to F eight and um, because he even played knight G two. I, I was expecting Bishop B three. Like, but. Now you're definitely after bishop e6, you're never better here with white, like there's zero. But maybe bishop e6, bishop b3, is, is it some concrete idea maybe? Ah, and then a takes b, huh? and then you have knight c4. Yes. Hmm. Oh yeah, that might be, that might be quite clever. I, yeah, that is actually kind of tricky. Yeah, somehow I would love to already play this position from black side without calculating too much. Okay, it's knight c4 right. is the problem. We have yeah. to play then b5. I guess there. we go b5. Yeah, I guess we yeah. go b5. And then you mentioned the idea of bishop b3. Stopping, well, stopping bishop, bishop b6 looks very natural, right? Because if you allow bishop b6, I just don't see how black can ever be worse. Yes. Um, so, for example, bishop b3. And then we have to try to solve this knight issue. Yeah, but then I go, I go knight g6, king e7, yeah. rook d8. Like, I, I refuse to believe this can be anything. Yeah, very hard to believe that there is any problem. Why and, and one question, if after b5 we go a4, is that an idea? And then knight c4? Or... Well, or bishop takes a4, yeah, because I'm winning a tempo. With... You are winning a tempo, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it, it has to be something immediate, because if you give black like one or two tempi somewhere to finish development, it will, I mean, it's too symmetrical to, uh, to be anything at all. So what's happening here? Let's say I go B takes A4. Bishop yes, and now, okay, we have to choose, yeah, because yeah. you also mentioned the move Knight C4. But my original idea was just to... Yeah, and here the... I wanted to go King G8. <laughs> wow, yeah, this is, this is clever. <laughs> I wanted to go King G8, which is kind of funny, sidestepping your Bishop takes C6 threat and putting it on C7. And once again, like I'm, I'm, I'm definitely one move away from being completely safe, right? Like, it's not, are you sure you want to allow? I mean, you have knight b6, yeah? No, I have rook takes a4 there. B5 is winning material, no? Yeah, but I have knight takes e5. Oh, knight and five, knight sorry, knight, seven, knight yeah. five. Okay, so I will play f6 here. Yeah. yeah, you play f6, and I okay. F6. <laughs> I mean, I still only see. Oops, I only see this this dubious knight. Otherwise, I don't see what what I can hope for, but. Yeah, looks perfectly fine because, okay, knight b6, look a6, you are laughing. Yeah, and then I will take with the knight and I will put it on b6 yes. and I will no longer have a... I will no and you start to play for advantage, maybe, yeah? Maybe, yeah, I will start, I will start being interested, yes. maybe. Yeah. 
no, it's uh, it's kind of mysterious. Yeah, it's slightly mysterious what Fabi has in mind because yeah. we know Fabi is such an incredibly strong player. So maybe he feels that there is this some some special spice in the position with move pen move play, but it's yeah. uh, not, uh, and, not really and, visible. And Chad is also probably correctly is asking uh, Bishop B six, Bishop B three. Can we not play King D seven there? It looks like we can. Yeah, we will have to take on C four if Knight C four, but we are kind of okay with that end game. I think. Just takes, takes, f6, we're never losing that endgame. I mean, that's a horrible statement to make. Of course, we, you, <laughs> you, you lose it occasionally, but strictly speaking, this is just... Yeah, we, we know that in chess there is no such position that you can't lose, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it, it yeah this, looks, this looks very safe. I like just king c7 and trade one pair of rooks, put, put the knight on... Uh, yeah, maybe actually rook a d8 to have knight c8 always, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, it's already not not yeah, one. But it's, it's, like just, it's, it's just not going to be anything. I can trade every rook on the d file and then play king c7, king d6. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I'm losing this. So slightly mysterious, and uh, what Fabi has in mind, and Delgado is going for this knight e2. He definitely wants to go g4, knight g3. It's going to be an interesting game. But as Peter, you already mentioned, Black will definitely get uh, ready for long castles, and after bishop d6. Already probably he wants the move bishop e6, right? Yeah, bishop e6, castle long, knight d7, yeah, this types of uh, this type of development. Yeah, because Something yeah, you, like you, you don't want your king to be on g8 if white goes g4, knight g3. You definitely want it to be on the other side of the board. Exactly, yeah. And, and this is a very solid setup. Black has this bishop d6, bishop e6. Knight will anyway yeah. start to go to d7. Black will maybe mm -hmm. play c5. Maybe even knight c5, knight a4. Who knows, depending on the situation, yeah. A yeah. lot of, lot of play ahead. Yeah. But definitely I'm very happy that we got a game because suddenly I was worried that, oh no, not that this will be the shortest game of the Olympiad. Definitely not. Yeah, and I want to uh, just briefly uh, show a little bit of kind of a funny, funny to me, it's like I have a very strange sense of humor. Uh, actually, one board above from the one that we're discussing in the uh, India match, in the Sasi, uh, in the Sasi game, uh, I was going to, you know, be extremely complimentary uh, about uh, the play of uh, Sasha Kiran's opponent because he went knight f8, knight e6, and then g6. Uh, and uh, it looks a, a bit, of, a little bit of a of a case where you know uh, somebody probably. You know, he knows that this is the right setup, but he maybe doesn't know exactly why, right? Because you play g6 here to play knight g7 and then bishop f5. And he actually spent two tempi here going king f8 and king g7 uh, instead, uh, which is... I thought it was a kind of a uh, interesting point to demonstrate that uh, when perhaps like you, you, you're learning move orders without really taking the time to understand exactly why you're doing what you're doing. And then uh, such things. Maybe maybe he was worried about knight g7, g4. I mean, it's possible that he didn't like that, but um, at least I would very seriously consider playing knight g7 here because after g4, at least we have some some targets potentially to play, to play against ourselves. And king f8, king g7, uh, you end up stuck with that bishop on c8, which is the biggest problem black has in all these types of structures. You really want to trade the bishop on c8 for something. So I think he's not going to be having uh, too much fun. Yeah, absolutely. And also white has this typical idea of going knight e5 and then f4, f5. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> with the king on g7, it, at the moment it might look safe, but uh, two moves later it can just really, really collapse. I don't know. It's it's very nice position for white. Yeah, maybe, however, because yesterday we had a problem with the broadcast and we had like the top six boards, uh, on the, I mean, the top six matches. Uh, maybe we could take a look at the other other teams which we haven't covered yesterday so intensively, sure. just sure. just to give a feeling and our thoughts on, on different teams. So Polish yeah. Polish team, we could have actually uh, discussed more yesterday already, but but we didn't. Let's let's take a look. So. Uh, Radek Wojtaszek is uh, playing board one right now because the star player Jan Sistov Duda is still resting. I think also we should explain a little bit why it is a clever strategy. That, that usually such a star player like Jan Sistov Duda, once the tournament heats up, 
then he will no longer have the luxury of having the rest. Yeah, he will have to give his all. And then it makes a lot of lot of sense for, for the national team to, to give him as much rest as possible in the very early rounds. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, today already they're playing uh, they're playing a serious uh, uh, a, a very serious team in uh, let me uh, just briefly check. They're playing Colombia and Columbia, uh, yes. yeah, on, on, on board one there's a basically a twenty five hundred player playing against Stradek. My understanding of Catalan is completely uh, sort of inadequate here because I don't really understand why Radek is supposed to be better here. Uh, but Radek is a very good Catalan player, so I'll trust him to uh, to know what he's doing. But to my eyes, and okay, A4 actually explains a little bit because I was, I was really struggling to figure out how we are dealing with Black quite simply sort of expanding on the Queen side and gaining space and being developed very, very naturally. But a4, obviously, with the intention of meeting b4 with knight b5, is a very concrete idea, and uh, maybe it gives uh, maybe it gives something to uh, to white. I'm still not 100% sold on all of, on all of this, but I can I can understand why uh, this is maybe playable. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, Radek, of course, an incredible player, also very very big theoretician. Another uh, player who was team uh, team Vichy in uh, mm -hmm. in Chennai's match. And not only that, he has been involved with all the matches of, of Vichy and is just a wonderful person and, and great politician. <clears throat> I'm a little bit sorry for him that the last couple of years didn't exactly go according to plans because in my mind, he's like a 2740 player. So whenever I see him dropping some rating, then, then I feel like, oh my God, I mean, he deserves more. <clears throat> he deserves better. And I know that, you know, exactly those, those players who suddenly don't have the, his best periods, yeah? Mm -hmm. Suddenly, there is the Olympics. There is something to fight for. You fight for your country. You fight for your your teammates and everything. It can get this energy boost, yeah. And and I'm expecting Radek to be a very very vital part of of this team. Fighting yeah, would be, for it would be it would be nice to see him do well. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, this is a uh, 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 turning out into a kind of a you know we. <laughs> We're trying to out complement each other. We 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 seem to be on very good terms with everybody. But yeah, Radek, Radek is a is a wonderful guy. I've, I've known him for ages and ages, and yeah, it would be very nice to see him do well. Uh, there is a very messy position on board three in that match, which is something that I. How did they even get here? This is a very peculiar position. <clears throat> well, if you would have asked me that it's a knight d two c five French, I would have laughed at you. Then <laughs> no way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but apparently it is. Yeah, uh, this is a line I actually played myself with white a little bit this knight of three ninety four and then bishop b5 against knight c6 uh, but when i was playing it like nobody knew what to do against it and play was just you know people just kind of improvised but these days everything is heavily theoretical and clearly uh you know the position they have by move 14 uh you don't really get there uh, you, you know, uh, without having looked at it. And apparently this is what uh, Anish is uh, giving. Uh, uh, this idea of E6, E5 here is uh, uh, apparently Anish's brainchild. Um, very simply, just try not to allow E4, E5, I guess, is the biggest point. And fighting, uh, fighting for central control as much as possible. Yeah, and, however, and after five things are heating up, yeah? Yeah, very much so, yeah. Uh, C4, knight e7. It's interesting that black isn't even interested in playing d5, d4. Here goes knight e7. Everything gets traded on d5. And uh, after bishop e4, uh, unfortunately for black, you cannot play like bishop e6 or bishop c6 because takes take between b5 check wins a full piece, uh, which would be a bit of a problem. But... Black has the option of playing what uh, what he played in the game, which is knight f4, uh, queen a6, and bishop c7. And we have this kind of a interesting situation where the rook on a8 is, of course, hanging, but I think it's completely impossible to take, because if you take on a8, queen takes a8, your position more or less immediately totally collapses, because the pawn on g2, the pawn on g2 is doomed, you will lose the right to castle, and... Uh, Black is immediately, I think, far ahead, in my opinion, at least. So I would assume white probably castles here, or maybe goes g3 first. I'm looking at those types of options. 
with very very unclear play like i i don't know what i think about this position at all it's very interesting very sharp yeah basically my feeling is that uh, unless you are very well prepared you don't really want to have such position from the white side yeah because there, there is some pressure on you if if you kick this knight away from g it's it's lovely but the knight goes back to e6 and threatens knight c5 yes that, that is a very very big problem yeah you you still don't have time to just calmly castle because castles knight c5 you you feel like strategically maybe you're lost uh with uh, with the bishop pair and also with white having played g2 g3 it's just such a horrible combination of things so yeah and the interesting question uh i would like what would be your impression if you if i showed you this position i showed you the names of the players and the ratings of the players and i showed you what the clocks say who do you think is still in book <laughs> Exactly. I have the, the feeling that none of them is really in the book, that maybe Black knew the move E5, uh, because otherwise you don't really come up with it over, over the board, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or then you really have to spend much more time. On the other hand, White and Moranda, I mean, Moranda, somehow I have him in my mind uh, more, of a, more of a default player, but uh, I don't know so much about him, to be honest. I know that he's a very, very strong player, but he has been kind of inactive. He was he was a very good junior player, I believe, and and then he he somehow disappeared. But this twenty six thirty, it's it's something that uh, he he definitely can play. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's for sure. And he opts for knight c four. This is the move that I like. Yeah, that you, you want to hit this knight immediately. You you don't castle yet, and also against uh, you are having some knight d six bishop e three ideas. That's the move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you you definitely want to get rid of the knight on a four, or at least you know have the option of getting rid of the knight on a four. Knight six check is definitely a useful thing uh, to have in your back pocket for emergencies. Uh, and I guess if black castles here, you can definitely at least consider uh, taking on a. F I'm trying to figure out which order I would do this because, like, if I take on a four, take on a eight here, there is rookie eight check, right? Ah, you. I mean, I. I just wanted to to get away with with castles as quickly. Yeah, but then, as possible, but then yeah. we're not winning the exchange. Yeah, but maybe it's still good. Maybe yeah, you take on a four in your castle. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I want. Now to... the rook definitely is hanging, and if you play something like rook b eight, maybe we can even be greedy and take on a seven. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I would really love to play rook d one, but then maybe a bishop b five. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I was worried bishop b five still exists. Yeah, but yeah. we can take on a seven then. Actually, maybe we can do it that order as well. It's unclear. Um, uh, but yeah, but those would be those those would be the sort of the uh, the ideas I would be trying to I would be trying to uh, to make work for white. So what else do we have for black after knight c four apart from the uh, the idea of castling? We can start with rook b8. It does create a very annoying threat of bishop b5. I guess. Well, you know, I wanted to suggest that if you want to know what to do with black, we have to open the, the Anish course, yeah? <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, it might not be so easy. Yeah, that is, uh, that is definitely uh, the, the best course of action, but I don't have it in front of me right now be yeah. because you don't have bishop b5 anyway i have bishop c6 checks so maybe i can anyway take take and castle yeah? and castle yeah and we probably get actually the same position anyway because black needs needs to castle at some point you you, you can't be king on e8 forever i will play queen a3 and you may, may maybe you will never castle then uh, so maybe you castle here and then i take on a7 or i go rook d1 or so looks like some kind of a position like this is actually quite likely to appear in some move order. Yeah, in general, I'm I'm more of a fan of White's position because I feel like Black is the one who has to prove something now. Yeah, this this mm -hmm. Knight C4 was a very very well. Knight C4 move. was a very good move. Yeah, Knight C4. Was yeah, yeah. Big, I mean, be, before that move, I was just not sure what to think of the position. Yeah, but after Knight C4, it all makes sense for White. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So okay, a lot lot to play for the the Polish team. Definitely after what they have. Uh, shown in the Batumi Chess Olympiad where they definitely deserve the medal with, with their incredible performance. We'll be fighting again. That, that's for sure. Really looking forward to them and rooting for them. What else do we have? The Azer Azerbaijan team. Also very, very important team. Someone that 
I mean, these guys have incredible experience. They, they have tons of experience. Mm -hmm. Usually, the Olympiads, they will never really be so successful, but they have been very good at European team championships. Yes, yeah? so, yes they've, mm -hmm. uh, they've won a couple of those. Uh, and uh, Satiris informs us that uh, Anish says bishop c7 is not the move. Anish suggests bishop c5 in that position instead of bishop c7. So. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, this, this actually explains because it turns out in all these lines that the bishop on c7 is uh, slightly passive. Yeah, and uh, maybe having access to bishop before check is also quite useful. So, yes. Yeah, that would be that would be uh, that would make sense to me for sure. <clears throat> now it all makes sense for me because I was wondering that it's no way that Anish suggests e5, and after knowing Anish's, uh, I mean, uh, theoretical skills, and okay, he's an incredible chess player, but he loves to work on chess as well, like like a maniac. There is no way he will give White a chance to fight for advantage. Yeah, so it's it's bishop c5, the move that keeps the pressure on. All right, so yeah, the, the Azerbaijan team, okay, Rauf Mamedov, a very, very experienced player. However, here, wow, Mark Paragua has only 2460. I mean, he even used to have 26 at some point, I believe. I think so, yeah. Yeah. But once mean, again, he, maybe he, he was just... definitely like 25, 50, 60 for, for mm -hmm. 10 years, that's for sure. Yeah. Um... This is a kind of a topical line where uh, a, a lot of the Rosalimos these days kind of look like this with white, I think. The, the A3 followed by B4 plans are becoming more and more, uh, more and more popular. So uh, you get these types of positions where uh, white tries to play on the queen side and black uh, tries to sort of negate it and uh, play against it. And also, yeah, very often before just gets ignored, just as Rauf has done here, just castles, b takes e5 and knight d7, uh, going for this change of structure. And interestingly, uh, as you will see in a moment, knight c5, bishop a3 followed. It looks like this is some kind of an internal pin, like uh, uh, it looks very awkward for, for black, but in fact, I think Black is pretty much never worried about having to double the pawns on c5. Uh, which may look a bit strange, but then you think, you know, how many pieces does White have to attack? Like, if, if uh, at some point this trade on c5 happens and Black takes with the pawn, does White have the pieces to actually attack that, that pawn on c5 and to make it into a weakness? And I think in most cases the answer is just no. Uh, so black is quite okay just doing this. Uh, and uh, I think in, in, in the current position, uh, uh, the one we have on the, uh, on the live board, uh, you can continue ignoring the idea of bishop takes c5. You can just play, I, I, would, I would just play bishop c8 here uh, in, in the position they have on the board right now and uh, continue completely ignoring the uh, the bishop takes e5, b takes e5, change of structure. Yeah, I'm back because suddenly we have some storm coming and, and the daylight disappeared. And uh, I had to, to turn on the lights and regroup a bit. Mm. Now I'm back. So, I mean, I mean, really incredible. We had like 44 degrees the, the last couple of two weeks. 44? 44 even. I mean, it was for, for a week it was over 40. Uh, and and now suddenly the Olympiad started and the the storm is coming. Yeah, I mean, just the, the tension is it, growing. Yeah, at least at least you'll have you'll have you know air to breathe, which is, I hear it's useful. I I, I don't know exactly, but I hear it's very useful. Yeah, usually it, it should. Yeah, and uh, you know when when we talk about this specific opening, you you know what I think about our duels in two thousand four and two thousand five, and and I recall that. In, in Linares and in Vikanzi, because back then it was exclusively my main weapon, the Sveshnikov, and I had to face a lot of Rosolimos. I was analyzing so much this kind of, this, these structures, yeah, after rookie one e5 takes, takes d3. The big question was, should I try to play a3 immediately or should he first play d3 and then b4? I was analyzing uh, for many, many days this, this kind of positions. And, and I remember that in, in Vikanzi 2004, I managed to trick you with some very nice move order with black and I neutralized the game and it was a very quick draw. Yeah, I, I got absolutely nowhere. 
but yeah, once again, we probably shouldn't uh, shouldn't get too deep into the, the yes, definitely. Here. I, I want to highlight that okay, this final position, the current position, I'm I'm liking from from white side. I believe that white has achieved something. Uh, white is white is fighting. On the other hand, on the second board, if you ask me, and uh, then then it's clear that white is the one who is pushing with this knight on d5. It's quite yeah. Obvious. This is a pleasant, a, a very pleasant Spanish. But yeah, uh, Chad has been suggesting for a while, and also I think that it's uh, it's a fair idea. There is a lot going on, and we could continue, you know, highlighting teams we haven't spoken about yesterday. But maybe we should take a look at what's happening, at least on the top boards in the women's section, because we uh, we should be trying to split our attention between the the two tournaments. Um, yeah, yeah, please, please, guys. Uh, I mean, uh, and apparently, the, the system is very tricky. Yeah, that I have these first twenty matches uh, up with, with the men's section, and it's get it's so easy to get lost. Lost Absolutely, in all yeah. There's there's so much going on on the screen. Yeah, I can I can attest. Uh, and Chad also informs us that Pia Kramling has won her games in her game in nine moves today. But we probably, I would assume, this is not on our boards. Let me check for a second. Um, because this might be below our cutoff. Because yes, yes, I think we don't have. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the the top pairings in the women's tournament this today, uh, India one is playing against Argentina. Uh, the the Ukrainian women are playing against Turkey. Uh, Georgia is playing against Lithuania. Uh, Croatia is playing against Poland. France, Egypt. Lots of uh, potentially very interesting pairings. Uh, what Peter has on on his screen is board one of the Indian match. Seems like a very comfortable position for Hampi, right? This is. No, no, but I mean, uh, Humpy is white. Ah, no, okay. Then uh, I would like to say that I'm not sure I love this for... I mean, you still have the space, though. Maybe it's not... Maybe it's not bad. I... What do you feel? Like, it's... It's weird, because... Like, if the pawns were on A7 and B7, those types of positions are supposed to be better for white right because you often end up having some very nice end games with the, with a bishop pair the bishop on c8 often tends to get traded for the knight on f3 and then those end games you sometimes win and you sometimes don't win but you always have some pressure right but now the queen side has been completely closed there will never be any play on the queen side for white you would assume so all the play is in the center and on the king side. And it feels like black is very comfortably prepared for that, no? Exactly. I mean, my feeling was also like uh, I'm, I'm loving black's position. It, first of all, maybe we should take a look how it came. It, it was a banker gambit or Volga gambit, as mm -hmm. uh, different people like to name it differently. So d5, b5, and, and Humpy opted for this queen c2 line, which is a very typical idea that you are kind of inviting b takes c4, and then you're going to play e4, and you get fast development. However, black opted for the move b4, closes the center, which in general, long terms, it should be fine. The big question is that will black be able to, to develop? Yeah, that's, that's the big question. Mm -hmm. e4, d6. We are seeing this classical moves being played okay i don't know exactly if this i'm if i'm really happy about this knight on e2 but yeah i'm okay. not sure about this but i guess the other one went to f3 I, I think her point was she wanted to have a square for the other knight uh which is why uh the g1 knight went to e2 yeah but now we have this the situation where uh the queen side has been closed and uh i think that the, the one big question is even starting from move five for instance is do we want to play a3 do we like until uh, we can do it in, in in at the moment where black cannot really reply a5 a takes before a takes before so we can change the structure either we will take on before and force c takes before and maybe we get some uh something good out of that or we provoke b takes a3 and then obviously we have the c3 square for the knight and we we have definitely gained something I don't really know the answer, but Hampi just chose not to even, you know, engage with this question at all. She just completely ignored uh, this idea and she ended up having to close the queen side the way it was closed. 
And now we have this kind of a typical Benoni situation where ed5, ed5 happens. And do you have enough squares for, uh, for your pieces here with black? But yeah, well, I, I mean, I would like to highlight, yeah, this b4 pawn is, of course, lovely because it takes away the cc square and, and it's like a very, very disturbing pawn. Also, it, there is this idea of eventually going rook a7, moving the knight somewhere and then get rook a7 in. Mm -hmm. Another idea. I mean, I see a lot of dynamics for black. I'm, I mean, I'm in love with black's position, but I'm not such an expert from white side. Maybe white is perfectly fine, but you have to, yeah. you have to feel... Yeah, my, my question well. is, uh, I think I kind of need to cut off as many squares as possible. So I'm looking at specifically, I want to play knight g3 so that the knight doesn't come. To, maybe h3. I, I, I'm basically, I want to play knight g3 and h3 in some order. Exactly. I also had the same feeling. Exactly. Yeah. Take away the knight h5 ideas. Definitely take away bishop g4 and knight g4 ideas uh, if I can. And then let's say if... if Maybe knight g4 is a good move in this position. I don't want to discuss variations yet, but let's say you play something like knight f8 or knight b6. Just put the knight on d7 somewhere. And I play h3. And now my question is, where do the black pieces go? I mean, rook a7, rook a7, a e7, as you said, is very, very logical. But let's say I go bishop d2, yeah, and uh, rook exactly. a7. I think maybe it's just equal, right? Because I will play b3 at some point, and I guess I will have to just trade everything along the e-file, and then nobody really goes anywhere. <laughs> well, or maybe you just then start uh, start to torture a little bit, yeah? Because you you stabilize. I also feel that black should not give white the chance to stabilize, yeah? So it's maybe move, pen, move, move. Uh, I mean, move, pen, move position. Like, as you mentioned, yeah, after knight gc, we have to worry about knight g4. Yeah. Coming to e3, if mm -hmm. we start with h3, then who knows, maybe knight h5, and then yeah, even I'm some looking, takes I'm looking at knight, knight h5 ideas. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because this is a very big question after knight h5. Can we play g4 or not? Yeah. Yeah. Often, often white can definitely do this, but it's, it's definitely something that you need to, you need to work out. And uh, there's also some, you know, uh, potential for mayhem here. Like I can go. It probably loses, but I can try like playing b3 here. And if you if you take, I want to take on e2 and then go knight g3 and then go h5 or something and pretend I'm a romantic of some sort. You know? Yes, I mean those those ideas are very very thematic, yeah, because you you weaken up, you can't. Oh, yeah, but I mean, what ends up happening, I think, is I just lose a lot of material and then I resign. But uh... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Against but the computer, to... definitely, yeah. But th yeah. those are the first thoughts that cross across our minds, yeah. If whether it's good or not, but that's how we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So HD knight h5 and uh, g4 is is very vital. So it would be a very big question for black. Yeah. If I would be playing with the black pieces, then I would feel like okay, I have to spend a lot of time calculating this. If if I'm not happy, then I have to find a reasonable way. However, then if white is in time to get both moves in knight g3 and hd, I Fully agree with uh, what, what Peter has said, that if white stabilizes, then there is some space advantage. And in long terms, maybe we can try to press something. Yeah, but I think we probably spoke enough about this position. Yes. Uh, and, and also the second board is very yeah. interesting. Yeah, this is very sharp. And talking about rook lifts, it's a, it's a very, very curious rook lift that um, Maria Jose has uh, achieved here. Uh, the, the computer isn't in love with it, but it's still it's a it's a very uh, it's a very curious position, and uh, this is of course for for those of our viewers who aren't aware, this is Prague's uh, sister playing the black pieces in this game uh, by Chalet. Uh, this was some kind of a some kind of a reti, yeah. Yeah, well, it was, yeah, un anti Catalan, what whatever exactly it's called. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, after Castles A6, White kind of startlingly played this idea of A4 followed by Knight A3 uh, with the intention, obviously, to take on A3 with the Rook, because you often just play Knight A3 and go B takes A3 and say, I have compensation because that Bishop is important. Uh, but here, White 
chooses to spend the tempo on a4 to also have the uh, the rook lift and uh yeah the current position black castled here uh bishop b2 rook e8 looks very logical uh and then uh, a very nice kind of a flashback to the original you know ready hyper modern ideas this idea of playing bishop b2 and queen a1 in every single position i kind of in my mind is associated with the uh, you know with the original Reti, the the rehired Reti, who i think uh, was very much in favor of doing it in all kinds of positions <laughs> in his opening what do we think about this it's uh my my original thought was that white is doing quite well but knight a5 is annoying yeah i don't have a good square that, that those were also my kind of thoughts yeah like I'm loving what White is doing. Yeah, this this Queen A1, Bishop B2, it's so easy to fall in love with, and and the long diagonal and and all these kind of things. On the other hand, we sacrifice the pawn, and there are some uh, very direct issues. Yeah, if if we would be able to play Rook B4, but or Rook E3, we run yeah. into something. Yeah. Yeah, my my initial idea was to play Rook E3, and I you know quote unquote winning the pawn on E4, but Knight C4 is incredibly strong, because after Bishop F6, I will take with the Queen. And after everything comes off, the pawn on d2 is just hanging, and it just doesn't work out for white at all. Although, actually, maybe we can play rook c3 there, instead of rook takes c4. Maybe it's not that bad, actually. Because knight d2, rook d1 looks... Ah, you, you still have rook d8 there, and knight f3 check as a threat. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in any case, yeah, black is perfectly fine. It, it already shows that yeah white is the one who tries to fight for compensation yeah yeah uh definitely yeah so this this knight a5 it's it's a very very important move yeah i think it's a very clever idea by by Vaishali, yeah? and we will see how uh maria jose replies to it there's also a very sharp position there on board four where yeah, ju just very quickly a mention about tanya that yeah, after, tanya, yeah, after yesterday's ultra marathon game yeah she's back so it, it it shows that the captain really believes in her, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, because after this long game, one could have uh, said that, ah, okay, maybe you take a little rest. No, captain says, no, no, Tanya, you did well at the end. Please continue. So she's fighting. It's a, not a Grimfeld, but yeah. okay, we are not talking about openings right now. And and the fourth game is the very sharp one, yeah. Yeah, this is what they've been doing. Like when it just first appeared, I think most people originally just thought it was some kind of a joke, yeah. Uh, when uh, in reply to White trying to play a kind of a normal Italian, Black just goes Knight of six, d6, h6, and g5. Completely unprovoked, with no pawn on h3. Because the idea that you can do it if White played h3, this we all kind of knew and believed it was serious. Because then g5, g4 is a very big threat because files are about to be opened in front of your king. But with a pawn on h2, it always... It always seemed, or at least, I mean, to me, I thought, okay, it's probably not entirely unplayable, but there has to be quite a simple way to prove white is better. And then I was forced to actually take a look at this <laughs> at some point, and I realized I have no idea if I can prove anything for white here at all. It's completely playable. I, I mean, at the very least, it's entirely playable for black. I mean, one of the games that comes to my mind on the highest level was, in fact, your game against Paco Vallejo yeah. from Granke Classic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that because was I was, a, that was, a I was commenting game, yeah. that game and I was thinking like, wow, Paco really does this against you? I mean, I would have not recommended it, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was some very messy fight, right? Yeah, it was, it was an interesting game. I think I was maybe better for a short period of time and then I did not find the best solution. It was a draw. Um, there has been... A, uh, a lot of very interesting developments uh, in particular like even with the pawn on h2 i would suggest that you if you suspect your opponent is trying to do this maybe you don't castle so quickly because then it gives you the option of meeting g5 with the immediate h4 like you can play on move six like you can play a4 here or knight bg2 some kind of a useful move and then if black plays g5 you have the option of playing h4 g4 knight h2 for instance and you know saying that why do you think you will be playing on the king side? I will be playing on the king side, you know, and uh, these positions become very sharp very quickly. But uh, what they got on the board right now, I think, is sort of exactly what Black is aiming for. 
you gain a lot of space on the king side, and then you just castle queen side and you start playing in the center. Yeah, it, it and, looks uh, like everything makes perfect sense. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, all those things are very nicely sort of gelling together. And still, it doesn't look horrible for white. I can play knight g3 right now and, and try to put something. Uh, try to put something on f5. Uh, wasn't this also played by Caruana against Jan in the candidates? I think so, yeah. It's it's a very serious line by this point. No, it's, no, uh, that that was with a six bishop a seven and then h six g five. Ah, yeah, the, yeah, that was, yeah, that was that was that was a bit different. Yeah, but, yeah, that, I mean, that was the Grishuk stuff. That was a bit, yeah, but but in general, like yeah, strong players are doing this very very seriously now. It's no longer it's no longer even a fringe variation. It's very very uh, well understood to be a, a a good option. So what else do we have? Uh, we have the gay the, the match between uh, Ukraine and. Turkey, uh, with some very sharp positions. Uh, this, I assume, is board one, where uh, Yekaterina Atalik is playing uh, white against uh, Maria Muzuchuk. Uh, this used to be a Slav, believe it or not. doesn't look like a Slav necessarily, but this used to be a Slav. Well, sort of Slav, anyway. Yeah, just to show the start. Yeah, it, White is White is keeping his D2 pawn. Yeah, it's some kind of an un, anti uh, Slav weapon. Yeah, and but finally she opts for D4. Yeah, 94 takes takes. Also here we see yesterday we have seen Anna Muzichuk in action. Now uh, today we see Maria Muzichuk. The the two sisters not. Uh, Playing together yet? Yeah, they are definitely. So far, keeping, not yet. Yeah. Yes. So far, not yet. Keep, keep, keeping the reserves, but uh, I mean, Yakaterina is a very, very tough opponent. And basically, if you play Turkey versus Ukraine, and you know that in all the other boards you are heavily outmatched, then you you have to try to push something in in this game with White. Yeah, and no, she she clearly is. Uh, she, she's come very prepared for for a sharp fight here. Very uh, interesting, uh, non-standard position on the board. Mm. Yeah, so everything to fight for. Yeah, I, I really like White's position, unless Black is in time to somehow trade these uh, dark sweat bishops. Yeah, and yeah, you, you, you immediately start looking at bishop a3, but it doesn't work yet. It might work at some point in the future, but right now it loses a pawn, right? Yes, I mean, after bishop a3, you, you take on e5? Yeah, right, I think yeah? so. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, the problem. And I, I don't... Yeah, queen takes b2. I don't quite believe in this. It feels like yeah. it shouldn't work. We don't have enough attackers. Um, yeah, it looks looks like a very sharp fighting position, which we should be... You know, we should enjoy how, how this develops. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, so everything to fight for on the first board. In the second board, I would feel like, okay, White got exactly what, uh, what she wanted. With third move bishop b5, again, we see these Madoci structures and, uh, okay, basically, especially if you are heavily uh, favorite, yeah, you, you have much higher rating yeah, than I believe. Is, Just uh, getting a stable strategical position is always exactly what you are dreaming of. Absolutely, yeah. And I wanted to say that uh, knight c6 on move 5 is, like, by far the most natural move in the position. But as we have seen, for instance, from Alexei Shirov today, Maybe it's already slightly inaccurate because you want to have the option of attacking the pawn on c4 with either the rook on c8 or the queen on c7, as Alexei is doing today. Uh, and then white will not have the option of getting the structure, exactly the structure that uh, Anna Oshenina has achieved, uh, because it just doesn't work move by move. If you start here with, let's say, knight f6 and g6, you... Uh, White definitely has to be uh, very careful not to run into some quite well-known uh, tactical ways of solving every single problem after, let's say, d4, cd4, knight d4, bishop g7. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm talking about, I'm sure Peter knows, yeah, if, like if you castle, castle and play f3 here, which I think used to be the main line at some point. These days, everybody knows this is just a draw because of uh, rook c8, b3, d5. Which, yeah, I think it was Shidov who used it in like 2003 or something. Yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been known for a very very long time, but yeah, it's a very very 
uh, sort of universally accepted to be just an immediate comfortable equality for, for, for black. In fact, in this position, I think if you don't know about Bishop H6, you might not equalize. <laughs> Bishop h6 does make a draw, but if you, if you don't know it exists, uh, you might actually struggle to, uh, to completely equalize with white. Yes, so okay, what she got right now is, is of course the, the, the dream. The, compared to also with this Darda game against Shidov, we have seen that white was trying to go desperate with the hd move order in order to just avoid all these force variations. Now white does not have this problem, white got everything what she can just dream of. Of course, black's position is very solid. We are talking about nice little advantage, uh, stable advantage from, from white side. Easy to play. Mm, I guess everything is under control for white here. The third board is already a big, the big strategic uh, battle. Yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. a very double-edged position. Yeah, I, I never know what to think about this particular structure because uh, it seems like the black king side is vulnerable to something. But on the other hand, it's so difficult to organize any kind of a proper attack. Like you, sometimes you get time enough to play like knight g3, rook e4, rook h4, and then something starts happening. Uh, but if black is aware that this is a potential danger, you you you, you have to play around. Black normally has enough time to do something about it, right? Yeah, it's it's a very double edge. I also don't really have so much uh, experience because with black, I always opted for e5 structure. Yeah, I just never wanted to to allow this. I know that M Mickey is an incredible specialist. Yeah, Adams, uh, of course, mm -hmm. he has played so many modern games with with white. I also recall him knocking out in '99 uh, knockout championship in Las Vegas, Kramnik. In this mm. structure, in, in one of these decisive uh, tiebreak games, yeah, he has he has always been truly impressive here. Yeah, it will be interesting to watch. And on board four, seems like uh, Julio Smack is just just a pawn up here. B takes a five uh, last move played uh, in the game, and looks like a reasonably healthy pawn that White has won for not very much. So. Yeah, white the only is. hope for black is to, to sit on the c5 square. Yeah, that's what she's hoping for. But it's clear that white is pulling up and white is, is simply better. Yeah, in control here for sure. Yeah. And, All uh, right. So, by, by the way, I, I took a look and uh, Humpy played the move hd in, in this game. And look at this. Black played the move rook b8 instantly and, and is hinting at b3. And maybe it's not so easy to deal with this move. Yeah, this is a good move. Yeah, this is a, something that we did not pay enough attention to because with the bishop steal on c1, we can't really play b2, b3 because black just immediately more or less wins with knight takes d5, right? So it's extremely awkward. I, I, I think we have to allow b2, b3 now. Sorry, before b3 now because like there's just no way we can stop it comfortably. And exactly. then Black has definitely, uh, you know, life becomes more difficult because you have to control more squares. I guess we still go 9g3, right? Yeah, because... but then the c4 pawn becomes vulnerable, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so like knight g3, d1, yeah. where do you put your queen? Queen d1, queen probably. Okay. I, I kind of want to at least pretend I'm stopping knight b6, but I'm not really stopping knight b6 anyway. Yeah, bishop a6, knight b6. Bishop yeah, I'm, I'm even, you know, I'm even tempted to to do some Tigran Petrosian business. Look B4, Bishop D2, and then force you to take on B4 yes. and then C5. Yeah, it yeah, looks looks very attractive. I mean, it, I it really, just shows why we are also a little bit worried for White, right? Yeah, this looks very very uncomfortable for White. Yeah, Rook B8 is a clever move by by Marissa. Yeah, I mean, one thing is clear to me that if Humpy manages to, to stabilize the position, she will be very strong because she's a very nice strategic player. But, I mean, she might not be given a chance. Yeah, it, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm loving what Black is doing. And look at this, just 21-74 and, and plays very, very powerfully so far. Yeah. And Chad, I think, is correctly saying that maybe the way to deal with this is not to play 93 so that if B3 happens... We have the option of very quickly playing knight c3, knight b5 to block everything, uh, block everything off. So maybe we start with like bishop d2. Well, sorry to, to interrupt, but I just want to, to praise our chat. It feels like some very smart chat is following us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we always have people who are very much on top of things. 
So bishop d2 with the intention of meeting b3 with queen b1 specifically, so that you don't have knight e4. And it's on the board. Uh, mm -hmm. Humpy, Humpy opted for bishop d2, yeah. So let's show the idea, b3, queen b1, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to play knight c3, knight b5 next two moves, yeah. So basically, black has to be, again, very, very energetic, yeah? Because if, yeah. if you just stabilize, you will be very happy. So can we do some tactics, some knight yeah, d5, also... cd, c4? Yeah, 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 I'm looking at this as well, exactly at this. But I can't make it work just yet. It seems it's not... Okay, it's we, not... Have, we have to take a look. Because, yeah, one more move, mm -hmm. knight cc, and you are very happy. Mm -hmm. So something like knight d5, cd5. We have to be energetic. We have to push. We take. And where is the point? Is there a point at all? Maybe not, yeah? Yeah, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really figure out what the follow-up is at all. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's always so easy to sacrifice other, pe other people's pieces. Yeah, <laughs> all over the world. It's, yeah, Bishop D2, Hump is on the right, right track. Now, also, she might be also already planning to play B3 if she's given a chance. Mm -hmm. All right. So, a lot, lot, lot to play for. Maybe it's not time to move back to, to, to some top boards, or, or should we take a look at other matches? Well, what is the expectation? There's just too much. Yeah, it's it's so difficult to figure out like where when where do you stop while scrolling scrolling down, right? It's just uh so much going on. Yeah, and uh yeah, very very exciting positions as as Peter is <coughs> sorry, uh, as Peter is scrolling uh slightly off screen. Yeah, there's there's plenty plenty there to discuss, but I, I think we should probably go back and check what Magnus is doing. I think Yes, people... exactly. Generally, don't complain about being shown the Magnus game. Especially because it, it's also very interesting. I mean, it's a double H stuff. So, Bishop B7, Bishop A4, check King F8 finally was played. Bishop D2, H5, a very typical. Ah, of... So, he chose this way to finish development. He goes H5, Magnus completely ignores it. He goes H4. Of course, ignoring H3 would be strange. So, he goes, yeah, H3 is. And now Black has the option of playing rook h5 and uh, bringing that rook into the game via via that square. Perhaps rook h5, rook d5 or something like that, I don't know. This is exactly what Mihaly Gurevic did against me in Arista, this game that I mentioned yesterday. This h5, h4 and then rook h5. Of course, it was a different structure, completely different structure, but, uh, but, but it's a very similar idea. And and Georg Meyer, of course, knows all these ideas. The big question is, yeah, that how white will uh, break black's black's construction, yeah, because black mm -hmm. after all has has lovely pieces, lovely structure. The the question if white could somehow um, make some threats, yeah, or create some threats, then then it would be unpleasant for black to deal with. But how do we do that? Yeah, and also uh, we could at some point if we chose to include queen g5 just to provoke f3, but I don't think it's necessary. And I think in general, uh, the queen doesn't really belong on d5 here because it needs to, like something needs to be in control over the c c7 square. Uh, you definitely don't want to allow rook c7 at any point. Uh, and uh, yeah, I kind of like rook h5. In particular, like we've spent two tempi playing h5 and h4. So we, we kind of like, it feels like we, we have to justify it now, right? Yeah, but hang on. So look H ah Bishop D1, you have look F5, right? Ah. I, I actually wanted to hit this, hit this look yeah, with Bishop I completely D1, but... that move. Yeah, but we, we do have the F5 square. F5, have F5 looks, square, like a, yeah. looks like a decent square, yeah. Yeah, very double edged. I'm I will be very interested to see how this game develops because uh I know that the, I have been commenting Magnus's games quite a lot during the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour, and there were moments, you know, when I was not exactly sure what Magnus has in mind, and he always came up with something, yeah. Yeah. And uh, because I'm I'm a player who 
who in general don't like to play with isolated pawn. And I'm very happy seeing this structure from black side. Of course, I understand that white has dynamics and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do we create these dynamics? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's very unclear. Yeah, We've been asked in chat if after rook h5, rook f5, if we like bishop g4, uh, and if we want to take and allow queen h7. I don't know. I mean, it's it's a legitimate question. I don't I don't know. Because yeah, it, I, I definitely have seen the move bishop g4, but my feeling was, uh, no, I don't like it. Queen h7, maybe is a, is a game changer. I mean, queen h7, I blundered. I mean, no, I missed that. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not sure how worried I am about this. Like, Rook d5. There's actually some argument to be made for rook f6. No, but maybe not. Yeah, I, I like rook d5. Let's let's not. Yeah, rook d5 is natural. Yeah, queen 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 h7. I just go f7 f6 here. I guess. Yeah. And uh, I want to claim that it's not really. But that now good. I do bishop f4. You were the one who insisted mm -hmm. on rook c7 idea. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine this becoming quite awkward for black for sure. Yeah, I mean, at least also white has a very clear-cut play, yeah? So this mm -hmm. is the reason why Georg is thinking, yeah, it's not easy to allow this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. He, uh, he might and... want to keep uh, some, some stability. Yeah, Chad is also saying that uh, uh, in the... Uh, Finland was playing against Germany, right? Germany apparently already won on board three in that match. This is match number nine, maybe? Yes, yes, I have it. Ah, well, Nisipianu, yeah, leave you checkmated. It's checkmate. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite striking. And they also they played a, a kind of a slow positional opening, and then Black just got completely destroyed somehow. Yeah, honestly, I'm also very happy for for Nisipianu for Dieter that he is playing now on uh, on lower boards yeah because he have been fighting there on the first board for many many olympiads now for for germany doing extremely well but uh, we have already talked about this that playing on the first board is always so tough and uh, and he, i believe that his uh, playing style is very very good at, at beating lower rated players also yeah and then we see that he, he actually won yesterday the first game. Now today also he won and he started with two out of two very convincing victories. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I've sort of glanced through the game while it was on our screen. Yeah, it looks like uh, a very nice victory for, uh, for, for Jitter. Um, nothing much seeming to be happening. And here, yeah, this is a very interesting moment because generally speaking, you don't really like breaking up your structure like this but he followed up by a very concrete idea he after dc5 black of course took on c3 and played queen a5 very logical and he played queen c2 and then a4 and the bishops are becoming somewhat threatening but i'm pretty sure that simply the reaction was a little bit optimistic yeah uh, uh vilka sipila sipila his uh, opponent he I mean, I would have been playing b6, bishop, b7 as, as uh, very urgently. I would feel that if you don't get b6, bishop, b7, if you don't connect your rooks here, something quite bad could happen to you. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, Black continued moving with the already developed pieces. And then, like, if you look at the position after queen a6, knight e5, which is what happened here, suddenly all of your stuff is completely locked out, like the bishop on c8, the rook on a8, none of those things are in the game. He tried correcting it by playing b6, bishop, b7, and then basically just got mated by force in a very nice combination by, by Dieter. Knight f7 followed by rook d7, check giving up a full rook here uh, to get to the black king. And uh, yeah, black I think is just completely lost here. Very nice little uh, explosion of activity by, by Dieter ending in, ending in a mate on the Actually, I mean, I like queen takes a4 here, like giving white a choice of two different mates in one. Uh, very sporting uh, gesture there by, by the Finnish player. But yeah, kind of an exemplary game which illustrates just how unbelievably important it is to Finnish development. It sounds like, you know, an advice you give to, to you know, beginners, but this is not a beginner. I've I know a little bit about this player because he. I have some some friends who have played in like Finnish league and in Finnish opens, 
he definitely has beaten some very strong grandmasters. He's a very, very dangerous attacking player himself, uh, Mr. Uh, Sipila. But today he, he gave Dieter a little bit too much freedom and got very, very harshly punished for it. Yeah, P Peter, can you take uh, for for one minute? I I need a very sure. quick rest. Sure. Uh, let me back. Yep. let me let me check. Uh, just give me uh, uh give me yes. control, and then I'm excellent. So uh, this is uh, uh thanks to thanks to chat for attracting our attention to this game because we uh, we did not actually see that happen with uh, with this game. Germany is firmly in control of their match. This is board three, I believe. Uh, on board one, uh, on board one, um, uh, Matthias Blubaum is solidly a little bit better against uh, against uh, Kenanin. Uh, where exactly did Sipila go wrong? As I, as I mentioned, I, I don't want to switch the engine on, but I very strongly dislike the idea of playing a knight a5, knight c4 here. I would I would like to play something like let's say b6 bishop a3 queen h5. If I don't lose to something directly like I don't know bishop b5 followed by something, but I don't think I am losing here. I would like to play bishop b7. I would like to put the rook on c8 or perhaps d8, something like this. Uh, and once my rooks are connected, once my bishop on c8 has been developed to a decent square. I think a lot of the really horrible things which happened in the game are just not going to happen anymore because I will have, uh, you know, enough counterplay against all of this stuff. Um, so I think the beginning of his problems was the move knight a5 followed by uh, queen c7 and knight c4. Even here, I mean, I already dislike... Actually, here it's too late because if you play b6 here, you get hit by bishop d6. Uh, with this uh, tactical problem being a very, very large uh, issue for black, which probably cannot even be solved anymore. So I, I get the feeling that knight a5 is just wrong. You play b6, or maybe you play e5 and you try to develop this way. Uh, but you, you definitely need to do something about those two pieces. Those two pieces need to be included in the game and as you've seen uh, uh, in uh, in the game proper, basically Black played Bishop B7 and then immediately resigned because he played Bishop B7 a little bit too late, uh, and you should be trying to avoid that. So yeah, this is uh, this is the Germany match. As I mentioned, Bluebaum is definitely a bit better here. Uh, uh, Rasmus Swane is also a bit better with Black, but I assume it's not very much. I mean, it's it's very difficult to prove. Uh, any kind of a large advantage uh, in very, very symmetrical structures like this, even though this is obviously a slightly better bishop than this, this is a much more active knight than this, at least currently. So if anyone is better here, it's black, but I don't think it's much. And on board four, uh, uh, Dimitri Kolars after queen takes g6, unfortunately, uh, you cannot include uh, the intermediary fg, king takes g2, because then uh, your bishop on g4 is hanging, but you will just play hg, let's say gf, you will drop the bishop back to e6. If I had to pick, uh, I would be probably picking black here, but it's very, very close to equal, I think. Uh, black is completely fine, but because uh, there's already uh, a lead in the match with uh, Dieter, uh, just uh, taking a little bit less than two hours to give mate on board three, Black, I think, is entirely comfortable with just making a draw on board four if they need to. Uh, people want to see the Netherlands match. Let me check who they're playing. And also, I will give the controls back to... Uh, give the control back to Peter. Uh, Chad is asking for, uh, for the, uh, the Netherlands match, which is... Yeah, which is absolutely number. justified. I want to see them myself. Anish is in action, seven. yeah? Mm. Match number seven somewhere, yeah. Ah, number seven, yeah, then okay. Back yeah, up. but Anish, still, Anish is actually still not playing. Ah, not playing, okay, okay. Jordan, Jordan is playing. 
Yeah, Jordan is... Is he a bit better? Well, mm. I perfectly understand your question because <laughs> <laughs> this Queen B7 and, and you know that I'm a Queen's Indian and uh, all kinds of this type of player. I'm, I'm loving this for black. Yeah. I mean, I think it very much depends on whether, let's say, E5 and then Queen D7 does anything. Uh, if, if you have something concrete right away, maybe you, you, you do have something. But if you give black time to play, I don't know, A6, Rook A C8, you start thinking maybe black could be a bit better, you know, like it's... Uh... Yeah, one, one of the that. games that, uh, recent game that comes to mind in this similar structure, it's uh, Rajabov against Dingliram from the, from the candidates. It was slightly different yeah. because I believe their white had beastly bishop b2 structure, uh, but uh, I mean, the bishop was on b2. However, the, exactly the same pawn structure and then Dingliram very, very nicely countered uh, Tamur's uh, play and, and, and Tamur was very, very lucky to escape in that game. So yeah, yeah. Black, black just by making what I always liked in this position that if you just play natural moves, the the, the position can be won by simply natural moves with with the black side. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So okay, the first first board is not clear at all. Let's move on to the second game. Evan Lamy, Mr. Professor, I always call him Professor because, okay, he's yeah. such a big theoretician, very nice guy. Also, Anish is second for, for ages already. I don't know, for a decade at least. And he plays this. Yeah, I wanted to say he's a bit better, but I'm not sure. I think it's still perfectly fine for white. But black, of course, is never, ever worse in a position like this. And uh, Irvin is... You know his advantage in experience and uh, uh, general uh, playing strength. I think gives him a little bit of an edge here, but probably not very much happening just yet. Some kind of a very very symmetrical uh, uh, London happening. Yeah, white is super solid. Black has solved all, all the problems and slowly, patiently should try to outplay the opponent, which is by no means guaranteed. And uh, we have Borsi Benjamin Bok against. Oh, we, were, we were talking about uh, about this exact structure, actually. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the sort of the classical Benoni into this structure, where yes, you are supposed to be a little bit better, but because the entire queen side has also once again been locked out, and White will never have the B two before break, I would assume it's very very difficult to win this for White. White is, I think, the only side that ever has any chance for, uh, for, for, for a win, really. But I think with the queen side already being completely closed, it's going to be very difficult to convert this into a full point for, for Benji. Yeah, I, I agree. Because also this setup with queen on f6 looks very, very nice. And, and if you look at the clock situation, Benjamin is definitely not that happy. Eh? He's, uh, he's behind on the clock. He has less than 30 minutes. It's still middle game. No, no, not an easy. But in general, the whole match doesn't look easy at all. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. And last board, Max Weidmann with black pieces. I mean, he has the position that I like the most. Yeah, because again, it's some kind of a position that I'm loving from the black black side. Yeah. And and also like one thing to watch out in these types of positions is sort of suddenly getting mated by some sort of rook e3, rook h3, and then mate. But I think uh, Max has those things sort of firmly under control because uh, White doesn't really have um, a, an easy or really any way to start with the rook lifts. Uh, Black has pieces on proper squares here. You can play queen a8 if you want and then rook fc8 even maybe in some cases. Also, kind of very importantly, and this is a personal story which I told on air many a time, the pawn is still on h7, which is very good. You don't want to be playing h6 in these types of positions because it creates a target for white to actually, like all of those mating attacks on the king side, they become much, much stronger if, if the pawn is on h6 and not on h7. So... Uh, I think, yeah, uh, Max Farmer Dharma is, you know, arguably maybe it's the most promising position uh, the Dutch players have today so far. Yeah, and uh, personally, you know, I'm such a big fan of such little moves like Rook C8 to C7. I would, if I would explain, you know, move pen, move the game, I would say that this is double exclamation mark move because 
First of all, the rook on c7 eventually protects the seventh rank. It's one thing, but it also prepares queen c8 to rook d8 eventually, and also queen c8 bishop a6. At some point, maybe black can also play queen a8. It's such a multi-purpose move. And when you, you see that somebody plays like this, you have such a good feeling. Yeah, that's okay. This is exactly how chess should be played. Yeah, uh, I, I like rook c7. It, it's, uh, it's definitely a sign that uh, Max is kind of... Uh, in control of proceedings here, understands uh, the ways to, to, to improve his position after, like, until rook c7, it looks like every single piece is exactly where it's supposed to be. But the question is, what do you do after? Like, you, you got here, but you still have to continue somehow, and it looks like you've developed all the things the way they were supposed to be, to be developed. And yeah, rook c7 is exactly the, the, the kind of a little improving move that is very useful to be aware of and to, uh, to be able to play. In, in positions like uh, like these. Yeah, a uh, so lo lot of praise for Rook C7. However, we have to conclude that the match is completely open. I mean, yeah. on all four boards, there is a lot of fight. For, for the moment, I would say, like, looking just at the positions without knowing that uh, one of the side is a heavy rating favorite. It looks like a 2-2 match, but, but we know exactly that so much will happen in the next uh, one, two hours. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is also, you know, it's, it's something that you get very used to. The more, the more uh, you, you, you play uh, club and team competitions, the more you see these things happening where uh, a team or a club which is favored is playing against uh, somebody who is slightly, let's say, on paper, slightly weaker, slightly lower rated and so on. Uh, and often you will see that, let's say, after two hours, it's absolutely impossible to pick a favorite. Like the positions look completely unclear. And if anyone you think maybe the team or the club, which is lower rated, stands better, like prospects seem to be much, much nicer for, for that team. And then like four or, you know, in the Bundesliga, eight time troubles happen. And once all the time troubles are over, it's like a plus three score for the stronger team because the experience and uh, the like the general if there is some kind of an edge that edge becomes much more pronounced when the stakes are high and the time is low uh, so yeah currently i don't think the, the the netherlands are you know have any particular reason to be happy about how this is going but they could also just win like three and a half half in two hours time yeah, exactly. In all, in all the boards, a lot to play for. <clears throat> and yesterday, we didn't get a chance to look at the very, very promising uh, young team of, of India, Team India, the, the second team of India. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look. Well, I'm seeing that Gukesh has everything under control and should be technically winning. I don't think that uh, this game will need special attention at the moment. Uh, let's take a look. What is Prague doing? Because he's playing with the black pieces. Yeah, I think I think a, uh, for, for some reason there is a king on g1 and the rook on h1. With the rook wow. on f1, with the rook on f1, this would be a, maybe an even a nice position for white. But with the rook on h1, I guess Prague is actually very much in control because knight c2 followed by rook takes b2 currently I think is a very strong threat, or maybe even queen c2. I don't know. And if you play rook c1, uh, intending to play a3, I am guessing the idea is queen a6 and then knight d3, but I just realized bishop f1 exists in that position. Yeah, but I mean, somehow, maybe even a6, even knight, c6, knight, yeah. a, knight a2, knight c6, whatever. Yeah, with, with yeah. this look on h1, this is terrible for white. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look right. Yeah, it, it looks like it should get punished because you are just so far behind with, uh, uh, with your pieces disconnected. And yeah, I, I, I briefly took a look at why this happened. Basically, uh, there is this idea of very quickly playing bishop d7, queen c8 in these types of g3 uh, Sicilians. And uh, uh, it's something I, I've actually done in tournament chess, but specifically against this setup. I think it's quite clever. What you should do here with white, if you can, is actually switch to b3, bishop b2, queen d2, and castle long. Uh, I think the first time I've seen this was, I think Sergei Tivikov was playing this in, in ages, ages ago. And shockingly, it's really not that bad. In particular, against this setup from Black, where Black has committed to stopping you from castling kingside. And you just say, haha, there are two sides I can castle to. 
and you just go queenside. It really isn't stupid at all. Even though uh, I think in the one, you know, the one time I did this in a tournament game, I got very, a very, very beautiful double mate was delivered to me by move 25 by uh, Genius Hismatulin in one of the Russian Super Finals. If you haven't seen this game, just search for my games against Denis and uh, it's a very, very beautiful game. I got absolutely destroyed, but uh, <laughs> the plan is not bad. Yeah, so in this game it worked perfectly because knight f4, h5, knight d5, takes, takes, b5. We, we see that white is playing the thematic way of fighting with this knight on d5. However, without the, the short castle move, there is some disbalance in white's position. Castles bishop g5, still using all the natural moves, but yeah. after looking at Finally, white goes for this ultra classical. Of course, if you reach h2, people upload you that wow, fantastic. But if it backfires and and you get hit with uh, with counter strike, and bishop e6 very very nicely spotted that this is the moment when this bishop should be traded for the knight and then get this very very quick counter play on the on the queen side. King g1, b4, c4, bishop d5. Yeah, and okay, yeah, Prague. Yeah. Prague, of course, is famous for feeling all these dynamics, and and he's so such a dangerous player, using his momentum immediately. Yeah, Black is Black is, I think, sort of firmly in control now. No, Very firmly. This control. is not yet. Yeah, no. Look, look, see, one is the last move. Queen a6 was analyzed. Even there are some arguments for queen e6, ac, knight a2, right? Something like this. Yeah, absolutely. I was also looking at that. But I think black is just doing very, very well. And we kind of glossed over what's happening in the Gukesh game. But he is just much better. Like, he's, he's a very healthy pawn up. And the question is, how easy is this to win? If the rooks have to come off, it becomes... You probably actually still win long term, but it becomes slightly more difficult. If the rooks stay on, I think eventually white just gives mate somehow. So yeah, I, I expect uh, Gukesh to, uh, to to win to win his game as well. Uh, Adiban probably will give mate today. You have to assume, right? Some sort of h4, h5 will happen, and then he will find a way to give mate. And uh, uh, Sadwani has a really weird position on the board from some sort of a strange, very strange subline of the, the Dutch. Leningrad Dutch, right? Not, I mean, sort of. He, he, won, he, he tried playing the Leningrad and then it became something completely weird. <laughs> like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes. By uh, the way, do, do we understand which country is this? Uh, Estonia, maybe? Ah, Est ah Estonia, yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah, because suddenly I was looking at the names, and yes, uh, key key color should have been, you know, the the yeah. um, the name that gives me the hint. Yeah, but also the, this this flag is. Uh, I, I I've seen recently somewhere that it was mentioned that this flag is <clears throat> sort of a very very literal representation of what your typical Estonian landscape looks like. So it's like snow and then uh, trees and then. Uh, and then the sky. Yeah, I have, uh, happened to be in uh, Tallinn in 2016 for the European uh, Blitz and Rapid Championship. It was one of the most stunning cities I have ever been. It was Tallinn so incredibly beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Tallinn is very, very beautiful. Yeah, so basically we can conclude that, yeah, Team India 2 has everything under control. Pretty much, yeah. It looks like they're, they're in charge. And, and already we are now next to Armenia, a team with incredible tradition, with mm -hmm. uh, three Olympic titles, uh, starting from 2006, 2008, and 2012. However, of course, now Levon leaving and not being here, it's, it's kind of also very difficult to, to, to look at the Armenian team without seeing Levon exactly on board one. Yeah. He's been such a fixture. And, uh, you know, the sort of the team of the the, the, the glory years with, uh, of course, uh, uh, Gabi on uh, normally somewhere on board two, board three, and uh, Gabriel Sargisian, and he scored some unbelievable uh, results in some of those Olympiads that the Armenians have won. Uh, he was always the kind of a uh, sleeper superstar there that you 
you, know, you start by looking at the top at, at the higher boards you start of course by looking at Levon and Levon of course has done has done well but I think Gabi scored like plus seven in in a couple of Olympiads uh, on his board and it was very much uh, due to his efforts uh, that they've done so well but he's not playing Levon is not playing uh, so it, it's still a very serious uh, uh, sorry Gabi Gabi is playing what am I talking about we're actually looking at his game right now I'm I'm losing my mind here uh but yeah without without Levon and uh uh with uh Vladimir Akopian is now I think coaching and it's the uh, the younger generation now taking taking the reins yeah and and they have such an incredible tradition and of course the big expectations even though that uh, Levon uh, Levon is not anymore there Mm, always motivated and I do recall can you no you haven't been there because in 1999 in Batumi the European Championship Russia came with a rather weak team yeah the, the, none, none of the superstars played and Armenia went on to win ahead of uh, Hungary it was a very very close race but they won and can you imagine with which lineup it was first board Sumbat Leputyan mm -hmm. second board it was Artashes Minasyan third board it was Ashot Anastasian and fourth board, it was the very, very young Levon Aronyan. And Arshak Petrosyan was the team captain and the, and the reserve player at the same time. This team went on to win the European uh, team championship. It just shows that, yeah, I mean, they have this incredible spirit, this fighting, uh, fighting spirit, everything. Uh, the, the Armenian team is, is always a force to reckon with, no matter which, which lineup they are playing. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm sure many of our viewers have very little idea who many of those guys are but I grew up with those uh, with those people like I grew up playing against uh Artashes and uh and and the the, the rest of that squad and of course Mbappe Putian is a is a legend of uh, of Armenian chess and has become a a, a functionary in the federation as well in uh, after his playing days were over uh was also a very very good football player in his youth Absolutely, yes. It, it, well, yeah, exactly. I had the pleasure of seeing him play. It, it was wonderful. Yeah, I mean, taking yeah. full control of the of the pitch and, I mean, making the dribblings at the same time, having the overview to give all the right passes. I mean, that's exactly how it should. Yeah, be. I think I, I think I've only seen him play live once. I think it was in Vike ninety nine during one of the rest days, and he was probably like fifty at the time. He was clearly the best player on the pitch, like very, very clearly the by far the best player of all the you know youngsters playing against him and with him. It was just like startling difference between him and everybody else in terms of technique and control and like vision of the of what's going on and like who who to pass uh, to and so on. Yeah, and and okay now if you look at this position, it's a typical Gabi position. Nothing mm -hmm. is really happening, but it's a strategical battle. Uh, end game, lot of maneuvering. He's playing against a very young uh, Andorran player, uh, who I think was representing Spain as well. I mean, I I recall him as a Spanish player, mm. but now he's on board one of of Andorra. Yeah, seems Bella like uh, seems like a comfortable position for White, but once again, uh, these types of end games they are. You know, at some point it becomes a kind of a contest of who understands better what goes where, and uh, yeah, you have to take you have to take Gabi here because uh, he has tremendous experience and uh, very very good sort of general chess understanding. Even though I don't think he's better at all, honestly, I, I think I think White is doing quite well here. Um, shouldn't run at least shouldn't run any risks, but. Yeah, it's just a typical position. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the double edge, both sides have their trumps. So we just move on. Tersakian on second board seemingly has some incredible initiative. I mean, this black king on, in the center. I was on thinking engage. about this. We are two moves away from castling, right? And it's not that difficult to make those two moves. Like I can go bishop e7, castles. And it's not that easy to stop. Like you can but go. Okay, then, then I'm going to go rook d1 with knight e5. Ah, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So rook d1. I need to spend a tempo on something like queen c8, maybe, yeah? Yeah, I guess. And now the big question, can I combine with some knight g5 or something? Maybe yeah, okay. I do. If it works, if, if, I, if I actually cannot finish development properly, it will be very dangerous for black. But 
Oh. Yeah, also I have some ideas like Bishop FC, look at you. I mean, yeah, a lo lot of things are hanging in the air, but but it's clearly a big mess. Yeah, it's very difficult to judge these types of positions without actually spending some time to analyze them properly. And we have a little bit too much going on. And on board three, yeah, I was expecting this move and I'm, I'm happy to see that it has been played and looks like things are about to start falling apart for the Andorran player here. Uh, a little bit too optimistic to be pawn grabbing there. I think the last move bishop takes e6 kind of gives away gives away the game a little. Maybe it was too late already, but bishop c6 is a bit too optimistic. You can't really ignore the king side so much. Yeah, because now so the bishop is hanging, and if you take on a8, black simply probably recaptures. Yeah, I think just rook takes a8 is strong enough. Yeah, because gh is impossible, and then the entire king side is about to collapse. So yeah, it seems uh, it seems yeah. very very. And, oh, and yeah. board for it's Robert Hovanesian, heavily underrated with 25-90. Something happened to him in, uh, I think he played a horrible uh, individual European championship. That's where he lost like 30-40 points. But uh, otherwise, he's, he's a very stable 26-30-40 player, putting some pressure. Yeah, okay, Armin is in total control. Of course, everybody knows for sure, or, or maybe not everyone, but uh, my wife is Armenian. Sofia Petrosyan, my father-in-law Arshak Petrosyan has been the one of the main driving forces of, of the army and national team. It's the first Olympics that he's now at home and, and he's not there with the team. Uh, of, of course, we are rooting for the army and team like crazy and it was very important for me to take a look how they are doing. Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, and uh, it will be difficult for them to, you know, repeat the, 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 the glory years when they were you know, one of the absolute top contenders for the gold medals for like decades, it seemed, without their star, star player on board one. But they're still, they're always extremely dangerous. Uh, no matter what, what the lineup is, they're always very, very dangerous. Uh, we're being told that Humpy is in trouble in her, in her game, but uh, there's also a lot of stuff like you, you scroll down to the, the, the very, very young Uzbek team, and I thought maybe uh, we could talk a little bit. Yes, exactly. I mean, I felt like, okay, I want to talk about Abdul Sattu the world. It's, mm -hmm. it's always very, very nice to, to see him in action. What is he doing against Ziska? Yeah, against Fair Islands, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a big, big handball fan and uh, Ferrier Islands is doing incredibly well suddenly in, uh, in handball. They, mm. they have beaten in the junior competition Denmark. Uh, I mean, this is like some incredible sensation there. And it strikes me, you know, they are good at football now. They are good at, uh, good at handball. They also play quite decent chess. I mean, they, this island is amazing. Yeah, I've been there once and I, I've been dreaming of, of going back ever since. I've, I, I played in the, uh, in the Fair Islands Open in 97 and it was one of the best experiences of my, of my life. It's just so beautiful there. It's, a, it's an absolutely fantastic place. Uh, and uh, somehow it, 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 never, it never really kind of materialized the chance for me to, to return because, you know, it's, for us as chess players, you should just go there as a tourist, of course, but you always kind of, you're, you're hoping to go there because you're invited to do something chess related, right? Because it's simpler to organize and you, you don't have to, like, you don't have to take any particular decisions. You just say yes to the invitation and everything, you know, is is much more straightforward that way and that never materialized but it's a it's a truly fantastic place and uh i i sincerely recommend uh the pharaohs as a as a holiday destination it's it's stunning how beautiful it is yeah now my big question is that i know of course abdul satov young and upcoming uh, brilliant prodigy he has won already the world uh, rapid event last year uh, but how much does he know about uh, Helgi Dan Ziska? Yeah, that uh, th this is a big question because mm -hmm. he's a twenty-five fifty player, and I feel like looking at the position that it's it's such a mess. Uh, what is your take? That, for example, for a young player like Abdul Satulov, is it easy to focus against uh, Fairer Islands, or you just think like, okay, come on, this is not a chess country, I should win automatically? What what is your take on this? I mean. Starting maybe from board two, you start becoming, even though I'm, I'm looking at the lineup uh, and uh, the rest is also not, not easy at all, but 
like uh, Ziska himself, I, I played against him. He has draws against, like, I kind of asked him for, I, I think I played him in round one of the European Championship one year uh, in, I think, 2011. And uh, I, I offered the draw very early because I just got absolutely nowhere out of the opening and it didn't really feel to me like I, you know, was in any way better. And, um, and I, I think he, he's also beaten some very strong players. So if you look through the database for, you know, Ziska specifically, you should be respecting him quite a bit because he, he very clearly is a, is a dangerous player. So if, if, if Abdus Atorov is sort of doing his job correctly or his captain is doing his job correctly at looking, looking through his opponent's games and telling him, you know, what he saw in the database, he would, he would know that this is not going to be a, a, a walk in the park this game. I think, I mean, he obviously still is a huge favorite, but uh, yeah, he, he, should, he should be taking this very seriously. Yeah, and also the position is very, very double-edged, right? I mean, bo both sides, if this look from A1 could be moved to F1, we would say that White is completely winning. Just winning, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yes, but with this look on A1, on the other hand, the look is eventually also threatening to, to come to play. That's why Black Screen is on C6, yeah, covering the A4 square, also putting pressure on the long diagonal, of course, yeah, so this, this queen is wonderful. But I, I feel like I'm loving White's position, despite even this, this look logged logged out yeah i've been trying to figure because it's very easy to imagine some kind of a dream scenario where you just deliver mate here right you play knight of three you play like queen h5 e5 knight g5 and you give mate but the the battery on the long diagonal the bishop b7 queen c6 battery is sort of always in the way and it's if you play e5 the bishop on b7 suddenly becomes a very very important piece that black has which will be stopping most of your most of your attacking plans i think black is probably doing okay uh but yeah it's so it's a very playable position uh probably will be quite a significant time trouble though with this down to 20 minutes already and uh uh still 18 moves to be made and the position which is really not easy to play at all there's a lot of decision making involved in in playing a position like this where it's a very non-standard situation, just as you mentioned, with this rook on a1 having, you know, been isolated and uh, being completely out of play. And uh, you have to, eventually, you have to do something about it. Yeah, but everything else is perfect. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of mm -hmm. chess. Yeah, that it's always so double-edged. You get something for something. It's, it's never free. It's never gratis. And yeah, a lot, lot to play for. Definitely a game to keep an eye on. It, it has the potential of becoming very, very sharp. I guess in all the other boards, uh, the Uzbek team has things more yeah, under control. More under control, yeah. Yes. You would, so you would say so, yeah. Yes. So we can, we can maybe then jump to Humpy's game, yeah. Yeah, for for a second, yeah. Yes. Just how how much of uh, how big of a problem is she? This is not bad at all. I think maybe there was a moment where Black could have played b3 and didn't, I would assume, because this doesn't look horrible at all anymore. Yeah, this now finally White will stabilize with bc, and if he, if someone asks me, I will say that Humpy will win this game slowly. I mean, yeah. I, can we, can I we check, like, after bishop d2, was there some kind of a tactic missed? Yes, yeah, somewhere something definitely was missed, but bishop a6 played, rook a1. 95 instead of queen b6, they're saying, yeah. So 95 yes. here. This is very thematic. Takes takes, takes. And the question is, what, what's the follow-up? Maybe c4. Ah, no, but not so easy. No, you know, not easy at all. And you, you can see why it wasn't played, because it really isn't, uh, isn't, obvious, uh, isn't obvious at all. Like maybe b3, queen b1, c4, bishop b4, knight, of, knight c4. No, but then knight c3, it doesn't work. Hmm. Maybe. And then just with knight c5 or no, I don't know. Yeah, c4 followed by b3 there saying, yeah. So we start with knight d5, c d5, c4. Mm -hmm. Yes, if this was the very first thing that I calculated. Bishop takes c4, b3, queen yeah. d3. Knight c5, I guess, just collects. Yeah, everything. and then bishop takes a6. I, I wasn't sure about this. Yeah, but we, th we take on b2 in the end, so I guess it works out. Yeah, but I, I have the b5 square. I mean, the, the, yes, I, I understand that it looks promising for black, but uh, it's it's absolutely not. Sometimes computers say that black is winning, yeah, but 
Mm-hmm. Humanly speaking, I mean, if we get King to H2, some knight lands somewhere, I mean, okay, we are fighting, yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, this is, uh, this is I think, the, another case of uh, our chat slightly overselling what the computer is saying, because even this position, as Peter is correctly pointing out, is not a foregone conclusion that Black is going to win. But also finding this sequence of moves is uh, is not at all uh, uh, an easy thing to do. And uh, yeah, but now Humpy is just in control because you can play B2, B3, just kill off all of that counterplay uh, on, on the queen side. The question is, how better are you? Like B3, Rook B8, and eventually you have to guess that everything comes off along the E file. You're a little bit better, but are you are you going to win or not is a question. But yeah, she's completely safe. Yeah, and then then I'm already trusting her class, yeah, because this, yeah. this is yeah, it, it's a stable position. That's it. So okay, she's she's fine, definitely fine. And what is in this game? Because this was a very very interesting position. Ah, okay. So the, the line exactly went along that I wanted to show, but then we got distracted, carried away no. with with the rookie three move. That rook b4, will black take on d2, and actually black went on to take on d2, bishop c3, queen g5. And very funny, the, the queen from g5 protects the knight on a5. We have two knights on the grim, yeah, but mm -hmm. bishop f6 takes, takes, bishop takes, e, no, first rook c1. So the club ah, is stopping c5, yeah. Stopping c5, yeah, just to highlight yeah, that bishop takes e4, c5 would have been a terrible blunder. Mm -hmm. So yes, white plays rook c1, pawn to c6, bishop takes e4, bishop d7, and okay, black is pawn up. On the other hand, with this damage pawn structure, one can never feel like that black is so much better. I mean, white will always have some game. The big question is how quickly you can mobilize your queen side pawns. Yeah, it's a, it's a big question because white can play something like, let's say, bishop d3, rook f4, and start... Uh, at least some play on uh, on the king side with like maybe rook c5, rook h5 to follow. And black has some play against it. Like rook c5 pretty much always can be met by rook e5 if black wants to not let it reach the, the king side. But there's definitely some compensation with how broken up the uh, the king side structure is. But on the other hand, if if the queen side starts rolling, white will of course find it very difficult to uh, to play against that. Interesting position, yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, it's still very much up in the air. Yeah, a lot, lot to, lot to play for. And look at this. Humpy has nerves of steel. She doesn't care about B3. She says, like, you know what? I already got Bishop D2, Bishop D3. I'm, I'm not worried of it. She opted for Knight G3, and she's not trading immediately the pieces. And maybe yeah. even not pieces. Maybe she only wants to trade one pair of rooks. Yeah, yeah and then it's she possible. Wants to yeah, go it's for possible. Attack. Mm -hmm. Possible to keep the other one on the board for the time being. Yeah, I mean, just to highlight what suddenly crossed my mind, that, for example, we, we play a move like B3, and then we will try to go F5, and then sacrifice on G6, and yeah, then later then, go Knight F5. Yes. That's, that's an idea. Try to use the fact that Black kind of got some stuff still stuck on the Queen's side and not really participating in the game, which is why I would be playing like Bishop C8 almost immediately, just to have it control some squares for the future. Uh, in case, for instance, as, as Peter is pointing out, in case white chooses to play f5, having after, let's say, knight e5, knight takes e5, rook takes e5, having the bishop on c8, I think, makes white's potential attack on the king side less powerful. Yeah, yeah, correct. But somehow also I feel like Huff is not playing beastly. Maybe she will consider going uh, going for an attack immediately. Also, I would I don't not know. I, for me, this is, this is actually, like, I, I look at this position... And it, it's just itching. Like, I, I want to put the pawn on b3 so that I can finally stop thinking about blundering exactly. something on the queen side. It's just so difficult for me. But maybe maybe it's actually, yeah, maybe you can start right away using as much as you can using the fact that there is queen on b6 and the bishop on a6, which aren't doing very much. Yeah. Yeah. And we also, uh, also have this very, very important game. We had the uh, Yekaterina Atalik oh. against Maria Muzichuk. Mm-hmm. Look, look, look at this. I mean, it looks very, very frightening, no? Yeah, the, the, uh, the pawn was hanging on a 5 even on the pre... Like, the position we were discussing uh, after knight f6, she played rook d1, but already she could arguably take on a 5 here. 
But after Maria played a5, once again not protecting the pawn at all, uh, the pawn did get captured now, uh, and she just traded on a5, traded on d4, and played queen c7, and then rook f7. This really doesn't look right. This doesn't look like... Uh, I mean, you played a5, and then you gave up a pawn, and you haven't even played a4 yet. So it seems like what you've achieved is you gave up a pawn for clearly... I mean, I don't exactly know for, for what. I mean, it's not immediately obvious to me uh, what the sacrifice was for. So your, your dumb material, you're seemingly under attack. And... Uh, yeah, I'm not liking this for Maria. Yeah, somehow I'm also worried, yeah, that... Okay, of course, we can claim that now Black has a move like Knight takes d5, probably using the, the pin, but I don't know. It's somehow... Things are opening up. Yeah. Somehow things are opening up. That, that, and both players equal having equal amount of time and and not too much. I mean, twenty four minutes. I mean, twenty five minutes each for this very very sharp position. And we are talking about move twenty or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is going to be a very interesting time trouble. If Black doesn't collapse immediately, I think my my biggest worry here for Black is that, you know, if things go badly for you, you might just get mated very soon. But I guess you can still play like Rook A F eight and, you know, claim that. Everything is sort of under control, but then you've completely given up on any kind of a counter attack on the queen side. Yeah, and also you are pawned down at the moment, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like even let's say g takes c6, and if you take with the queen, maybe I will actually take on a5 and say thank you. I am now two pawns up, and let's play. I mean, h2 is hanging, so maybe maybe not two pawns up. Yeah, but but definitely, yeah, looking promising for white. So. The, the other boards have to fight. Okay, we have already noticed this before that on other boards, uh, the Ukraine team has everything under control. Mm -hmm. So not, the situation is not that dramatic. By the way, Hampi did play the move BC, so I'm very, very relieved that we don't have to talk Thank about you. it yeah. forever. Thank you, yeah. Uh, chat has been very exciting about the match between Croatia and Bulgaria for a while because Croatia is, I think, a significant rating favorite, but there it's... Uh, Match number 17. Yeah, there it is. Yes, uh, Sharic and the, uh, the rest of them. But uh, there was a claim that they're losing on two boards somehow. And uh, oh, wow, yeah. I don't see which ones though. Like Sharic is doing fine. Yeah, first can... two boards are at least big fights, no, nothing dramatic. Kojul, how is. I mean, Kojul is completely winning. Yeah, why? Is Chat lying to me? They are trolling us. Chat, well, what are you doing? I know, the last board. I mean, Black seems to be in trouble. Uh, Bosiosic uh, seems to be in trouble. Yeah. But, uh, okay, of course, it's always... It puts a lot of pressure on the team if you know that on, on one of the boards uh, you are you are in trouble. But uh, Okay, apparently like... on, on board three, uh, uh, Zdenko was minus three. And then, and then he will... Yeah, so... Ah, okay. Ah, okay, okay. It's no, 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 no. He is actually losing. Look at what the notation says. <laughs> ah, okay. No, no. Then it's. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Nobody. Yeah, I mean, obviously, nobody played rook d8 here. So rook a takes e, e, e8 was played, and uh, yeah, yeah and then is, uh... white is of course in a lot of trouble. Yeah, then you are in trouble. Yeah, then then you are in trouble for sure. Yeah, wow. Okay, then then thank you very much for pointing it out. Of course, I'm very, very worried for for the Croatian team. I mean, uh, this is certainly not, but uh, the, the last, I mean, the first two boards, they, they can still equalize. They can still make up to yeah. it. Yeah, I think Ivan Saric has a very unclear position. It doesn't look to me like he's better, but it's a kind of a sharp, unclear situation. And he's, he's a very strong player playing against somebody who is I mean, so far, clearly playing quite well, but less experienced and uh, maybe, you know, something might happen in the time trouble. And uh, Anter Berkic uh, has a very sharp, I think, stylistically very, uh, a position that suits him quite well, even if uh, objectively it's quite still quite good for White, I think. 
it's ex exactly the kind of position that he likes to play. I played him in the uh, in the Grand Swiss uh, in in Riga, and uh, when preparing for that game, I kind of came to the conclusion that uh, given the opportunity to play some extra incredibly messy, like sharp, unclear chess, he is you know a very very dangerous and a very uh, capable player. So. Yeah, absolutely. He's heavily underrated. I think he's probably working as a coach. Uh, I feel that he's very good theoretically. I mm -hmm. mean, he knows his stuff. Uh, he also plays the Grunfeld, by the way, I think, with Black. Yeah, he plays the Nydorf, all those crit critical openings. And, and in this regard, yeah, Saric is the same. Yeah, this is the Croatian school. Usually they know what they are doing. Yeah. There's a very messy position on David Navarra's board, just a little bit below. Yeah, what is this? Why is there a pawn on G2? <laughs> and who is better? Yeah, very big question. I mean, why is this pawn black and not white? <laughs> is my question here. Yeah, it's a very confusing, very confusing. I mean, it's a sort of instantly recognizable, this very fashionable Karakan with nine knight of six EF, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then this, this... this H five H four business, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, wow, the the reason why I suddenly slowed. Yeah, yeah, I was about to ask you: Is this well <laughs> yes. known? I mean, I Queen E four double attack, yeah. Yeah, I, I I guess there is something happening here. Yeah, maybe Queen E four, maybe something. Yeah, Queen E four looks promising. Yeah, with Queen H seven, and then something bad will happen to. Yes. To you, I guess. I mean, just just to highlight, yeah, bishop a6 check, king f8, and then just a simple rook f1 or something. Yeah, bishop a6. I mean, game still continues. Still continues, yeah. Yeah, I was I was a bit a little bit confused, but judging by the fact that uh, White played this and David Navarro very confidently, I would assume, just ignored all of this and just continued developing. I guess people just know that this sacrifice exists, and you're not supposed to accept it. Yeah, because it, to, to a human eye, it looks like a total mess, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, I wouldn't know who is better here at all. Like yeah, now great. next would be rookie six for in our analyze and so on. But yeah, it's, it's just too far away. It's not important. Very, very sharp position after g6. Now white has taken on d6. Uh, black has all kind of queen hd moves, but it can be met by bishop h2. That's... It can be met by bishop h2, but also can be met by f3. Because if bishop h2, we can take on d6, right? We maybe achieved something because... I mean, including queen h3 should be quite useful for black, I would assume. But I don't really believe that you can stop me, no? I mean, I can also just take first on d6 and... Yeah, yeah this is the point. Yeah, I think just, just recapturing is completely fine. Uh, and we still have queen h3 in, in the... Pocket. Unless you are worried about bishop takes and queen h6, but you have queen f8 there, right? Yeah, this is exactly the, the, the main line. And queen f8, then queen f4 back, maybe. But then rook e8. Okay, black is spawned up and black has nothing to worry about. I mean, it's it's white who needs yeah, to survive. Is... Maybe at, at timely bishop beastly trading this bishop and then getting access to g2 can help to survive. But yeah, then David is definitely in charge. And if we are already very, very close to this area, then uh, let's just very quickly look at the Hungarian team. Sure, of course. Yeah. I, I don't want to terrorize the, the audience, no, but... Uh, what do you mean terrorize, yeah. No, I mean that, okay, they, they might be saying, okay, Magnus and, and Fabi and what is happening, but yeah, just a very quick look. Uh, yeah, Erdos is much better. Is pressing. Yeah. Much okay. better. Berkesh has already won with black, okay, great news. Uh, Fetso in, is, is doing fine. Very nice. Tomas, what did I mean, call? Banus Tomas, uh, sorry, because if I suddenly say Tomas something, I will not be able to pronounce his, uh, his Banus Tomas for, for me. Yeah, he is uh, pressing as well. And uh, Archp, ah, this is the story. This is actually the story of, of the Hungarian team right now, yeah? that uh, Peter Nach is our captain. Uh, actually, also the reigning Hungarian champion, because last year, in December, just out of fun, he participated in the Hungarian Championship and he managed to win it. But he's the captain, yeah? It was, of course, uh, some of the top guys did not participate, but it, it's still kind of a very funny coincidence. And, and he's playing and now he's winning, yeah? So his, his debut as a, as a playing captain 
is doing fine. And, and already I mentioned this yesterday that in 2002 in Brad Olympiad, he made something like plus six and was heavily contributing Hungary getting the silver medal after more than 20 years. So, yeah. great. Uh, okay. So yeah, Hungary, Hungary is in control against uh, Bangladesh there. Seem to be winning with a potentially a very large score even. Yeah, things are under control. So now it's up to you to choose where you want to go. Mm. What's happening with uh, Magnus' game? Yeah, that's, uh, I think, knowing that it was a very double-H complex position, I think it's a very interesting question. Not, not, not much is actually, yeah, it's, a, it's become a very, a very slow kind of a maneuvering game, which we're sort of expecting. If Black wants to, uh, so he went rook h, no, he didn't go rook h5. The bishop came to d1. Yeah, he went queen d6 and Magnus anyway. So it was not only we who didn't know exactly how to treat this position. Yeah. Yeah, rook d8, rook e1, king g8, bishop e3. Well, I mean, I'm actually liking Black's position. Yeah, I think Black is completely fine. I mean, you have to pay attention that, like, in some end games, the pawn on h4 could become a target, but we are very, very far away from any end game for now. Yeah, I, I mean, things went slowly. However, they will heat up, yeah, because look at this move 20, players are down to 17 minutes versus 22. It will escalate, it will lead to some big time scramble. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, knight d5. All right. And what about Fabi? Yeah, because we have been thinking like what he has done in the opening. We didn't believe that he has chances. And it seems like he's not getting any chances. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of, I, I, I seem to be not on my best behavior because I, I was wondering why Black allowed the takes e4, rook b7 check. <laughs> and uh, only after like spending five five seconds calculating king f8 rook d7, I realized rook b7 check is maybe not the best move in the position and you shouldn't be playing it. But yeah, hang this... on, hang on. B takes e4, they reached move 30, right? Uh, yeah. when, when did B takes e4 happen? Yes. Uh, and Bachman is thinking, I mean, B takes e4 is such an automatic move. Could it be that maybe he's not at the board or Fabi offered the draw? I would not, not rule out any of the options. Do we have them on camera or not? Um, no. Not at the moment, but maybe we will, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, yeah, so it's a big question. Why is Black not recapturing BTXC4 immediately? Ah, opponent was not at the board. Yeah, we are getting okay. the confirmation. Yeah, because okay, this is yeah. such that, an automatic that, move. Yeah, there is just yeah, no that makes move. sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And the reason why I mentioned this move 30 that I think that you don't have the right to offer draw with white on move 30. No, yeah, for white it's move 31. Yeah, but now they're, now they're, yeah, rook before, now it will be a draw because rook a3, bishop takes c4, rook takes c3, and you don't really play, you know, very far from there. It doesn't really make much sense to continue because you, you, you really don't have anything to. Uh, the right home about. Yes, does Black have the right to play, for example, a move like Rook A2? Rook A2, maybe. Yeah, maybe this is even more precise here to play Rook C2 next move. Yeah. Should I mean, okay, play. yeah, Fabi probably F1, just yeah. goes King F1 and okay, he has. Rook A1 to... check, yeah. Professional, yeah. Rook A1 check. <laughs> <laughs> Very professional. Important, important to, to do it the right way, yeah, so that nobody complains about. Exactly. Who Both offered continue. the draw? Why they offered the draw? Yeah, just yeah, yeah. Uh, super just, clean just, way. Yeah. All yeah. right. So, okay. The, the good news for Wabi is that he will have some time to celebrate his birthday. Yeah. I mean, uh, th this number 30 is always something special. All right. So, Wesley So This is what I was worried of, to, to be honest, that yes, Delgado likes to fight. He will fight. However, these are the type of position that suit Wesley so much with, with, with Black. Yeah, all this maneuvering and everything. Okay, very double H position. Knight on d5, we don't really see that often. Uh, but uh, and actually, you know, it might get it might get into trouble. Like if, if Black prepares and then goes knight d4, and then if you in particular if you take on d4, that knight on d5 will have no squares, and then it get, gets attacked by c7, c6, and Black just wins it, you know. Uh Obviously, it's a bit of a fantastic scenario, and uh, uh, that Gada Ramirez is, is going to fight against it, but... Uh, mm. Yeah, because White is always having some B4 ideas targeting Black's king. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a very, very sharp position. On the other hand, White has a big problem that he don't know what to do with his king on e1, yeah, because castling short might run into some counterplay on, on, the, on the king side. Don't know exactly with, uh, of course, Black will prepare it with some rook g8, but potentially g5 will be very unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And that's why White keeps his rook on h1, so that the, the idea of g6, g5 is not, uh, not so problematic. Very sharp. Ah, rook a2 on the board. Yeah, Bachmann, of course, plays the move rook a2. Yeah, and uh, I just want to point out that, okay, this is a draw. Uh, Wesley is much better. I think Linier is kind of winning because the pawn on the 6 is now gone. But Sam on board 4 might be in a bit of trouble. It's probably much closer to a draw than anything else, but it's actually a bit of a tricky endgame because if you play, like, the most obvious move in the position here is rook a4 attacking the pawn on a5, and also creating a threat of mate in one, right? But white can play, I think, specifically h3, not g3, but h3. And if you take on a5 here, I go c4, and I've pre yeah, exactly. I, I want to have the g3 square for the rook on b3. And, I mean, I don't want to say this is losing, but you, you definitely have to be kind of careful here with black. And I think this is also why uh, Sam, after some thought, just goes rook a7 instead, doesn't even go rook a4 at all. To keep the rook on b3 uh, shut off from uh, from the action for now. But yeah, this case I fully agree with you. Yeah, that look look, look at this look on d6. It cuts black's forces into into to two halves. King on g7 can't really move. Rook on a7. The only good news is this rook on c4. But now white will have the chance to create the loft with the hd, and then if ever he manages to activate the rook, it it will be very very unpleasant. Yeah. If you yeah, if you imagine this rook on some kind of an active square, white maybe is kind of borderline winning. Like if it's on e3 instead of instead of b3, probably black position is just going to collapse. But it's it's very difficult to get it away from from b3. You can play rook b4, but on the fourth, you don't have such great targets. Even though like you can consider, especially if you prepare it for one move, like you go h3, and then you want to play like rook b4, rook takes e3, rook h4, and go up. Yeah, but probably rook. after hd, black will maybe push e4 or something. E4, yeah, just f4. To... I, I'm looking maybe at mm -hmm. f4 to take away very many squares, like take away the g3 square for, for those types of variations that we were discussing, and take away the... But now, like, rook e6 is awkward, right? Yeah, you forced me to push e4. So e4, rook b4, and like, yeah, rook b4, how, yeah. how happy are we about this? Yeah, no, not happy at all. Yeah, like, you actually, I think, have to work here to make a draw. And uh, once again, look at uh, uh, look at the rating of the, the player playing the white pieces here for uh, for Paraguay. Probably probably some, some very young kid, right? Yeah, I, I would actually ask Sotiris to or someone in the chat to, to figure it out. Because, yeah, 21-75, having a winning, I mean, not winning, but such a lovely look and game against Sam Shankland. Something is not right. I mean, no, I think I think everything is completely fine because it's just it it will turn out to be somebody who who just you know in three years will be twenty five fifty. Yeah, it's, no, I mean, uh, what I mean, uh, not not fine in the sense that maybe his online rating is already twenty six fifty or something. I mean, because <laughs> apparently he's thirty four years old. Okay. Wow, I mean, but what is his online rating then? Yeah, it is, all, yeah. all right. Well, let's take a look. How did we get here? Yeah, that did Sam suicide himself or was he? I mean, how did this really happen? Just very quickly. So, thematic, I, thought he was but... actually, I thought he was doing very, very well out of the opening, but then he missed a tactic. I, I kind of read through it a little bit. Like, somewhere around here, I thought this must be very, very comfortable for, uh, for Black, but... Yeah, like... No, but, you know, I, I really have to say that this is... Uh, it just shows the today's modern chess. I mean, with 2175, people play like this. Yeah, it's... Uh, very, very high level. And knight takes d6 also. Wow. It's knight d6, queen d3 here, yeah, which I'm pretty sure was just missed. And uh, and then you have to defend this endgame because, yeah, like it's it's not going to be very much fun. Yeah? Wow. Okay. It's a very solidly played game. Like I could sign sign my name to this game quite happily, I think. <laughs> like, yeah, I had the same feeling. Yeah. That... <laughs> I you mean, I, I never got such a good position against Sam in my life, yeah? <laughs> yeah like, I don't know.
And I, if I, I also that. this end game, yeah, that feeling, all these nuances, that okay, this, this is double edged. It's not a, not an easy draw. And uh, wow, I'm I'm super impressed. Aha, uh -huh. top rating twenty two fifty and no twenty two forty eight to be precise. Peak rating, okay. I don't know. I mean, this uh, this rating system. Or there are no tournaments uh, there in. In, in Paraguay, I, I don't know what is happening, but definitely White is a wonderful yeah, yeah. player. We're being informed he is 2385 on, uh, on chess.com, but yeah, I don't know what that tells us. Mm -hmm. Well, even that doesn't look, doesn't sound that impressive, yeah. Wow. All right, the, the game definitely is uh, impressive. Mm. And okay, the, this is a this is a tough match because yeah, Fabi is uh, basically drawing. Yeah, this is just going to be a draw, and uh... this this Delgado game basically can go either way. I mean, yes, maybe objectively Wesley is is doing good, and and we believe in Wesley. However, okay, this is a very double edged position still. Mm -hmm. And yeah, okay, Lenny is bringing the yeah, calm and the peace. Yeah, Lenier, for, Lenier for will win. Yeah, and I, I very much like this queen d5 move because queen takes d6, knight d4, I guess maybe was slightly unclear. So he goes queen d5 instead, uh, just not even allowing this. And after queen d5, b7 is hanging, and also just g2, g4 is about to win a piece. This is, I think, the biggest problem black has is that. On top of everything else, there is also the threat of g2, g4, just winning a full piece. So, yeah, I'm, I have no doubt in year will win this very, very comfortably. So, the, the US team has some, uh, some, you know, safety, a safety net because of this game. Yeah, exactly. But, but it just uh, shows us that, yeah, there are, no, there are no easy matches. I mean, of course, in the first round, it's kind of usually very easy, but uh, after that, I mean, even even Paraguay can uh, cause some problems. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, it's never easy. And I mean, if you talk about football, then you know exactly that Paraguay has a super solid f football team, yeah. But if you think yeah. about chess, then then you would you don't you wouldn't really think about that. Uh, this there's been some happen. changes. There's been some changes in the Magnus game, and Magnus is just not better at all. Wow. Okay, so even this structure change happened, and finally the rook is out of uh, the box. I mean, Georgma, it, it almost feels like they are continuing their spelling partnership, yeah? That this is a very, very big uh, prestige duel between them. Yeah. Rook F1. I, I do remember it, when it was, it was 2018, Grenke Classic, when uh, Georg Meyer after uh, Magnus was... Uh, with the black piece, he's trying to create winning chances against Catalan. I mean, he was playing slightly dubious, slightly offbeat line. Georg actually managed to outplay him wonderfully and was just one move away from winning. But in time trouble, he didn't uh, manage to find the, the killer blow and Magnus escaped. But Georg is not an easy opponent for Magnus. Nope. And... Uh... Like the temptation here has to be to play rook g6 and to force the bishops off, and this is what rook f1 was uh, all about to make sure that you have the option of playing bishop f3. I guess you actually start with bishop g4 because, like, if you play bishop f3 here, I take, I go e6, e5. I want to claim that maybe black is even a little bit better, so I would like to provoke f5 so that in the same position the pawn on f5 will be hanging. And do we go f5 at all, or yeah, do but we, we get provoked? Absolutely not forced to play f5, yeah. But then I don't know what we're doing with black, though. Like, I'm not sure what the uh, what the move here is. Yeah, it's it's true. And then this h4 pawn is slightly weak, yeah? Yeah. Rook g6 plays, so we'll we'll see what Magnus thinks about this. I mean, if he plays bishop f3 straight away, I don't think he loses the position after takes takes e5. I think it's still very, very, you know, very much within manageable margins for, for white. You shouldn't be losing that position. But I think maybe bishop g4 is slightly slightly more precise or slightly... Yeah, there's, there's been some kind of a weird linguistic discussion in chat on, on whether we should be saying uh, precise or, 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 or accurate. I tried figuring out what I think about it and got very, very bored very quickly, so I... <laughs> will decline to to have an opinion on this. Yeah, I, I don't think that my English is good enough to, you know, we, 
we, we, we, we really thinking about this finesse. <clears throat> but uh, one thing is clear, yeah, Georg is uh, putting up hell of a fight, and I know that how much Magnus also appreciates uh, when his opponent plays good, yeah? I mean, everything was played very, very nicely by, by Georg. By the way, if I play Bishop G4 here, do we have to worry about Rook G4 and H3 or not? Probably not because of Queen F2, yeah. Yeah, probably Queen F2 is just in time. Otherwise, it would be maybe an interesting, an interesting thing to consider, yeah. Yes, certainly. I mean, but yeah, thanks to this double attack, we are. Okay, why did I say double attack? I mean, we just ah, because we are defending and attacking. Okay, that, yes, that... yes, yes. Because somehow in my mind, Queen F2 was uh, was a double attack. Yeah, multi-purpose move then. Yeah. Mm. All right. Okay. So yeah, we, we see Magnus down to 16 minutes, uh, not feeling happy, and and the opening looked like he's kind of ticking uh, Georg, but but Georg got his structure, and when Georg gets his structure, he's just uh, playing on the highest level always. I mean, this is yeah. his, these are his type of positions. And interestingly, in in that uh, Sam Shanklin game, uh, his opponent decided he doesn't even want to prepare rook before and just went rook before straight away. Rook c3, I guess he just wants to play like rook h4, rook c2, g3. Wow, it shows a lot of courage also. Yeah, I mean, this is this is some very, very impressive chess from, uh, from somebody who, you know, you would have to assume doesn't do this very, like, very professionally. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm truly impressed by this game. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, and uh, like this is not an easy an easy solution for like you, you you have to assume it's fine somehow. But I would be nervous here with Black. I would feel that you know, like if I have to if I have to show direct equality here with Black, I I don't know. Yes, exactly. And okay, the B pawn looks like maybe it has the potential of becoming dangerous, but with Rook B6, we will have it under control. Yeah. Black's, Black's king, yeah, okay, Sam has to take on C, he has nothing to do. And now the move Rook H4 is basically thematic, otherwise... Well, we can start with G, I don't know, if, if you start with G3, then maybe E5, E4 comes in, yeah, and we cut off the... Yeah, yeah, the I mean, I, I really feel that if already White opted for Rook B4, then, then he will play Rook H4. Yeah, and there is... Like I'm, I'm having fun with this, and 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 so is uh, uh, Peter. But there is a really like people in chat seem to be very excited by the possibility that Sam's opponent is cheating. He is not cheating. He is che like you, you get games like this in Olympiads. You get players who uh, just play at the absolute top of their skill against you for like you feel kind of weird when this happens to you, when somebody who is so clearly uh, b below you, let's say, in rating, just plays a very, very good game of chess against you. But this doesn't look to me like he's cheating. Yeah, no, not at all. You know, I, I also wanted to mention this, that if this game would be played online, people would be screaming that, ah, this, this game was a, definitely, probably there is something involved. But over the board in the Olympics, you know exactly that everything is... Uh, clear and uh, everything is under control no no way it's just like somehow he, he he got energy from this knight takes d6 yeah that this is suddenly a game of his, a chance of his life right i mean yeah. we, we have seen yesterday also Faisal against johan sebastian christians and yeah that he just played a wonderful game on 2700 level the the first 15 16 moves and just when he was about to win then he he, he somehow didn't know he got too nervous or whatever and and uh, repeated moves it it just uh, it, it's possible and i also want to mention one thing that in the world cup the year 2001 my rating was like i don't know 27 45 i was like number four number five at that point on on the world ranking and i had a first ranked uh, first round pairing against uh, kobeza and, uh, you know, I won the first game after some big adventures. I mean, I was slowly, I had nothing out of the opening, but I managed to win. And I thought like, okay, so now I should try to win 2-0. And I got careless. I got careless. And after I gave him a chance, he played such a modern game and crushed me, you know, that I would include it into my best game collection. I mean, uh, of course, uh, Kobeza is like a 2400, uh, very, very strong uh, international master. But I know that these kind of things happen. If you show weakness, the, these guys might get this uh, feeling of they can play the game of their lives. 
Yeah, I just, uh, and I realized that perhaps I was slightly overreacting because it wasn't like a widespread accusation in chat or anything. There was perhaps one person who was suggesting it, but uh, it's important to at least, you know, once that we talk about it for a couple of minutes, because, you know, you will see, this is the nature of the Olympiad. You will see a lot of players uh, who are playing like way, way below uh, against opponents who are way, way below their rating. And not every single game like that will get won by the stronger player. And, uh, you know, in the current climate with the way how, with the way things are in particular online, uh, people do get very suspicious, but yeah, I, I don't think anything untowards is happening, uh, both because I think the Olympiad these days is a reasonably well, you know, regulated, like you, you get, there should be metal detectors at the entrance to the round. So like, if we, if we talk about specifics, it's like going to be very difficult to, uh, to do any of this stuff because, you know, it's a topic that is quite seriously discussed in some some effort definitely has been made to uh, to stop it, but also people just I, I don't think it's as widespread as uh, you, you might get the impression uh, if you yeah if and you... and another example yeah this is exactly the Hoffman Alejandro Arian Tari game I want to highlight that basically Black got some kind of a dream uh, middle game mm -hmm. uh, Black is having everything under control of course White is very solid it's more or less dynamic equality but maybe. I would prefer to be black. And then look at this. I'm pretty sure that if Arian Tari would have had this position against some 2700 player, he would have never ever blundered or allowed this kind of sequence of moves that happened here that White suddenly had the option of playing C4, C5 in this structure. And from a comfortable position from black side, we are talking about a total disaster. I mean, White is strategically clearly better i mean yeah. almost winning but uh, okay black, black also has yeah, something play. something has gone badly wrong here for arian because uh in, in particular like if you look at this position and then uh if you can show the chat the position after let's say move 14 specifically yeah with that bishop on a2 like it got rerouted back to a normal square and then white had time to to play knight h2 g3 h4 and then white also got an opportunity to push c5 and b4 and in the meantime you can make an argument that black basically kind of misplaced all of his pieces so yeah and and also we have to highlight that why i'm so emotional about this c4 c5 that that's the whole point of this uh, of this structure yeah that Black should always watch out not to allow c5 and it looks like black is ready to to hit on c5 however yeah. That is a problem that after bc5, dc5, the long diagonal opens up and after rook c5, rook c5. I was actually still looking at doing this. I was, you know, the idea of just letting c5 leave was so annoying to me that I was looking at this and thinking maybe I can play like bishop g7 here and, and claim that, you know, this is not as bad <laughs> as it looks, but it probably is kind of bad. I mean, maybe h5 is a problem. h5, h6, yeah, maybe we just get mated, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so something like this might happen and then some knight takes F. So, yeah, some I mean, kind of a tactic will come and you yeah, might just lose A lot force. of things. In, in any case, yeah, things went horribly bad for, for black. The only good news for Ariane is that white is down to five minutes. So yes, white has a dream position, but still a lot to play for. And uh, I guess thanks to the time situation, he will survive this game. Well, Maybe even he will uh, go on to win it, but uh, I mean... If if White would have certain it's still on the clock, I would really think like this is this is very very bad for Black. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, Fabi did draw his game, but that's <clears throat> I'm I'm just mentioning it because we we kind of knew it will happen and it did happen. Um, Magnus did play Bishop G4 and not Bishop F3, as I suspected he might. Um, so yeah, we actually is... missed out on the first Indian team. Yeah, well, let, yeah, let's we, we, we've not really been covering that too much. Yeah. So wait, hang on a second. Ah, oh, yeah, Harry is black here. Yeah, Harry is has a very very nice end game here against Ivan Ivan Shitko. The question is like, do we want to take the rooks off or not? Yes. Like, if White let's say plays rook of one here, do we play bishop g six or do we play rook b one? Uh, both I think are perfectly reasonable because the in the bishop ending and ending you can make an argument that black basically is just a full pawn up because the doubled pawns on the c file are you know you might as well have one 
But those types of bishop endings sometimes are very difficult to win because of how close the structure is. So I think I prefer keeping the rooks on. Just go bishop g6 here and then go, I don't know, rook b2, rook c2. Just try to activate your rook and win that way. Yeah, also, if possible, then try to fix this pawn on a4, right? Mm -hmm. Just, uh, yeah. So, yeah, okay, that's... Harry is having a wonderful position. Also, clear time advantage. I'm expecting him to win this, knowing also how nice yeah. a technique he has. Arjun, right. Arjun is worse, though, and, and maybe significantly worse yes. against uh, Andre, Andre Makove. Uh, yeah, this is not a fun position because the end game, the pawn on c3 is so weak. With a pawn on b2, maybe you could just take on d3 quite happily and go, I don't know, rookie one, king f1, and then, you know, slowly, slowly crawl out of the corner and be okay. But with, with the pawn on c3 as weak as it is, I think taking is incredibly unattractive. But you don't really like you, you have queen b3 here, but, but then after... yeah, because okay, e6 knight is hanging, but there are some tactics or not. But even like simply, even like, like after rook e8, if, yeah, even just if you don't protecting look for tactics, yeah, yeah I, I don't know how we're not losing material here, rook e1. But it looks like we're basically one smart tactic away from just getting completely blown apart here, yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't this like queen this. on this is a monster. Yeah, I don't like this at all for uh, for irrigation. Yeah, Arjun in some kind of a trouble. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's continue the tour. Uh, yeah, Narayan is, I would assume, a bit better, but yeah, slightly maybe even better. more than a bit. Yeah, because the bishop on e3 is very awkward. If if White had time enough to play like f3 and bishop f2 and not lose the pawn on e2, it would, I think, be okay. But if you play f3 here after rook f7, you immediately will lose. A lot of materials so it's a kind of an awkward setup and obviously with with, with the black pawn being on b5 and not on b7 even end games are not necessarily entirely safe for white so yeah and also time situation is and two minutes, such yeah, yeah that and black has everything under control and it's so difficult to defend such type of positions from the white side because mm -hmm. there are no four sequence of moves no trades nothing black keeps the pressure can play by hand you, you feel like only your clock is ticking. It's, it's really frustrating. So I'm expecting that, yeah, Narayanan has also a very nice chance of, of winning this game. And what do we have in Shashi's game? Wow, okay. This is a model. I think it's a model game when a wonderful, seemingly wonderful bishop on this is doing almost nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very, very empty, empty piece. It does, it does nothing at all. Yeah, white is, white is much, much better. And... Uh, yeah, it's one of those positions where I think if you're not very experienced with these types of situations, you you might be forgiven in like originally thinking that maybe Black is doing fantastically. Like there is a passer on c4, which is very well protected. There's this beautiful looking bishop on d on d3. Uh, but in fact, the bishop is actually completely cut off from, from the action. The white king on d2 is more active than the king on g7. And eventually, white will start taking this position apart. Uh, one way, uh, yeah, I like rook d8. Rook d8, though, is a clever move because I think the biggest, like, if, if black, if you could give the, the move to white, like, if you could make a passing move instead of rook d8 and a rook e7, I wanted to go knight db5 and trade the pair of knights off, or at least try to. After rook e7, now black has knight f5, but with rook on e8, I wanted to use the fact that the b7 pawn was hanging to get the pair of knights off. Like, let's say king f6, yeah. Uh, just knight b5 pretty much forces them off the board. And then I wanted to play like king c3, knight d4, maybe put the pawn on b6 and then start pushing. And yeah, these this types of endgames are just very, very annoying for black. Yeah, the knight is just way too superior to, and then... Yeah, the bishop, the the bishop, bishop. is just... Uh, it, yeah, so okay, Shashi is having things under control. He played uh, the, the move rook a5. Yeah, he's hinting also at some mm -hmm. rook d5. And, no, of course, rook d5, knight e4 check would be a blunder, but in general, to control the fifth rank. For example, king f6 maybe can be met by knight d5 check, and then black has to go back to, to g7. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised. I think maybe he wanted to make sure that he made the time control because. Ah, yes. But, but rook a5 is. Ah, yeah, yeah, I understand your point, yeah. Because he could have, I, I think he could very easily be justified in like spending, I don't know, 10, 10 minutes on, on trying to find the most precise way of playing this position. But he played it, he played this move very quickly. Uh, and the, 
it's often like you don't really want to you know it's already move 41 you know that you you're safe and you can think but you feel safer making the 41st move and then you definitely know that you're not going to lose lose on time. So maybe you can, I don't know, go take a bathroom break or go for a drink of water. Yeah, exactly. Because we have to talk about this. Do you do you actually understand why it's like uh, the, the new clocks never show exactly if you have reached move 40 or not? Yeah. Well, this I, I, I'm sort of on the record actually liking this because I think the clock should not be giving you hints. I think the clock... Like, if the clock actually immediately gives you time once you reach move 40, it, uh, it is very clearly providing you information which it is not, arguably, it is not supposed to provide you. But I've, I've had very strong players completely disagree with me on this. So I know my position is uh, definitely not the default position. Yeah, well, you are not a time travel addict, yeah? You are usually playing against the time travel guys, yeah? These days, I'm I'm actually a lot more of a of a time travel player myself. But yeah, I, I feel like th this particular part of uh, of the uh, the playing conditions, I actually don't think it's a mistake. I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. You should be able to trust your score sheet. Yeah, it's uh, just like you. You are never sure. Ex I mean, of course, now that you have the increment, it's a different story, yeah. Because you have the thirty seconds increment, you have a good chance that uh, you are controlling your score sheet right, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, for example, for me, I'm used to time travel when we did not have any increment, yeah. So it was like very natural, like in the big super tournaments in the in the nineties and like this, that you looked at the big screen, yeah, that the 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 the, the digital the the big screen on. Uh, for, for the spectators to make yeah, yeah. sure that, ah, we reach move 40 or, or whatever happened. Or also during the time trouble, you are checking your score sheet. You're comparing that, ah, okay, everything is under control. Now with, with the 30 seconds increment, I, I understand that, yeah, you have the luxury. So you have to be able to control it. I, I see your point. And we were talking about Arjun being in trouble or not. Let's take a look. He actually traded queens. Yeah, he he chose to take on d3, but yeah, this is just not a fun end game at all to uh, to play. Yeah, he's he's definitely not going to be enjoying this. Yeah, wow. I mean, enjoy. I mean, yeah, the, he's he might be in a lot of trouble, right? Yeah, I I don't know if he's lost, but it's it's definitely going to be uh, going to be a very very big problem. A2 is hanging. Yeah, as as Peter is indicating, at some point Black might start uh, sort of uh, undermining the structure on the queen side with b6. You can also immediately cash in with bishop takes f2 if you wanted to, but I think it's probably wrong to trade the bishop on d4 for the bishop on c1 while also giving white some activity like knight e7 check, knight g6 comes very quickly and I think you're selling yourself very, very short if you do this. There has to be something stronger. Yeah, exactly. I mean, with, with such, I mean, very important that after rook c2, white is not able to break with f3. Mm -hmm. we, we don't yeah. really worry about h3 because the problem with the f2 point remains. And, and yeah, I very much like I very much like your idea of just playing b6 yeah. and asking asking if you want to just give up the pawn on c5 altogether, or if you want to take on b6 and give me uh, a passer on the c file, I will take I guess with the a pawn and then play c6 c5. <laughs> and, and by the way, I even have such a king root, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah. white is more or less completely stuck. It's just so difficult to figure out how you even come out of the corner. Uh, so yeah, uh, Arjun will have to work. Quite, quite hard here to... Yeah, so what do we have? So if we, we consider that Arjun is in some kind of a trouble, um, okay, Hari is, uh, Hari Hari is, is clearly much better. better. I, th yeah. I think Hari will, he, he should win this position somehow. Yes, he is yeah. clearly better. Shashi is uh, is better, but it's not, not obvious how he will break, but okay, I'm, I'm expecting him to slowly... Yeah. Grant this out. Well, basically, maybe. yeah, India has an advantage on, on the remaining three boards. Different. Yeah, but nothing, nothing decided. Okay, maybe nothing Harry's, decided, yeah. yeah, maybe Harry's position is the biggest advantage. Yeah, yeah. All but right, yeah. so they should be able to handle it. And what about Wesley? Yeah, Wesley. Uh, hang on, breaking news. Sam actually managed to draw. He offered the draw with Luke takes CC and ah, this is why there was no move here. Okay, this is very clever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very using good. using the authority. Yeah, very very professionally done by Sam. Yeah, just Luke takes C three and offer a draw straight away. Yeah, uh, you know that you're not going to win this game. Yeah. 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 And uh, also, honestly, nicely played by Sam because 
you, you know, you definitely have to do at least some amount of sort of swallowing your pride, right? Because you are, you know, 600 points above uh, in, in the list. And you are basically saying, I know I'm worse. Can you please give me a draw here? It's not a pleasant feeling, but he knows that it's important for the team to not have to worry about his board. So he just does it because it's the right thing. It's the right thing to do for the team competition. You really don't have to pretend. You, you, you have to just do what is, what is best for the team here. And uh, I think it's sort of correctly played by Sam. Yeah, by Sam, it's, it's perfectly correct because now there is simply no pressure on Wesley. Yeah, because mm -hmm. this is a very double-edged position. If Wesley would have to think about that, I have to win this at all costs because maybe Sam is uh, losing, then, uh, then in fact, maybe he would uh, at some point choose, choose a risky continuation instead of some stability, which exactly in time pressure. Unfortunately, we don't have the clock situation here. We, we don't know the, what is happening, but... I mean, now Wesley has things under control. There, there is I, a big, I, I big question. Control. If, if you know what the Paraguay captain will say after this game, because from one side, definitely says like, "Wow, Ruben, congratulations! It's, it's the game of your life." At the same time, he might say, "But come on, we had a chance to, to, to pose uh, the U.S. team uh, some real trouble." I don't think I don't think people get criticized for for making draws against twenty seven hundreds. It's not like he's winning here. He has chances, but it's not like it's not like he like if we have this conversation it, comparing this, let's say, to the position in which Levon was, uh, you know, uh, given a draw yesterday. Yesterday there was some conversation to be had. Today I think you know this position is. It's fine to accept the draw here for, for Ruben, I think it's... Uh... Yeah, but I, I slightly disagree because, of course, yeah, White had a clearly bigger advantage there, but the match was lost anyway. There was no yeah, hope that is, for, for anything. That's actually a, a, an important argument. Yes, here. but but here what I mean that White is not running any risk of, of, of losing this game, so the draw is in the pocket, but you can keep the game going. Of course, I understand for a 2175 player, this is a incredible result and, and fantastic and, and congratulations. I'm only saying that the captains, yeah, and the captains are always special people. They <laughs> might indicate that, come on, next time if you get such a chance, then, then maybe please consider the playing, yeah? Maybe, yeah. Well, we, we, we don't really know how, uh, how they, they're approaching this. In yes. the meantime, yeah, Georg Meyer will probably make a kind of a comfort... No, hang on a second. Rukafe, check. Yeah, and he's done to a minute. Yeah, if something, he, if he needs to calculate something, then... I mean, he still has King H7. It's not like he blundered Rook F8 check, clearly. I mean, it's uh, it's still still kind of fine. Rook D8, Queen D8, Queen F5 check. I guess we just go... You can even go King H6 if you want, I suppose. Yeah, it's on the board. Yeah. Okay, but, but Georg lost his stability, yeah? Yeah, this is the... definitely... This is definitely not, uh, you know, the cleanest way to, to, to make This is exactly what Mag you should mm -hmm. never do against Magnus. I mean, he, yeah, yeah, he yeah. might play rook c4. Uh, come on, what is this? Queen takes d8. If I play rook c4 targeting this h4 pawn, how yeah, you ever untangle? Yeah, it's very annoying. It's just very, very annoying because, yeah, it's, it's so difficult to make moves. But yeah, Magnus goes queen f5 check. Okay. Um, can I play rook g6, rook c6, queen... Queen g5, right? Queen g5, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And it's then queen e4, right? It's okay, a difficult move to make on one minute. Yeah, it's... Uh, pinning yourself like this is is definitely... Like, you, you have to be very sure you're not blundering something. And maybe you are. Yeah. Maybe after queen e4, you're already in a lot of trouble. Maybe you've lost the pawn h4. Yes, exactly. At least, yeah. At, at least. Yeah, which is why I was kind of arguing for King H6 and then G6, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, but you also might you might get made it there as well, like Rook C6, G6, Queen F4 check. Not a position I would want to play on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Super like, scary, because, yeah. Yeah, because I think you're kind of supposed to play like Queen G5 and then King H5. <laughs> what? But, wow. And yeah. and currently I don't see any made because we don't have C5. The C5 square is covered very importantly. But, you know, if you have like half an hour to check and triple check and maybe then you can play this comfortably. But on, on the minute, 
you're you're not ecstatic about this. <laughs> Yeah, no, not at all. Yeah, I mean, he really needs some some four sequence of moves where he understands that he he gets some stability or he will be able yeah. to. And, and he was basically he was trying to make a force draw. Like he played uh, a five, bishop f three. I mean, I'm most curious. Like the, the the biggest question for me is what if if you want to play five, why are you not playing e five here? Why are you waiting for rook three queen f two? Yes, but okay. The, now the things are heating up. Yeah. Maybe we don't have time to. Also, maybe we have the camera for. We, we should have the camera for this. We board. should this definitely board. because now also after G six, the seventh rank is getting opened up. What is what is going on? Is is Georg surviving? It's going to be very similar to the line that we were just showing. I think it's going to be very very. Um, uh, and apparently, for 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 some reason, we don't actually have access to uh, to that camera. And I want to point out that. Uh, sort of as a kind of a, a additional annoyance for for Georg, if let's say the queens get traded on the g5 square and black has to take with the king, for instance, like queen f7 check here, I want to give a sample line, it's not forced. Like queen f4, queen g5, we take, yeah, let's go queen f8 check here, it's cleaner, yeah, queen f8, king h5, we give a check from h8, we trade on h6, and we go rook c7. This actually wins the pawn. <laughs> I mean, I assume it's a draw, but even let's say if nothing else happens here, Black will still have to hold this endgame. But it's not difficult, though. Yeah, it's just yeah, it, it should be draw with yeah, this king. Fine, yeah. yeah, and and thanks to this h4 pawn. Yeah, in in mm. endgame, if it's not this pawn is not gonna be lost, then it will be a big asset. Yeah. 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 All right. So Magnus in charge. Uh, Georg down to a minute. Uh, very, very shaky situation for him. And we get a chance to look at Arya and Tarya. I think that a lot of developments have happened. And what we talked about, that the clock situation will will, mm -hmm. will be decisive. And now something like, I guess, something like Queen D6 is just crushing for Black, right? Because the, suddenly the pawn on G3 is so weak that your position collapses. Yeah, this this one definitely. I mean, you know, it was very funny that after c5, that that he blundered, then Tari immediately corrected himself and played g6 and bishop g7 and then knight f5. I want yeah, something that should have been done. Something yeah. that should have been done ages ago. Yeah. On on move 17, when he opted for knight g6, of course, here the typical way is already g6 and then knight f5, bishop well, g7. Well. It's, L luckily for him, it, it works out and it's a big step for Norway because that was the, suddenly the only uh, game where they potentially had uh, had trouble. That's fine. What is Johan Sebastian doing? He seems to be winning. Yeah, I think he was maybe, I think Chad was suggesting he was in trouble earlier, but now he's just winning because there's rook c1, rook takes c3 just wins on the spot. So white does not have a good way or really any way to preserve material balance. And yeah, Magnus just makes a quiet move here, just goes queen f4 without uh, without giving any more checks, which is, yeah. yeah, this is why I wanted to play king h6 to, yeah, to very stop unpleasant. something like this from happening. Yeah. And now you're just sitting there panicking because you can't find the move. Yeah, and let's just show the difference, yeah, that now yeah, queen g5 this, is met by check. Yeah. This is you just getting checkmated because the rook got to c7 with a check and you no longer have this h5 square. So I'm guessing you have to play something like king g8 right now and hope that after rook c7 you have some kind of a perpetual, but you don't. Maybe you're no, just no. lost, no? No, I think with, with this time situation, it's it's basically game over. Yeah, I just yeah. don't, uh, don't maybe, feel like... Maybe you actually have to play like rook d3, rook d7 and give up the pawn on h4 with check. <clears throat> and... Yeah, uh, you, I mean, if you know at least that you can get to queen's end game, maybe it's, it's all, yeah, rook d3 played. Yeah, he had to, because everything else looked yeah. inadequate. And the point about this is... Uh, Objectively, these types of queen endings are very difficult to win, but with Magnus playing the white side and, you know, just how patient he is and how good he is at just continuing to ask small questions, uh, I don't envy uh, Georg his, his task of trying to hold it, but... Um, like for me, my, my personal experience was, and uh, I remember it very distinctly, I, I had this game against uh, Dieter Nisipiano in one of the World Cups, where I had a kind of a normal position, and then I blundered something horribly. And uh, I, I actually was very, very lucky that uh, instead of kind of beating me immediately, uh, Dieter settled for some kind of an endgame, 
where he had a very healthy extra pawn, like I think three against two, queen, and, queen ending, which honestly I assumed was just lost. I thought because his king was quite safe and the pawn was, I couldn't really do much about the pawn being pushed. Uh, but I could see that, you know, I have some drawing chances, so of course I should continue defending. And I defended that endgame reasonably safely. In the end, I made a draw. And we discussed it afterwards, and we kind of came to the conclusion that, yeah, it wasn't easy for him to win or anything. And then I came back to the room, and the engine was just saying 0, 0, 0 from the start of the ending. Not even like 0, 50, just draw. Which was a very interesting discovery for me, because I assumed that, you know, the engine's will with very very precise play will claim that all of these types of positions are trouble so i think this this also like if you give this position to a computer with black i think the computer might actually hold this but uh it's irrelevant i think what we should practically explain that uh, actually black is very lucky to add the pawn on g6 because this pawn on g6 gives a nice shelter for black's king yeah, mm -hmm. so black will be able to hide on h7. On the other hand, if this pawn would not be on g6, but it would be on h7 or h6, then black would always have a big, big trouble with his king. Yeah, yeah. This will be, this will be, I, I'm, I'm kind of putting down my marker right now that this will be the final game that we will be covering today. <laughs> <laughs> could easily be. Yeah, yeah it, it could, could it, it could like very easily go 120 moves or something. Um, but... Uh, I, I think it probably ends up being a win for White. Ah, oh, wow, look at this. In, uh, in the game Shashikiran against Baltag, Julian, after the move knight f5, rook d5 was played, I think here Shashi is very, very happy. Yeah, I think, I think this is exactly the kind of a trade that White wants anyway. So I think you probably play rook a8 and you try to like repeat this shuffling. Like I want to... Uh, pretend that I have some, th some threats on the A file, and if you play rook A5 back, I will play rook D8 back, of course, and so on. Uh, but yeah, white is white is in control here. Yeah, especially because now the knight on F5 might be a target. Yeah, that you you move the mm -hmm. knight somewhere. I don't know. Okay, just randomly. And then randomly, E3, E4, I'm... yeah, and then E3, E4 starts becoming a big problem. Yeah, yeah I don't like this. Yeah, maybe we suddenly go on 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 attack. Yeah. The same applies to knight f3. I was just saying that yeah, I, I randomly put the knight. Maybe knight fc, knight e5 targeting the bishop mm -hmm. and also going rook d7, yeah. maybe even stronger. Yeah. In any, uh -huh. any case, it's, it's looking wonderfully for, for Shashi. Yeah, what's happening in Vesley's game, it suddenly became like structure changed dramatically. I mean, he, he seems to be eliminating the c6 pawn quickly. Then yeah, bishop seven, bishop well. seven, I very much like. Yeah, just making sure that the pawn on six gets removed. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that due to the, some technical issue, we we don't have the clock running well, in, in all the boards. Yeah, takes takes queen c one. Maybe I have it here. Yeah, something weird happened there because on the website it says Wesley has two minutes and White lost on time, which I'm pretty sure is not true. <laughs> So yeah, the game is still continuing, but yeah, Wesley Wesley probably is uh, in control. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, takes takes queen c one. White probably had like if it says White has no time on the website, it probably means that White has very little time in in, in practice. So queen c one, he is trying to provoke rook takes d three to play queen c four with the tempo, creating a lot of threats. But black, of course, is not obliged to uh, to take on uh, d three here. You can choose a different square. Yes, uh, definitely. If if in the time trouble your opponent is offering you this chance, then then the first reaction is <laughs> just to say no, thank you, mm -hmm. anything but not that. Yeah, I don't know, rook a5 or... Yeah, rook a5. Just put, yeah. It, put it on some kind of a safe square just to make sure that it doesn't hang next move. And then we take on c6 and we go from there. Uh, we'll see what Wesley, uh, we'll see what Wesley does because, uh, yeah, he, he understands all of these things and he will, he will choose a good practical decision here. Yeah, so U US team is perfectly safe. Uh, Indian team seems to be quite safe i mean what what is happening in arjun's game because ah, that's this... uh 
So something, actually, the line we were showing happened, the entire line happened up to knight g6, but he didn't play, he played correctly. Instead of king d7, he played king d8, so that knight takes e5 is not a check. And then he played knight g5 here. Um, and, uh, yeah, black is still better. The question is how much, yeah. Black is yeah, still but, but I remember you, you were saying, like, maybe white is selling his uh, position too cheap. I fully agree with you, yeah, that now, I, I feel like the drawing chances with, with all these fixed pawns and then vulnerable pawns, you know, why should be escaping here? Probably, yeah. I still, I, obviously, it's still very nice for black. Black has more pawns and, you know, Rook E1 is currently a huge threat. Rook yeah. C3 makes I mean, of course, I was threat. thinking about Knight D3, but I noticed that with Knight E6, you will yeah. be able to plot C7. That's key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, yeah, I, I went through the exact same, the exact same uh, type of thinking that ninety three, let's say rook a one, rook c eight, but ninety six keeps everything together, and then yes. uh, the queen side will start collapsing. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm still not entirely sure just how how bad it is for for Ergesi, but he he is at least he made the time control, so he can now uh, spend some time figuring out you know how to approach this. Maybe ninety seven check is not stupid. I've been looking at this. Just asking the question, like, where do you want your king? Okay, king, king f7, f7, I wanted to go rook e5. Ah, rook e1 check. Yeah, I don't know. No, rook e1 check, maybe king f4. It's a tricky <laughs> endgame, yeah. Like, yeah, very tricky endgame, yeah. Yeah, we could, spend, we could spend quite some time discussing this, but yeah, we, we should just probably let them play. In yeah. the meantime... Uh, it's quite low down, but uh, that match that we were just... Ah, and, uh, I mean, Harry is winning already. Um, yeah, Harry is completely winning. Yeah, this is over. Yeah. So this is clear. Naranan Sunildut is putting a lot of pressure. Basically, probably he's just winning. Yeah. yeah. Then, okay, basically the match match is over, practically. Speaking. Yeah, the, the match is safe. Yeah, well, it's just a question of uh, what's uh, what's going to... Like yeah, Wesley, being super professional, he retreated the look all the way to A8. All the way to A8, yeah, just to make sure. Yeah, D4, D5. the pawn. <clears throat> yeah. D5. Okay, this should be winning because White's king on G1 is also not okay. Luckily for White, he has this wonderful knight on FC, which kind of gives some stability and some hope. But objectively, it should be lost. Yeah, should be should be not great. Yeah, we are, what two pawns down? Yeah, yeah. You probably you I probably... even lost count. Yeah, <laughs> I mean a lot, a lot yeah. of pawns down. Yeah, two pawns down. Yeah, uh, the US will win. Uh, Norway will win. Uh, yeah, Tari already won. Yeah. Tari won. Magnus, I think, will end up winning his endgame. Uh, Hammer is at least a little bit better, I would assume. And uh, Johann Sebastian will win. Uh, yeah, what's so happening? The, the game that we have been talking about, right from the beginning, that it might be interesting is, is Darda versus Shilov. And it seems like Shilov is having things under control. Yeah, I think it probably is over, honestly. Like, it's, it seems like a resignable position to me because the king on a4 is about to get mated. And because, yeah, knight c4 creates a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of mating threats. No, we're, we're not doing this. We're doing this remotely. Uh, it's been a question that gets repeated every now and again, but. Uh, none of us are in India. Yes, so, okay, Shirov is, is winning. That's already very big news for for the Spanish team. Paco Vallejo is winning. Okay, of course, it's always a pleasure to, to make such like tactical yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, measures. This is, a, this is a very cute, uh, very cute little move to be making for sure. Uh, Checkmate on the back rank, and now yeah. White will simply admit all the pawns on the queen side and win the game. Yeah, that Grunfeld that we were discussing uh, at, at, at the start, Black is still better, but I don't know. Actually, with the king so much more active than the White King, I'm probably he will win. Yeah, I'm I'm still taking uh, taking Black quite comfortably here. Yeah, it's it's going to be a very very difficult position to hold for. Uh, for the Belgian player with bishop d5 coming in. Board 4, uh, Iturizaga has already beaten his opponent. So, yeah, Spain is very comfortably winning against Belgium today. What else do we have? Well, Poland. Radek is doing ex exactly everything according to plan. Yes, yeah, slowly, step by step, slowly but surely winning, uh, squeezing out a win. Yeah. Already pawn up, weak pawn on d5, uh, wonderful mm -hmm. bishop and wonderful rook. 
two draws on the two draws on the bottom boards there uh on boards three and four and uh uh Kasper Piron completely winning on board two as well so Poland will also be very very comfortably uh winning their match Yes, Azerbaijan has won three one as I see. Gusanov one and uh, Abasov one mm -hmm. and two draws with the black piece is very professional. I yeah, mean. very very nicely done by by the the, the young Azeris. Yeah, just uh, you know winning with white, drawing with black. The the time honored recipe for for doing well in team tournaments. Uh, yes, and what about yeah? What about this uh, big duel between the Netherlands and? Uh, and Portugal, it, it, I mean, from the beginning, one would have not expected that this could be so close, but we, we checked after two hours, it was very double-edged. Mm -hmm. And what has changed? Maybe not much has changed. I mean, Jordan is maybe trying to squeeze something out in a night-end game. Let's move on. But Erwin uh, is worse. Lamy is clearly worse. Yeah, with this night on Steve. I mean, if Erwin would be white, we would be almost sure that he will win this. Yeah, it's, I mean... There is not a lot of material left, so I don't know how easy it is to actually convert into a full point. But uh, clearly, white is white is much better. Um, so this is a bit of a problem. Uh, the box yeah, about is Benjamin? Broken. Yeah, I mean, clearly there was a trade on. I mean, this yeah, is this is a, the, yeah. The queens are off. The queens are off on the e8 square, and this end game is being played. And as we, because today there are two games with the structure. Basically, we've been discussing it. Uh, d despite everything being so completely closed, White sometimes actually wins these types of positions. Like you play bishop g3, you bring the king over to f3, you play knight e2, g4, knight g3. And at some point, black very often doesn't have enough pieces to protect the five without trading. And then if, you, if, if, if five takes g4, hg4 happens, white starts having even more space and eventually uh, like simply because black pieces just no longer really have squares to look forward to these types of positions get taken apart but the fact that the entire queen side has been completely closed down is very very good news for black here uh, yeah he probably can uh, play h5 and then make yeah. sure that g4 will not be played right yeah and jordan offered a draw in that endgame actually yeah wow okay so Ah, it was some repetition of moves. Ah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Somehow we feel that nowadays nobody wants to offer a draw, yeah? They prefer mm -hmm. to, to find the repetition. Yeah. So and yeah, you then draw. This this Benjamin game is very, very close to draw. Erwin in some trouble. And Max is the one who is who is pressing. Max is much, crazy. much better, yeah. Because White is basically in Tsuk Tsuang, the pawn on d4 will fall. Like, you go g6, g5 here. And White is in actual Tsuk Tsuang. Things will start falling because you don't have moves. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you, you, you just have to start giving up material. And uh, yeah, I think Max is just more or less straight up winning. Uh, and board one was a draw. Benjamin Bock might not win, but he definitely never ever loses that position. Yeah, all so lies on Erwin. Yeah, Erwin yeah. needs to hold this. Yeah, Erwin, Erwin just needs to make a draw there for, for uh, the Dutch players to, uh, to win a very difficult match. Yeah, this, this is... Uh, and a very difficult see. position still, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you can see, this is very challenging for them. This monster knight on c5, yeah. Yeah. All right, I'll 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 leave you alone for a second and be back in a... Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so what do we have? Yeah, we, we have already seen a lot of results. Uh, let's see the Ukrainian team because they are coming next. Anton Kodobov has won his game. Yuri Kuzubov is well. I I don't even say that he's he's squeezing because I don't believe that White has any winning chances here. Uh, the the pawn structure is too vulnerable, and Black has this very very nice cemented bishop on on b5 protecting the c6 pawn. I think this is quite drawy. Shevchenko has won uh, the game, so basically Ukraine has already won the match, and Onishuk. Is also winning, yeah. So a very, very comfortable. Uh, maybe he has already won. I would, wouldn't be surprised if Black had already resigned. So Ukraine having things completely under control. The Finnish team started with a disaster. We, we have already seen this, that uh, Nisipianu has won a very, very quick game. The game between 
Skiarov uh, against Rasmus Vane ended up in a draw. What else do we have? Matthias Blubaum with the white pieces having a pawn up, but uh, but I don't know how easy it will be to, to convert. Yeah, the bishop on c6 and the queen on d3 somehow controlling the knight on, on c3. The big question will be if, if white starts pushing his e pawn, then, uh, then is this pawn going to queen, or that suddenly the bishop on c6 will be very powerful hitting on g2 and black will be able to, to clean. for example, yeah, let's just show that ah, it's, uh, it's black to move. Okay, let me just make a move to highlight that, for example, king h7, if white pushes e5, there is a chance that black can play a move like queen c2, hitting on g2, and after queen g3, bishop takes g2, a very typical motif, queen g2, queen takes c3, should be though, but okay. In any case, if Germany is leading, then, then it's a very comfortable and very pleasant problem because actually White does not need to win this position to win the match. And yes, Dimitri Kolars is winning against Pekka Koika, so, so the match is, match is just won already. So Germany in total control. What about England? The, the English team, a very, very interesting team with a lot of our colleagues uh, from, from the past. M M Mickey Adams, we are definitely rooting for Mickey. What is he doing? Yeah, he's pawned down, but he's not worse. I mean, he's just very, very active. In uh, It's very much a, a drawish, drawish kind of position. What else do we have? Wow, I mean, uh, Gavin Jones made a draw. Mickey will make a draw, which means that it, it's kind of 1-1. One, one, so the two white games, what is, what is our David doing? Our David. Ah, and Peter is back. Well, take a look. M Mickey makes a draw. Gavin Jones made a draw. And, and the big question is, what are, what are the yeah, our, our, guys? Our chat was actually pointing out that this match is, uh, is very, very unclear. Because uh, David is not much better, I would suggest. And uh, uh, Ravi Hare on board for, it's some kind of an incredible mess. But... Like, if anyone is better here, like, my initial impression is black might be better because black is a pawn up. It's maybe not that important, but d4 is hanging. And uh, I'm not sure why the king on e2 is supposed to be safer than the king on c8. So... Yeah, especially because black's king can move away, but <laughs> where, where does this white king move them? Eh? Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't even know what you're supposed to play. Uh, at least they made time control. So uh, at, the, at this moment, uh, Ravi will be able to, you know, take some time to figure out exactly what's going on and perhaps find something that is playable. Because currently, I am really struggling to even figure out what you're supposed to play here. How are you supposed to not to lose the pawn on d4? Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. very, very confusing to me. I mean, very, very dangerous. And this almost brings me to that the game of David Havel is much, much more important because if, if White is in trouble there, then actually David needs to win at all costs. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he has things under control, but winning chances, Black has this very, very solid setup yeah. with Bishop F8, Bishop F7. Black is probably hinting at some queen d5 and then targeting d4 yeah, pawn. That's yeah, why also the pawn I think you're kind of supposed to play knight c5, but that allows further simplifications, and I don't know how happy you are about that. Yeah, and uh, David is playing against uh, Kevin uh, Goemin, who I know a little bit. I've been uh, uh, speaking to him on occasion. He's a, he's a very nice guy who I think he, he got his final GM norm maybe last year after chasing it for quite some time. He is uh, not entirely a chess professional. I think he has a very uh, solid solid job outside of chess, but uh, a, very, a very strong player and also a player who at some point like took time out to uh, dedicate himself to chess for like a couple of years and did get the GM title, which he wanted to get for, uh, for, for, for quite some time. Yeah, wow. I mean, this is this is really very, very interesting. So I, I guess that David will try to play a very long game. We will certainly keep an eye on it. Let's mm -hmm. take a look. What is happening? So Gukesh is uh, winning his endgame. Yeah, have, probably, probably winning. Yeah. Yeah, we were expecting Prague has Prague already has won. Prague has already won. Adiban, Adiban has already won. 
And, and Sadwani Sadwa. is uh, probably clearly better, yeah. Yeah, he's an exchange down, but he has those very, very beautiful looking pawns on the queen side, which he can continue pushing, and he has two pawns for the exchange anyway. And also this knight on e5 is kind of trapped. Mm. Yeah, it, it looks uh, nice. So basically they have things under control. What about Armenia? So I see Gabi made a draw. As, as expected, that white was actually doing quite fine. Second, both uh, Sahakian also made a draw. Uh, uh, once again, thanks to our chat. Apparently that really messy position with the king on e2 against the king on c8 uh, in the England match. Uh, uh, the player playing the black pieces is a woman grandmaster, so... Um, oh, wow. Uh, very, very nicely played uh, game by her, seemingly. Uh, some kind of a complicated uh, advanced French in which uh, a lot of things must have happened to get here. Uh, and uh, Satiris informs us that she is one of the seven women playing in the open section. Yeah, that's always nice to hear. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. because if if a female player plays in the open section, it means that she has really high quality. Yeah, that's that's the reason why they they put there, and 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 often they want to give her a chance to to improve as a player. Yeah, to to play against very strong opposition. Yeah, and you and can you can today you can I think quite clearly see why because uh, exactly. Yeah, Ravi is a very very promising uh, promising player, very good player, and uh, he has definitely had his hands very full today, uh, trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, and, and again, we see that yeah, she, uh, her, his, his opponent, she's only 2275 on, on paper, yeah, but uh, judging paper, uh, paper, by the position yeah. that we have on the board, she played it on a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, all right. Wow, lot, lot, of, lot of information coming. And, and Armenians, yeah, Armenians won 3-1, so two draws and, and two wins. What do we have? The Iranian team. Iranian team. Max Todlu won. But it's the only game that is finished. However, they mm -hmm. are in, in control. They are in control. Okay, maybe yeah, Tabatabe is in some kind of... A, no, actually, Tabatabe is lost. Oh, yeah, losing the, 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 losing yeah, Bishop Endgame because of this pawn on H4 and pawn on B6. Yeah, it looks like yeah, Bishop D4 and then we go F4. Are we in time to bring the king to G4? No, why yeah, are we let, let's that? figure it out? Yeah, so bishop d4, bishop d8. Why are we winning? F4, king f7. Yeah, if, if black king reaches f5, is there any tsuk swang? No, there won't be any tsuk swang. You have, yeah, I'm slightly <laughs> confused why this is so great. Yeah, wow, I mean, it's we'll see. Uh, we'll see. There's there's still plenty of play there. Uh, yeah, and on the other boards. Yeah, I mean Idani Puya is just completely winning with white. It's it's time to design yeah, basically. Yeah, time time to pack it in. So yeah, they're they're, they're safe. Yeah, they're safe. Um, here, yeah, Musavi is it's just a very equal position. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I guess nobody wins here, but he doesn't really need to win with the with the two white boards being completely. I mean, one is already over, and one will be over soon. So yeah. Iran will win the match. The question is what, what the score will be. Ah, and uh, Abdul Satulov, the, the game that we have spoken about uh, that had potential to, to be a firework, it, it ended with a checkmate. Yeah, he eventually the, 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 the counterplay uh, just outweighed everything else. And in fact, it didn't really last very long. From the position we were discussing, it kind of went very quickly. I guess uh, some kind of a tactic was missed somewhere and uh, things have gone sharply downhill from, from that moment onwards. Yeah, which basically, I guess, means that the match is, match is over. Yeah, there's, yeah they're, they're up to zero and doing very well on the other two boards as well. So yeah, they will win big, maybe even 4-0 if things go to plan. Uh, the, the French are also in charge. Uh, Musar won on board. One today, I guess, Fres is... Having probably. a dream scenario. Yeah, this is a very, very nice, <laughs> very nice positional game by Fres today. Uh, from this weird structure that you sometimes see in the Gioco Piano where Black allows Bishop takes e6 fe and then pushes d5, d4, and you get this very asymmetrical type of, uh, type of structure where uh, 
Yeah, black. Yeah, and if if uh, if you can't stop black from assuming this this amount of control on the queen side, very often white never actually develops any play on the king side, and eventually bad things start happening everywhere. So yeah, Fress is winning. Uh, uh, Mathieu Carnet gave mate on the board. Somehow there's we, we see a lot of that so far in the first two days. Yeah, there is a lot of games which actually ended with one of the players allowing physical mate on the board and uh uh mark andre moritz is also has al also won already already won already yes exactly. yeah so they will win for zero today against uh who were they playing they were playing um um uh, north macedonia yeah yeah and also very interesting to keep an eye on the third indian team Surya ganguly in some kind of a trouble okay thanks to this wonderful bishop that are drawing chances and this powerful pawn on e4, but it's uh, yeah, it's he who has to watch out. Yeah, the the because I think all the pawn endings are drawn. Like you cannot actually play knight d4 and win. Um, but there might be a way to kind of finesse those things. Yeah, just in fact, you might have to be careful not to lose this with white. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, de definitely black can't lose, yeah, thanks to yeah. this uh, wonderful pass pawn. Of course, yeah, yeah white will shuffle, but he also has some weaknesses on the king side. I believe that Surya should should escape in practical yeah. play. And one, one mechanism, if, if, we, if we have this position on the screen, I want to uh, show the viewers one specific mechanism which might be useful for them. Because white has the two pawns on the b-file. So an important thing here to note is if you play knight d4, uh, black takes, takes, goes king c7, we play h3. Black goes king b6, we play g4. And here the trick is, like, if, if, if black just takes twice and plays, let's say, king takes b5, you probably lose after f4, f5. But there's always this trick because you can play f7, f5 check here. And then white actually probably loses this endgame. <laughs> yes. This is, I think, the way the way to lose because now once again we have a protected passer on the g file because if you take the, the g pawn actually quins uh, but it's important to to keep this in mind because once again if if you give white time to play a four or five your pawns will never get connected and because the, the the other pawn is on b2 very very far away white will have all the time in the world to pick up the g pawn and then go after the f7 pawn so you have to do it immediately but if you do it immediately you are in this case probably actually just winning Yes. Yeah, so White opted for b3. Definitely, Studio has to. I mean, yeah, probably he will just wait with his bishop, yeah? Mm -hmm. We just shuffle, we go bishop f2. Or... Yeah, well, what else to do? In any case, okay, Studio in a little bit uh, in, in some trouble, but practically speaking, I'm hoping and expecting him to survive. Setu. What is Setu doing? I mean, he's also under pressure. I mean, uh, the, the Mexican team, I mean, actually, the Mexican, I, I love Mexico. Come mm. on, I mean, uh, this is this is a very tricky match. Yeah, Absolutely, Ibarra is yeah. putting pressure on Setu. I mean, Morley Kartike and one on board, four already, so there's some some leeway. But on the other three boards, yeah, India India three are not having uh, not having an, an easy day at all. Ah, and and Gupta, okay, probably it's Gupta it's affordable. Yeah. yeah, Gupta Gupta is fine despite being a pawn down. I think Bishop against Knight and an outside pass, so you don't really expect this to be a problem for Black. But he also shouldn't win this. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, wow. I mean, Mexico is putting a lot of lot of uh, fight. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's it's all all eyes on. Uh, yeah, all eyes on basically on on Satu to hold it and also on on Surya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they wow. they need they need to uh, to make. I mean, hopefully two draws. Yeah, I, ideally both of them should uh, should not lose their positions. But yeah, despite outranking the, uh, their opponents by by quite significantly, like on board one, it's almost equal because board one of Mexico is 25-60, But then uh, twenty four fifty on board two, and then twenty three hundred and twenty two hundred on boards two, uh, three, and four. And the 2200 player actually lost, but everybody else is really uh, having a very, very uh, good day. Yeah, I mean, we also have to mention, yeah, that we, we had this privilege of playing in Morelia when, when Morelia and Linares uh, tournaments were combined. And 
Okay, basically we were just treated there like rock stars. I mean, okay, it was just yeah, it unbelievable. Was. Yeah, that we had like thousands of people waiting for us, chanting our names. I mean, Mexico loves chess, and it's so nice to see them fight fight so well. I mean, uh, it's it's basically one of my favorite countries. Also, the Mexico City War Championship in 2007 was was a wonderfully organized event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many many nice memories. I have been many times on vacation in Mexico as well. I mean, I'm I'm just loving the country. Very nice people and and really chess fanatic. Yeah. Uh, so let's maybe briefly check on. Uh... Well, the the Croatian team. You remember that it was the big question: what what yeah, yeah. will they do? And and we still don't have an answer, but, uh, but they lost. They, they lost those two bad positions that they had. They lost both of them. So yes. and and Berkic is in trouble. So it looks Berkic like Bulgaria. Yeah, I mean he, he wants to win at all costs. I mean, okay, I would still not rule out some kind of trick against this king. Yeah, but I think the problem is considering how the match is going. The problem is you having a draw here for Black is really quite reasonable. But you, you have to sort of continue pushing for a win. And I don't know how easy it is to continue pushing for a win here because you, objectively, you probably have to find a precise draw and take it. If you, like, if you are not playing in a team competition in this position, you probably just have to calculate your way to the most clean uh, safety you can find and just go there. But uh, they are 2 0 down. Uh, Ivan Sharic has some winning chances, but I think objectively even his position is very, very difficult to win. And they have to win both of them. They have to win this one, and they have to win the position on board one, which I don't know if you brought it up on screen, but it's some kind of an endgame where whatever advantage Ivan Sharic might have is just very, very small, considering how little material is left. Yes. Yeah, actually, we, we are about to see an upset here by the Bulgarian team. Yeah, not, not really surprising because I think Bulgaria, as someone who played a lot against the Bulgarian team over the years, they, they are incredibly dangerous. Uh, we, yeah, we absolutely. Always... But now suddenly, I mean, all these guys, I don't really know. Yeah, yeah, it's a new generation. But in, like in general, I have enough memories of struggling against Bulgarian team over, teams over the years to not be surprised when they do well. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah, so... Keep an eye on it. Yeah, Novel actually won that game against mm -hmm. uh, Tom Kantan. So I'm guessing that, uh, yeah, and, and Guyan has also won. They have yeah. things under control. In fact, they won 4 0. Yeah, they just won 4 0. They won, yeah. they won everywhere. Uh, 4 0. Hungary has, Hungary is leading 3 0 plus. We have a good position. I yeah, mean, Banus is, Banus is pressing. Promising endgame, yeah. I now that we're back on this match, I have to ask you because it was also people were inquiring in chat. What did you call uh, Ferenc Berkes? You, I think ah, Fetzo, yeah. Because this is, I mean, because Ferenc is is Fetzo, yeah. This is the this is the name, yeah. But but in English, yeah, I I know that Vichy was asking this question as well. That what, what is this Fetzo? But yeah, this is this is how we call him. Yeah, that's not very nice. Well, like in. Uh, no, no, but it's F E C O. Yeah, it's, ah, it's okay. four letters. Yeah, I mean, it's it's Hungarian, uh, uh, Hungarian. Uh, it, it's like uh, in in Russia, you have these shortcuts. Yeah, that. Yeah, is, yeah okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, I and also this is why the, the chat was so confused because you you know you everybody knows you're a very nice guy and and here you are calling calling somebody fat. So we were very very. Confused. No, no, it's it's fat. So it's, it's just just the name. Yeah, it's automatic. You know, because when I talk about Hungarians, then I have to call them how I'm calling them all their, course, all their yeah, lives. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Uh, otherwise, it feels just uh, very very strange. <clears throat> No, I understand, but we, you, you can also understand why we were slightly, slightly alarmed. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I know I had this conversation with Vichy as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a justified uh, question. So yeah, Hungarians are doing good, uh, good start. Everything is fine. The Romanians are also winning comfortably at three and a half, half. That's it. And, and we reached yeah, now we have Humpy. The, the women, we reached yeah. Humpy. What, what happened to Humpy? Uh, Many Let's changes, like the position is barely recognizable, and also she is not doing that well, apparently. Yeah, I mean, she she has lost control. Yes, she overpushed, or what happened? Yeah, because this position, uh, 
after DTX. Wow, but this is this, this is something I want to talk about, yeah, because as a chess coach and and and, and as a commentator, I feel that uh, mentioning something like this is important. That what is it? It's move thirty eight was bishop f three, bishop d seven, rook e one, rook e seven, and hump is move forty, move ninety six. I I don't think unless you understand that this is very very strong and and you feel like I have to play it. You should never change the structure on, on move 40. Yeah, I, th I think I, I, I agree with you. And maybe she didn't feel she had a very comfortable passing move. Maybe she was worried knight d3 was coming in or something. But in general, I'm very much in agreement with you that uh, you have to be very, very certain to change a structure like this on, uh, uh, on move 40. Even though, like, you can sort of understand because the pawn he survives. So you can you can definitely understand why you, she would be interested in in trying this, but uh, I think her problem is black. I think quite comfortably can just play around that pawn on e six. You it's so so completely blockaded, and the bishop on e five after g five bishop takes e five, which has already been played. Uh, the bishop on e five just so comfortably closes everything down that. Uh, the pawn e6 doesn't just doesn't give white very much, and in fact, what probably starts happening here is that black plays g5, g4, and black starts trying to give mate on the queen on, on the king side. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, I'm very, very worried. It it almost feels like one of those Sveshnikovs, yeah, that, that yeah, I was yeah. playing, and mm -hmm. you know, I was never the greatest attacker, but whenever I got this this attack with the monster bishop on e5. I felt uh, I felt like I'm a monster. Yeah, probably white is. I know, but I wanted to highlight that maybe white is in time to get there, but it does not even work because first of all, it's black to move. Yeah. Secondly, then the e6 pawn is also vulnerable. Yeah, I think we we, we go g4, bishop g5, and then we choose between uh, queen g5 or queen f6. And eventually, I want to play like king f8, rook h7, king e7, like restructure myself this way if I can. Uh, obviously. You have to pay attention to rook takes e5 sacrifices if you, you want to play with the king on f8, not immediately, but like if I want to do what I just said, like king f8 and move the rook away, I will have to pay attention to rook takes e5. But generally speaking, like the pawn on e6 is not going to give white very much at all. And the king on h1 is in some trouble. Yeah, in, in any case, okay, black has things under control. Maybe white is also more or less fine after all. The, the good news for white is that white is not forced to take AG4 because AG4 would be a catastrophe, then white's king would be checkmated. But by being able to go bishop d5, and then as you pointed out, rook takes e5 also. I spotted some rook f1 hitting f5 pawn also as a counterplay. Yeah, it, it, I, it, 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 it might be holdable. It provokes f5, f4, but f5, f4 might not be a bad idea, unfortunately, for white. Like you, yeah. you, you play rook f1, I will play f4, I will feel a bit. Un unhappy about it, but it also creates some of four of three ideas. So yeah, I don't I don't know how how comfortable you are here with white, but the match probably is doing quite well because uh, uh, Vaishali is completely winning on board too, and uh, Tanya has already won her game, and on board four seems like uh, India is also completely winning. So yeah, yeah. So there is basically no intrigue in the match. Ah, our game. Yes, and, and this is what we expected, yeah, that actually Maria mm -hmm. Muzichuk was in a lot of, lot of trouble. She lost her game, but uh, I guess that on the other boards, uh, things are fine. Yeah, Ushanina is probably winning her end game. It looks very, very horrible for Black. Yeah, this is like the, the absolute dream scenario with exactly. C5, C5 coming in next move and then things will just start collapsing. Already board for Yulia Osmak has already won, so they are leading. And what about the third board? Also winning. Yes, completely winning, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, even, you know, despite losing on board one, they will win quite comfortably. I think 3-1 three, three, is the the expected result here. Yes, uh, and so what then happened? what do we have? The Georgian team? Yeah, Zagnitza yeah. won. Yamakish really drew. And they won on board three and yes. uh, on board four. Ah, board four, they are losing, but it does not matter already, yeah? Yeah, they're, they're, they're two and a half up 
half up. So yeah, they will drop some board points, but it shouldn't. And matter. by the way, I don't know how lost it is. Yeah, I was maybe a little bit too harsh because this a passer with with this bishop, the green fat bishop. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh yeah. Technically, you you you're never entirely sure you're winning these types of positions. I think objective, like quote unquote, objectively, it's winning, but who cares? Like, yes, exactly. You still have to make moves, and uh, the a pawn is always is always a bit of a problem. Uh, yeah, what so, about Polish team? I see that uh, Alina Kashninskaya made a draw on board one. Uh, board two, ah, uh, Olivia Kolbasa won her game, so they are leading. Uh, yeah, they, 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 they've already. Yeah, I think. Yeah, they won half, already. Yes, three and a half, 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 half. Um, let me check very briefly. Yeah, so the, so the favorites are having things under control. Pretty much, yeah. So so far, like in terms of upsets, it's this match between uh, Bulgaria and uh, uh, Croatia and, and Croatia that is maybe our best our best bet for for an upset. I'm I'm looking at results on uh, on the Chess Twenty Four website. So uh, yeah, India will win. We we don't know exactly with which score, but they will win. Uh, Ukraine will win. Uh, Georgia will uh, is, has already won the match, so the question is how big. Poland winning comfortably. Uh, France winning comfortably. Azerbaijan winning comfortably. The U.S. is two nil up, and uh, uh, two games still in play, but looks like might might be a four zero as well. So yeah, seems like not very many upsets, at least on the top on the top boards in the women's uh, section. Uh, the favorites are having things uh, so far, so far, so good for for the rating favorites. Yeah, and for us, what about uh, yeah? So the time control has been uh, made. The the second stage. I I feel like okay, we we should also speak about this that with this feed the time control. Yeah, with 90, 90 minutes plus thirty seconds for each movie. On on one hand. The 30 seconds gives you stability in time trouble. On the other mm -hmm. hand, after the time control, after move 40, it's not like in the old classical chess that suddenly you can refresh yourself, have a big walk, you go to the bathroom, wash your face and everything, and you get ready for another two, three hours of big fight. It's it's much, much more faster. And uh, this is one of the things why I I'm I don't think that I'm capable of playing on my real level in with this time control that... After move 40, usually I was always in terrible time trouble. I, I want to calm my nerves down. I yeah, need to yeah. go to the bathroom. And, you know, I make all my rituals. I come back to the board and I have 20 minutes left for the rest of the game. Yeah, It's, uh, it, it's a lot of, lot of pressure on the players. Yeah, absolutely. As we watch uh, Wesley just uh, waiting for his opponent to come to some decisions. Yeah, Wesley is... Uh, it, it looks a little bit scary because White is pushing in the center. But I guess he just goes C3, C2 now. And uh, just collects, uh, collect. I don't know. D6, queen takes G6. It's actually a little. There is still some play left because of how good this knight on F3 is, and the the two very beautiful central pawns that his opponent uh, has to. Uh, yeah, it's the king's forward. gambit structure, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it does look a little bit like they they played some kind of a weird king's gambit, but of course, black is now not even two. I think no, it's still two. Yeah, I, th I was I was going to say it's now three pawns up. It's still two, but. You should be able to control things quite well here if you're Wesley. You expect him to figure it out, uh, and uh, the the match is of course uh, completely safe with uh, with Sam, the only one who was ever in any kind of trouble. He he made a strategic draw offer to make sure that the match is uh, under no pressure. And once again, I'm looking through the scores. A lot of matches have already finished. Poland won three one. Uh, Azerbaijan won three one. Ukraine is three nil up. Uh, the Netherlands, yeah, this is actually uh, a, an interesting one uh, because, we, as we mentioned, very much will depend on whether Irvin will hold his kind of ugly-looking position. But yeah, now he's completely fine. Yeah, I don't Night like. Improved, yeah. Yeah, I don't like what his opponent has done with uh, with his position. Yeah, I think exactly. The, because this is what I was also thinking, like that. Okay, if White will break with G four, then maybe at some point with F five, Black can get counterplay. And mm -hmm. this is exactly what happened. G4, King, H6, very, very sneaky. 
play by by Erwin. He knows that now White has compromised the structure and he's getting ready for some F5, G5, King, H5 counterplay. Exactly, yeah. And uh, if you do if you do this, if you if you move your rook away from the A file, the issue here is that let's say even if you win a pawn, but there is some kind of a knight ending where Black has an outside passer on the A file. Most of those will be quite comfortably drawn because of just how annoying that outside passer is. So yeah, I think I think now Ervin just holds this without too much drama. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, no. I think the, his team is also very very much relieved. Yeah. So we have we have this this match where uh, Croatia is actually zero two down against Bulgaria, and we also have this very unclear match between England and and Singapore. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's catch up with uh, with Harry Aravi's game. We also got uh, an information that uh, uh, the, the the female player with black she had a peak rating of twenty three eighty. So she she actually. But that was yeah pre pandemic when when people were still playing over the board chess. Ag exactly, and then yeah. she fell victim of this uh, pandemic situation. Probably she didn't play enough games so when she played she was not in the mood or she couldn't really concentrate under the new circumstances and now here she is and yeah, she's but, fighting but hang on queen g7 queen h3 yeah or queen g7 yeah i i think something may have gone a bit wrong yeah i was trying to calculate this when we were discussing the position after move 40. specifically for some reason i was trying to play rook h5 h4 but rook 1 h4 is much more sensible and uh I think the trick here, you would like to play knight takes e5, right? But then queen g8, I guess, wins material. Queen g8, queen takes g8, rook h8. And after this trade happens with a check, I will take on e5 and I will be completely winning. And a kind of a similar thing happened in the game uh, because uh, she played queen bishop takes d4, which looks like it's win it wins some material. But I mean, hang on, actually I was calculating this, but I saw that after rook h4 we have a move like f5. Maybe, yeah, I, I don't know. It's very possible, yeah. I, I was actually thinking about uh, this position a little bit. And I, but yeah, five, five looks very, very uh, frightening, honestly, because you cannot afford for the knight on g4 to become supported by the... Like, if knight on g4 is really the only piece black has which you can challenge properly. So if it gets supported by the pawn on the five and you cannot do anything about it, then you're in trouble. But if you take on passant here... Knight takes f6 attacks a lot of things. But maybe it's, queen e5, yeah? Maybe there is yeah, a mess. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not a believer somehow. Like knight h5, queen e6, we go king b7, rook takes rook h5. h5. Such a mess, actually. Maybe it's a mess, yeah. Like it's a mess. Maybe you can play like this. Yeah. Not easy. That, of, that's why she lost control. Yeah, there was too much to calculate. Suddenly. Yeah, yeah doesn't, doesn't, seem, doesn't seem easy at all. Yeah, yeah, and now um, after queen g4, bishop c3, yeah, queen g7 on the board. Yeah, so rook h8 is a threat, and uh, yeah, looks like uh, Ravi is going to uh, come out of this ahead because yeah, the bishop is hanging, rook h8 check is a very, very large threat, obviously. So it looks like black is losing material here. And this yeah. is also very, very good news for, for David, yeah, because if he knows that. Uh, Haria is not in any danger, then there will be much less pressure on him. And and look at this, bishop c7, a very, very nice little idea, mm -hmm. bishop b6, bishop c5. Yeah, and also weirdly, like I'm starting to wonder if Mickey maybe can win his game, but I guess not. I mean, uh, it's it's too much to, to, imagine, uh, to imagine this not being a draw. Yeah, well, in any, any case, uh, the, the big turnaround in the other game helps David to absolutely yeah this yeah. is this is obviously very welcome news because he no longer has to go all in exactly and and the position doesn't look like you can go all in yeah so it's very important mm -hmm. to be able just to play your game yeah yeah exactly yeah um, but bishop c7 I very much like yeah if you can lend the bishop on c5 it improves your chances dramatically because uh, then you will be left with this knight on c5 against the bishop on f7 which is exactly the material balance you want to have on the board. Exactly. So, but but I'm wondering that uh, is the clock because I see that Black's clock has ticked out. It, it's not not right. But maybe Harvest, uh, maybe David's uh, clock is is kind of correct. That did he really spend? Yeah, I so think much? I, I think it's one of those situations where David made his move forty first move, so he got his half an hour added, and then the time distracted. Yeah, exactly as Sotiris is saying. The moment Kevin makes a move here, his clock will be correct. It's basically. 
the PGN not managing uh, the the change between the first and the second time control properly. Yeah, yeah. Then 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 I understood also correctly that yeah, David has spent quite a lot of time for bishops to seven. Yeah. Yeah, and probably he's waiting for the outcome of the other game. Yeah, because uh, he, he was really worried after move 40, but now this, this turnaround happened and he has to adjust his uh, mental state as well. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that was that was exactly the, the dynamic here. And so by the we... way, we know that David loves uh, time travel. I mean, he, he loves to get this thrill of uh, fighting with very little time on the clock and he does it beautifully, actually. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is pretty good at it. As are you know many of the people who are sort of constantly in time troubles. You know, you you you, you can't really you know not become very good at it if you you know if you want to. Like he is twenty seven hundred, uh, which means that at some point he adjusted and became very strong because you know you have to, or or you will be losing every second game with with the kind of time management that he practices. You know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And there are these uh, type of players who are very good with the 30 seconds bonus, yeah? Because I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm good in good at blitz and I'm good at uh, time travel also without increment, you know? But unfortunately, with increment, I'm getting so nervous that it's just a question of time when maybe I will do 10 good moves, but finally the blunder will come, yeah? That's, uh, th that's my big problem with the, with the increment. Mm. And then strange enough, because I simply played way too many games without the increment. Yeah. So my instincts and everything, my reflexes got developed that, okay, I can play like uh, 50 moves with, with one and a half minute on the clock and they will be good moves. But if you give me this 30 seconds uh, increment, then, then my heart will not, uh, not tolerate this forever. This is, this is all very, very individual. Yeah, Sadvani, I, I already uh, have now the board uh, of Sadvani and I feel like he has done wonderful progress. He's about to win his game. Probably, he has sacrificed yeah. the h7 pawn, but the knight lands on c4 and it's... And then we can even take on h3, yeah, we can, we can even recover the, the, the h pawn. Yeah, even the, because then we get access to the g4 square as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. now, Kicking the king away and after king e2, then taking on hc, then we will have bishop g4 check. Yeah, it's uh, Sadvani is winning. And as I told you, I'm, I'm a big Sadvani fan, so really rooting for him to do well. What what are you checking? You have some news? I'm trying to figure out what's... Yeah, uh, and uh, Hanpi has done something very smart, at least according to the website. Uh, mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out if, if there is something that we're missing in terms of, in terms of action. And Hampi, uh, she played queen of 2, g4, bishop g5, and she just offered a draw here. Oh, wow. Okay. Which I think is the right way to go. I think she realizes that she probably lost some measure of control at least. And it's time to just make sure that no further damage is done and not to, you know, trouble, you know, not to worry your teammates too much. And, I mean, the, the match was in no danger, but still, it, I think it's a good thing to just remove any any need for your teammates to worry. Yeah, and it's also such a position where you might uh, invest a lot of nerves if you if you continue playing this game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, somewhat weirdly, actually, board two is now uh, sort of alive. Uh, I assume she will still win, but this is now. No, no, I think she wins very easily. I mean, the h5, rook g4, king h6, king g5, no? Uh, are you in time? Like king d5? King d5? Well, I hope to be in time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> My uh -huh, point, so I, wanted, I have to I wanted basically. To play rook g4. I, yeah. I wanted to play rook g4, but then rook h2, and we're kind of stuck. Yes. Okay, but, a... but we can just go h5, right? And. I have never seen this position with f7, f6, h5 pawns. No, but this is my point. Like, if the king gets to f3, like, I go king e4, you go check, I go king f3, you go king h6. I just go, I don't know, rook a2, and I'm not even going to defend it low. I will try maybe to trade it for the f7 pawn. Like, 3, you know, 2 f and h against 0. <laughs> what do we know about this endgame? <laughs> Yeah, but I think that this should be probably winning if I can force your king down to, but maybe I will not be in time, right? 
I, at this point, I'm just going to say I have no idea about rook endings. Please don't ask me, and I will just refuse to provide any information. You know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, this is the easiest thing to make some mistake and say some nonsense. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, like I, I honestly have no idea. Um, I mean, but, feeling wise, it should be that black should win, but yeah. but who knows? Yeah. Yeah, but like, look at the position on move like forty-five ish. Uh huh. Okay, for forty-two. I ah, this was the the game. Yeah. Yeah, but like, how how is it that this is what you settle on? Is my question. Like, sure. I, I they... saw that white designed here. Yeah, like knight c two. But I, I I understand she found a way not to resign immediately. But still, I. First of all, like I, I'm keeping the knights on. If if I want to play this endgame, I'm I'm going knight of two check after king d3. I'm going knight of two check, I'm taking on g4, I'm taking on h5, and with the knights on the board, I'm winning very, very comfortably. Yeah, especially with the pawn on f7, the knight on c2 yeah, is like dead, a, yeah. I am I am very, very confused by this. I think it's just so unnecessary to even play this endgame. I understand it looks also completely winning, but I think. Ah, she because now actually Black's king is stuck, yeah? Yeah, because so. yeah, I, th I think she underestimated just how annoying it is that the king never has any moves. And she probably still wins, but I think she could have saved herself like an hour and a half at the board. Yes. B by the way, also, could, sh could she have started with Luke H4 here? Mm, Hang maybe. on. She could have started with Luke H4. And then h5, rook g4, yeah, this probably was very clean, yeah. Rook also, h4. Okay, of course, white will give the check, but still it's... Looking h7, uh, I think I'm in time. Maybe yeah, not. Even, yeah, even the terrible looking move, king f8, looks good enough. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, rook h4, but okay, she will win anyway. Most likely, yeah, most likely she will win anyway. But yeah, she left herself now with a situation where uh, some technique needs to be shown. And... Uh, and white can fight, yeah. At least white yeah, can no, fight. Yeah. White has there's, some hope, yeah. That's, there's uh, definitely some hope here for yeah. for the defending side, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Somebody, okay, uh, I mean, okay, it's not dramatic because it does not really matter. The the match mm -hmm. is won completely, but yeah, of course, yeah, it I, it will give a bitter taste afterwards, yeah. If you mm -hmm. miss like this. Yeah, but this seems to be uh, the the only thing that's still going on the top boards because I'm looking through the results and everything else is completely decided um yeah the, the the last two boards in the ukraine uh turkey match are completely won for completely winning for the the ukrainian team so they will win 3-1 many of the matches are already over or there is like 3-0 up and uh, yeah and this is actually the the game we've been discussing without the video for a while this is the uh Ravia versus uh uh the, the singaporean uh uh, Grandmaster on the black side. Yeah, uh, this is the dramatic game. Yeah. Yeah, deep in deep in thought. Yeah, the very very tough game. But is is there any new twist or the things are settling? Yeah, Queen G seven, Queen D seven was played. Full, full, content, full concentration by Ravi. He, he feels that this is the moment. It, it's a very, very tough game, and now it's mm. the moment to... And we're being told that if we're looking for upsets, the match between Denmark and Zambia might be the thing, but I don't think we have that. Yeah, and also Sotirius is telling us that Zambia, Zambia pr probably is beating, beating Denmark. Uh, once again, we, we, yesterday we had some de definitely had some problems with the lower boards that some, some of the results turned out to be not entirely correct but yeah exactly there was this uh, debate about the swedish team right and, and yeah, then yeah. i saw that they won very comfortably with three and a half half so we, we we're not entirely sure that this is not what's happening today but yeah on like on my screen right now uh uh Biere on board one drew against the 2400 board four uh lost for, for Denmark, there's a draw on board three, and uh, on board two, uh, oh, they're just losing. Like if, if if those are the actual games, they are two one down, and on board three, the Zambian player is playing a four against three rook ending, so which is difficult to lose. Like I, 
there are some recorded instances of people losing four against three, but I don't think he will lose it. Uh, yeah, so. usually you lose it if you over push or something, yeah? No, but it's just a pure three against three on the king side and the eight pawn. Ah, for, okay, okay. Yeah, well, so, but if you walk your with your king to the a pawn and you want to win it at all costs, you yeah, sometimes yeah, it's, and he's done some of that. He's, I mean, he still has all all his king side, but he is some way towards actually giving it up. And we, we'll we'll see what happens. But in general, of course, you you don't really lose those positions. Uh, lose those positions very often. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I mean, okay, so what is Magnus doing actually now that we have time? Oh, yeah, yeah. We... It's a Queen Anne game, but uh, interesting one. Yeah, and the uh, Satirius reminds me that uh, that four against three, I actually, despite claiming that I had known nothing about it, I won it. But I, I, that was, was it an ape on? Maybe it was actually an ape on because the, the, the ones with the ape on, you really aren't supposed to win them at all. The ones with the B pawn you sometimes win, but yeah, I beat I think Vladimir Kopian in one European club cup in like two thousand two, I think. Well, and I, and, and I beat Vichy in with the A pawn in Linares in one of the decisive games when I won the Linares tournament two thousand three. Mm. It it was penalty made run, yeah. It it was because the situation is uh, it was psychological that I came uh, came very well prepared to a Petlov game. I was putting pressure on Vichy, who played wonderfully. I mean, he defended the position, and I didn't see finally in terms of how to pose more problems. And I went for the A pawn that, okay, I will try. And okay, I did not expect to win, but okay, I will try. And then Vichy was so relieved yeah, that, okay, it was a tough game. Uh, now it's automatic routine draw. And he suddenly played a couple of careless moves, and he allowed me to get my pawn to g4 with white. Yeah, this fc g4 h4 structure. He didn't play h5, and all of a sudden, uh, practical problems appeared. And, and he got very nervous, very frustrated, and made a decisive mistake, which uh, after I used. It's, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, any, I, I, anything can happen in these look and games. Yeah, absolutely. And the position on our screen is actually kind of surprising to me because uh, this looks like a very comfortable draw. In fact, I, I'm too lazy to check, but I would suggest that it very easily could be a draw without the pawn on b5. <laughs> and there is still a pawn on b5 on the board, so uh, yeah, looks like Magnus is probably not winning today. But hang on, is there some scenario where maybe thanks to this pawn there won't be any stalemate or that there is no relevance for that? I think... I, I think the likeliest difference between this and not having it is black now can accept queen trades yeah. in very many cases, uh, <laughs> which wouldn't be the case otherwise. Stalemates are a, a topic as well, but I think what is much more likely to happen here is that uh, white will not have access to you know what normally is a threat of trading queens because then white <laughs> loses because the b-pawn just queens very quickly. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's uh, how did we get here? Like, yeah, let I, let's take a look. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of surprised Magnus allowed so many pawn trades so easily. So Georg did something very clever here that he he gave up the pawn on a seven, seemingly without winning anything in return. And I think this is why Magnus was so so excited about it. I guess because you can play King H one here and you have Queen G one. But after queen d2, the pawn on b2 is hanging. Y you cannot protect it. You have to move it. And then after queen c1 check, in order to prevent the perpetual, you have to give up the pawn on a3. And you don't even have a check from e3 here. So black completely stabilizes, and we have fewer pawns on the board. But hang on, slightly surprises me that he did not opt for queen d4, no? Yeah. I'm ah, not but sure. there's some queen c1, queen c7 queen c1, check. Queen c4, ah, okay. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah I of guess. course. Of course, yeah. So that's why queen e1, queen d3. Yeah, but still, and even here, he chose not to kind of shuffle forever and wait until both of them have like five minutes or two minutes or something. He uh, very quickly uh, simplified into what we're watching right now. 
But I guess maybe he didn't have any, like maybe now after queen e4, he no longer has a choice, yeah, because h4 is hanging and you cannot control it properly. And now b4 is hanging, so he has to play h5, and Georg just very happily took on b4. Yeah, I think this is just a comfortable draw now. It's not even a very difficult draw. Yeah, it's it's kind of insane. When I first heard about this, that the, the two pawns on the king side might actually not win. In Queen Endgame, I was discussing this with Zoltan Almashi, and uh, we, we both had this feeling that what? I mean, we would expect the opponent to design out of fairness, yeah, that he got yeah, really exactly. outplayed. Why? Why even check? But yeah. Well, what, what is this that it's it's do? I, I remember that we heard it something like '96. It it was maybe John Nunn who was uh, the the first yeah, five was, years. Yeah, originally published in a in a in a professor book. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and then I was telling to Zoltan and he first thought like, I'm, I'm completely crazy from which planet I'm coming. Okay, resign. Uh, but yeah. And, and then I believe that in many, many games we have seen that people were just holding it easily. Yeah? I don't think I've seen very many and it's still possible to lose them. You know, people lose all kinds of seemingly very simple positions uh, and uh, the, it's not always a draw. Like if you if you cross a certain threshold and you still don't have an immediate perpetual, those become lost. Like if the, if they get to like g five and h five and you still don't have an immediate perpetual, I'm not sure all of those are still a draw. But th the engine very very comfortably never allows this somehow. <laughs> uh, but you I mean, know. I I do recall that Evin Lamy has uh, held one of those end games. I'm I'm pretty sure that what I have in mind because we are even laughing that ah, of course, Professor Evin definitely holds it without any problems. And there was a game that you and Yasser were uh, commenting on on Chessable Masters 2020. I think it was mm. June, and and you even had a talk with him. I was listening your broadcast. And and Yasser was also completely shocked, like, okay, what is this? It's a draw. It it was very nice to hear all this. Yeah. I mean, obviously Magnus will continue pushing, but yeah, I, I think as long as uh, as long as Georg doesn't lose his uh, doesn't lose his cool here, he should hold very, very comfortably. I think you just play something like you kind of want to make sure you don't blunder the pawn on B5. But yeah, exactly. I, this is the move I wanted to make. It's a bit scary to make a move without a check, which leaves the pawn on b5 unprotected, but white cannot connect to it without access to the e-file. So like queen f7, we can even go king h6. And then if white has to play g4, we, we have checks from, from below now, queen h1, queen uh, exactly. queen h1, and so forth. Um, give me just one minute, I want to try to fix the the lighting situation. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. I, I will I will say that, well, yeah, usually I'm, I'm a guy who worries about all kinds of things but uh, i perfectly agree that yeah this this queen e4 is a very nice stabilizer and i can't really expect uh, magnus to really pose any problems and and he goes g4 so what does it mean that he's willing to to no that's that's basically a draw offer no g4 queen h1 check yes uh, and okay, queen g1 I'm, check I'm, I'm trying to understand what magnus has in mind I think he's just, he, he knows it's a draw, so he basically is offering a draw because unless, no, 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 like king h2, sorry, king h4, we go queen h2, uh, king, g5. king g5, queen g2, king f5, queen yeah. f2. My question is after queen f2, king e6, can I take on the f6 or not? Yeah, but actually you even have queen e2 check, right? King f7. Then queen takes g4. Queen g6. Check. Ah, queen g6. Yeah, that's that's what I should not. Yeah, I mean this was this was the line that I was calculating. That yeah, what 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 is this? G5, b3, g6, maybe even king of no. Yeah, g6, king g8. It's a draw because we control g6, right? No, no, we still get mated. No, we still, do we? No, no, this is kind of scary business. It's no? a draw, right? B2, h7. King h8, king f7, b1. Yes. Because you yes, don't have queen g6 mate. It's it's incredibly, this is a draw, I think, right? Because the only mating square is g6 and we're controlling it. Yeah, but I mean, it's not so comfortable if you have to calculate no. all this till the end, yeah. No, 
No, it's not. It's not comfortable at all. I mean, it would be so nice to say that you know, Queen E4. If you play G4, it just that no Queen H1. But I mean, we, we, we might be forced to calculate. But I think we haven't blundered anything. Uh, let me check before G5. Before G5, I can even start with King G8, G6, B3, H6, B2. It's just a draw, yeah. It's it's the same position, yeah. It's just a draw. But you you have to. Luckily for Georg, he has eight minutes, and yes. it's a very, very direct line. There is like there are no branches. You just calculate this one straight line, which always happens. So you can actually take like five out of your seven minutes and calculate it out. Um, but there is also a question that if if he doesn't want to, can he just give some cream? But okay, sooner or later he will have to change him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he can, can, he, can he give these checks, you know, from distance? Yeah, probably also a draw. Yeah, like you go queen a to check here and you continue checking and checking from the A file. Yeah. That's but actually but a very... I perfectly agree with you. I mean, I would also love to, you know, calculate no matter how far, but if, if I can get rid of the queens and make sure that uh, it's guaranteed that I'm, I'm correct, then I would just prefer to trade. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just from a practical side, like if, if you know that the, this is the last calculation you will have to make in this game, you just you just go for it. You you, you check everything and you make a draw here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're not missing anything because after all, it's very difficult to miss something. It's a very, very straightforward line. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget we didn't have uh, any breaks, so we, we can easily miss and blunder what, whatever. <laughs> For sure, yeah. But yes, still, but it seems still, correct, yeah. So direct, yeah, that uh, it's, it's hard to imagine exactly what we should be missing here. I don't think I've seen this particular draw before, honestly, where, because normally, like, if you allow the queen to promote this check like this with the, with the opposing king on the side, you get mated somehow. But specifically, this situation with the queen on b1 controlling the, the g6 square, I don't think I've seen this construction before. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, absolutely. So Magnus is now praying to, to show that he, he needs to disbalance yeah, and, and Georg, he, yeah, somehow psychologically. He's, yeah, he's doing the right thing. He also like got up from the board and just left very confidently, like leaving, leaving Georg with this position to, to stew and to, to worry. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, you can still definitely like I'm pretty sure something like b5 before is still a draw here. To be, by the way, I, I don't think this is the only way to make a draw in this position. You can probably just push the b pawn and be quite okay. I don't see why this should lose g5. I can go queen h1 check and then yes, queen exactly. b1 check and then take on h5 or something. Like, I don't think I'm losing, but I would like to just end the game now. This is this is <laughs> both of our points, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's just better to just end the game now without having to having to continue calculating. Yeah, but afterwards there is also the other scenario that suddenly out of tiredness or some some blindness, you you blunder something. Yeah, actually B five B four on the board. By the and way, then you will think that it that why on earth did I want to calculate when I had no reason to yeah. calculate? Wesley took a draw seemingly. Yeah, that that's what I'm also seeing now. Wesley took a draw with, I mean, he, he is making sure the team is winning. So, I mean, and he doesn't really, it's actually a very nice mindset. If you, if you don't have to care about rating, a lot, a lot of things in life become much easier, actually. If you, if you can just completely ignore the, the need to collect every, every five rating points on offer and you can just, you know, make, you know, take draws, which just win, win your team the match and, and go have dinner. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's absolutely correct. And uh, if if you play a team event and especially the Olympiad, then then you should forget about your rating. It's, yeah, it's yeah. basically all about supporting your team. Yeah, making making the right decisions. And actually, I I've, I've completely forgotten. He that was the they were only winning by one point. Yes, so exactly. If, yeah. If he blunders something and loses, they don't win the match. Then yeah, I mean it's just the right decision here. <clears throat> It's just sort of strictly the right decision. The position doesn't look clean enough for you to, uh, you know, un unless you find a very direct win somewhere, you just pack it up and make sure that the team has won. Exactly. Yeah. An update because we, we actually owe mm -hmm. you guys uh, the update that Eddie Gaishi managed to make a comfortable draw after the time control. 
I think this is very, very important for him psychologically. Yes. Yeah, that mm -hmm. uh, okay, he had a tough game, but he managed to hold. Things are under control, and and Shashi is slowly, I guess, converting. Yeah, it looks like it everything. Yeah, is. looks like his he will win. Yeah. Yeah, everything according to plans. The C pawn is not running, and the B pawn is about to cost Black a full rook or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for example, C2 is simply met by B7. The rook rook D8, the yeah, Rook D8, D8 even rook, rook, rook C8 is just winning on the spot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right. So it finally becomes a very, very comfortable win, as it seems, mm -hmm. for, the, for the Indian team. Well, one, one thing I also want to mention from my experience that there were many Olympiads that suddenly some teams started like 4-0, 4-0 after, after two two matches and people got very excited that wow this team is on fire and whatsoever i would be very very careful judging by these things yeah that uh, one should not carry the way all this losing some uh, board points and like this they they don't matter so much it's it's really winning the matches yeah. uh, the, the the match points and afterwards there, there is no guarantee i mean you you shouldn't be euphoric that you are winning all games then it will forever be so easy no no Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. also, I saw just now that Chess24 Twitter account tweeted out that uh, after today's win, Gukesh is back over 2700, which is a kind of an additional subplot. We haven't been paying much attention to uh, just yet, but obviously kind of important uh, for him and a lot of uh, historical records being, uh, being challenged there with, with his climb. And once again, I haven't been doing this enough. I want to remind our viewers that there's currently a very nice promo going on with uh, a 50% discount available if you want to become premium on Chess24, get access to all kinds of uh, very nice content uh, with the code Olympia2022. And there's also some uh, uh, free uh, uh, lessons available uh, at chess24.com uh, slash free and uh, chess24.com slash wall is our new uh, a social media uh, project which uh, we're also inviting you to uh, take a look at plenty of stuff uh, on the website and yeah with the bottom before seemed, oh, hang on a second he did give those two checks right yeah he gave those yeah exactly it, because I, you said you said before is on the board yeah right? because suddenly you know it was like b5 b4 appeared on the board but in fact i put it there yeah so big <laughs> apologies yeah no he he goes for this line yeah, Magnus. Uh, now he he also. I think for Magnus, he kind of needs to make sure King of Four is not losing as well, right? Because you, like <laughs> if you if you play King of Four and somehow the B pawn actually queens and your pawns don't, you 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 feel incredibly stupid. But yeah, it it, it doesn't lose. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Okay, I mean, it will be an incredible save by, by Georg, but he, to be honest, he caused his uh, trouble to himself. Yeah, he, he was absolutely fine, comfortable, no reason to, to, to have those scary moments, but he survived them and seems to, seems to be safe. Yeah, Norway, Norway is still winning very comfortably because, uh, as we mentioned, Arian Tari won this, not the cleanest game he's ever played in his life, but the result matters and he won. Uh, in the end, quite quite easily, and uh, uh, also uh, Johann Sebastian after his a, a bit of a horror show yesterday, he uh, he won a fighting game today. Uh, Jan Ludwig might not win; uh, that game is still ongoing. It doesn't look like he's winning, but uh, it doesn't really matter all that much. Yeah, and he might, you know, in the end, when they go very very low on time, he might actually find some kind of a trick. But it doesn't look like it's very much for White anymore. Seems actually like a comfortable, comfortable position for for Black with the active pieces and everything. Yeah, very active pieces. The the look on D one. I, I mean, it felt like in the middle game or something that White had much much bigger advantage. Now mm -hmm. I, maybe maybe White does not even have an advantage at all. Yeah. Yeah, but okay, it's it's not not even important. Yeah, Spanish team has also one comfort. Yeah, the, the Grunfeld the Grunfeld ended up being a draw though. The, the yeah, one the only was. the only game that ended up in a draw in in this match. It's yeah. it's maybe a little heartache for you, no? Because not 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 that much, but yeah, I always like to see Grunfeld do uh, do very well, but it's. It's not life and death. I mean, the opening did very well. Yeah, Black was yeah, in total okay. control. Yeah. yeah, my my idea definitely survived today, but uh, uh, 
the, the game was not was not won in the end. But it's not it's not that important. Yeah, and and Vladek is still playing, but okay. I mean, he is already about yeah. to just finish his game. Very nice technique. Yeah, now he's two pawns up, and I think his opponent actually resigned. Yes, uh, somewhere yes, that's around it, here yeah. because yeah, the h five pawn is also dying, and and then there is not much to play to play for. Yeah, there's really not very much still going, uh, as far as I can tell. Like there are two boards still going on in the Norway uh, match, but we've discussed those. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the question. Yeah, well, is... what about Croatia then? The, yeah, we can check it out. What about Croatia? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we've been we've not been there for a bit, but. Yeah, well, this yeah, we is in a draw. Yeah, Sharish didn't win, so they, they are already definitely losing the match. And the question is, well, Berkic might also lose. Yeah, it just looks like. Why wasn't Rook takes G7 just winning on the spot? Queen of 5, Rook of 1, I guess. Yeah, okay. But Queen of 6 yeah. is a clever move because it stops all of those checks and uh, allows White some time to, to consolidate. I still don't... Like, it, it doesn't seem very obvious. Like, Bishop of 8 and White still needs to find a good move, but... White is an exchange up and seemingly now in in decent control over the board. So, yeah, and also if the clocks are correct, then Brigic is done to his. Yeah, last seems like second. it's correct, right? Because it now it now says thirty four. So he was he made that move on on two seconds or something like yeah. that. Yeah, but okay, there is already even no intrigue here, yeah, because yeah, if, even if a dramatic turnaround happens in this game, which is very unlikely, it's also not enough. And what about uh, what about yeah, our yeah Syria. Yeah, yeah Surya, Surya, make exactly. a, Surya makes a draw very comfortably now. Just yeah, just he survives. Quickly. And what about Setu? Setu is also probably surviving. It's still unpleasant, but probably survivable. Yeah, there should be there should be a way to make a clean draw here somehow. The pawn on g five. I, I think you don't even lose if you if you lose the pawn on g five. That three against two, I suspect, is probably a draw. But you don't want to play it. You want to be. You want to make a draw somehow, uh, which is a cleaner, cleaner draw than that. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel like computers are seeing like zero zeros in positions where humanly I still don't understand that why it is zero zero. I mean, it, it looks like it's a scary position. There, looks C4 is played. Oh, no, you, you, we're in time, right? Because... Wow, yes, exactly. Yeah, thanks to this, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, for me. The thing I missed originally was that we can play rook c1, rook cg1. I thought black plays like king b5, king b5 or king b6 right now. Yeah, so, sorry, just I show this. Yeah, yeah this is the more important one. The one you're showing is the the, the, the very, very important one. Because yeah, otherwise... Thank, thanks to this trick, yeah. And, and Setu, of course, immediately spots this. And otherwise, the line that you mentioned was that after king b5, now you have rook c1 back, I, right? It just, clean, it just clean fell out of my field of vision for a bit that we have the rook c1, rook g1, and we're just not worse now because, like, why would we, why would we be worse with, a, with, with equal material here? <clears throat> so, India 2 will, in, in the end, I guess, win their match due to the victory on board 4. Uh, yeah, and, and one interesting question. I'm very, very interested about your opinion here. Board 3. What do you think? Who is playing for a win? <laughs> what <laughs> yeah, is I'm your sure. take? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. Okay, it's going to be a draw. Yeah, de de definitely. It's yeah, I mean, and we know how this ends. Yeah, but exactly who and why is playing here. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm guessing Gupta is playing because he is a stronger player and maybe he feels that, you know, something goes dramatically bad for White and they lose both the B and the A pawn. And then actually, as we all know, like those positions get lost very often. But imagining how you lose both of those pawns in this particular setup is quite difficult. Like you you have to work really, really hard to lose both the A5 and the B4 pawn here. Yeah, I mean, okay, though is very, very likely. I mean, Ibarra is, uh, Ibarra is doing something interesting. Probably it will not be enough, but look at this. He actually played mm -hmm. very clever. He, he played the move rook d7, rook c1, rook d5, so he doesn't want to, I mean, he wants to target the pawn on g5 and force white's rooks to total passivity. And now he breaks with a4, of course, white should never accept this pawn because then black no. will have two connected pass pawns, so white is just waiting. And then, okay, you you kind of maybe take, then you try to advance your yeah, yeah. It's a... Uh... You can still be quite annoying here as black. Yeah. I think you can still create a lot of, uh, a lot of little questions and... But he is doing it like if he also had more time on the clock, then you would really be maybe facing some trouble with white. But 
He's doing this with a minute against 10 against a very, very experienced player. So I, I assume he doesn't actually win. But he's doing absolutely the right thing, considering that they're only minus one in the match. And if he, if he manages somehow to win this, they, they draw they draw the match most likely because and also this i'm loving that not automatically includes ab he wants to keep the tension yeah mm -hmm. it's very very important if you try to win keep as much tension in the position as possible who knows maybe you can somewhere combine the king maneuver and force white to make some concession and whatever it it's uh, it's it's very nicely played by ibarra yeah magus actually found a way not to allow the queen trade wow was it possible yeah really apparently yeah Mm-hmm. Or or simply that uh, Georg then did no, not. No, no, he played King G3, Queen F2, and then the king is in the is in the uh, is in the corner, right? You you just ah, catch but hang the... ah, because he he gave not Queen H1 check. I mean, ah, queen yeah, H1... yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, that's the thing. Yeah, he chose not to even. Yeah, Queen H1 was an immediate draw because that's not an option. You you no longer have that option. But he gave a check from here, and that gave Magnus this choice of playing. Uh, yeah, queen and queen just to king. highlight that, yeah, this case yeah, the, that would be, the that would be a mistake. Time. Yeah, that would be a bit of a mistake. Yes, he is still completely fine because with the queen on c three, he can actually even allow h five h six. Like if 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 white gives a check from e seven and goes like h six, you don't even need to give checks. You can play b three, b two, and so on. Uh, so he's still probably just making a very comfortable draw here, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but a bit scary with three minutes a little bit, on the yeah. clock. I, I would I would I keep on saying this, but yeah, I would really like this game to be over if I were defending it with black. I don't like this idea of you know postponing the enjoy the like prolonging the enjoyment here. I don't think there's much enjoyment going on. Yeah, queen e seven check. So king g eight, just to highlight that king h six, the active move runs into checkmate yeah. with g five. That would be terrible. So of course, yeah, black goes back with the king to g8. I'm yeah, guessing you choose you choose any square. I think both of them are fine. Yeah, it's a matter of taste which one which one you prefer. Shouldn't matter. And then okay, so for example, let's make some moves. So king h8. If white advances with h6, then how you continue? Just b3. Yeah. Just there's b3. No, there's yeah. no threat, and there's no way really to develop a threat. I think right. Okay, so I'm playing king h5. Uh, b2. I mean, at least I want to pretend to threaten something, but you are like a rock, yeah? You just don't care. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sort of trusting my eyes that they aren't really, like, with a king on h8 and a, king, and a queen on c3, I don't see any way to get mated, so I'm just... Wow, but look at this. Georg even goes king h8. Yeah? yeah, yeah, also completely fine. Yeah, also yeah, yeah. You were saying that. I mean, I'm the one who everywhere sees some problems. Yeah, <laughs> but but yeah, there is just no need to panic. Yeah, just continue playing calmly and, and make your draw. Yeah, should should be fine. And what else do we have? Some more important game, or, or more or less that's it. Yeah. Magnus's game and and you called it because Peter you called it that this is gonna be the longest uh... yeah it looks like this will be the one that ends the broadcast yeah as as I as I suspected yeah Sh Shashi actually is now forcing his opponent to resign pretty much yeah, yeah. pretty much it's Threatening. about time. okay a check so okay time. India is comfortable Yeah. Okay. So basically, all eyes on uh, Magnus, and there is the there is the Setu's game, Setu versus Ibarra. Yeah. The, the two big games. And there's really not no. Yeah. Look, uh, the uh, the rook ending in the uh, Vaishali game in 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 the women's tournament. She is now playing a pure F and H, uh, which. Um, the the bar seems to suggest that this particular F and H is lost for some reason, but yeah, once again, I have no idea. Yeah, and in in a practical play, because one thing I know that if Black forces White's king to to the backline, then it's lost automatically. Yeah, that's uh, th that's absolutely clear. But okay, usually so... with the king on the second, you always have hopes, no? Yeah. So you were like, uh, I I kind of 
cheated and looked at the website and after f4 she played rook h7 which basically makes uh, makes a drawn position into a loss uh and uh now after f3 uh uh king f2 i assume and now h3 this is winning because you don't have checks from uh you you don't have checks from uh the side and i, I still don't quite understand what the threat is but i guess you just run out of squares right you play yeah okay we have to wait yeah we look yeah at i g. guess i go rook g7 here i force you to the sixth rank right rook h6 and i go like ah and then you move your rook and then king h5 and the, the something like this. something like that but i'm still struggling to figure out exactly how this is winning to be honest yeah like, usually seven, you need a table base here yeah yeah I, I, I can see on my screen that this is winning, but I, I'm still kind of struggling to, but it is, yeah, it is like that. Yeah, you, uh, you, it's even cleaner actually to do it from the, from the back rank, but rook g7 is also winning. But yeah, this is, this is the idea. Mm -hmm. And now you go king h5 and then you go h2. Yes. Okay. I can still fight with rook h, ah, h2 anyway. Yeah, that's you it. You go yeah? h2 anyway and that, that yes. pawn ending is winning. Yeah. This is the yes. point. Yeah. Rook h8, king g4, and then, uh. I just trade rooks and go king of four, and this is winning. Wow, in fact, a very, very instructive and very important endgame to know. Yeah, but instead of rook h7, move 70. If she goes to any square on the side, this is, this is a draw now. So rook h7 was specifically the move that was losing the game. and it Yeah, but not... of course, black uh, did not use it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a it, practical it not, game. It did not get punished. And now uh, this is back to being, you know, quote unquote, a very simple F and H draw. But like very simple. I'm using huge, huge air quotes because nothing is simple or on like when you've been playing for six hours and uh, you have to hold these end games. Exactly. The game is only beginning now. Sort of, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, okay. Very, very interesting. At the same time, both players will learn big, big deal, yeah? Because not after the game... They if they choose... It, yeah, yeah. Not while playing, but if, if after the game is over, they actually go back and they choose to, like, go through it and figure out what the mistakes were and why they were mistakes and how they could have gotten punished for it, then there's plenty of, you know, potential teaching material here. But... And in Why fact, it's my, I think it's very important to have the personal experience because otherwise, if you are just looking up in books, yeah, there are millions of positions. They explain yeah, yeah. you that, ah, this is draw, and then there is a long line. Ah, of course, this is draw. That, that is lost. I mean, it's uh, once you have this personal touch, your personal experience, and then you understand why things uh, exactly. were really going bad for you or, or why you survived, the, those memories really stay uh, forever, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. for instance, one, now mean, uh, asking after, some after questions. Okay, one, yeah, there is there is more than one way to, way to make a draw, but like the, the, the cleanest once again, you need to be able to give checks from the side. So you just go rook b7 here. And you start at least threatening to give checks, and this is completely fine. But yeah, you, you get the feeling that in a game where uh Vaishali is clearly the sort of the I mean she's very young, but she's sort of more experienced and the stronger player of the two, I would assume, judging by the difference in rating. I think she probably ends up winning because eventually, because like if she makes a mistake, the game just continues. And if white some, somewhere makes a fatal mistake and it gets exploited, the game just ends on the spot. So I think she probably still ends up winning. But uh, as I mentioned, the game should have been over two hours ago, pretty much. So all of this was completely unnecessary. Yeah, you, you know, there was this 2014 Russian league. Yeah, I was I was playing there for Malahit. It was the, the year when I played for Malahit. And in the very first two games, I managed to win two very long look and games. One against Florianov, exactly this F and H pawns. Mm -hmm. and, and against Dubov, two versus one, but a very special one that his king was cut on the eighth rank. And I had B, C, C, I mean B and C pawn against A pawn. Very tricky. And mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, they were telling me, wow, you are such a monster. I said, no, 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 no. I was on the ro right side of the situation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Yeah. Because they were immediately saying, ah, of course, you see, you can learn from Leiko the end games. Well, <laughs> if, if I would be pawned down, I don't think that my, 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 my play would be so instructive. 
yeah it's it's important to actually yeah, be the the happier side in this in these types of positions that that is very true so while we're waiting for moves here has anything yeah magnus is still kind of pushing but yeah i'm i'm trying to figure out like can't i just play yeah you can do whatever you like there yeah, Magnus continues in my spirit. Yeah, h6, yeah, yeah. h5, put the poker face on like I'm threatening something. Yeah, I mean, okay, signal, and then the Georg is down to a minute. Yeah, uh, do we maybe have the the video? For? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, we could maybe actually just, yeah, Georg goes b2, and yeah, I think Magnus kind of has to pull the plug now because if you, like, if you make a quiet move here and the b pawn wins, you know, you, you really feel tremendously stupid. Yeah. No, of course, okay, Magnus can maybe try to get his queen to b7 with check, yeah, the, so that he, but how do you get there, yeah, that's also, a uh, queen e4 check, yeah, there. there you go. Yeah. Okay, queen e4, and now, can he play g5 after king h8 without allowing the, the, the pawn to queen? He probably can, actually, yeah. But then, you, ah, this is kind of beautiful, yeah, if king h8, if you play g5, there is a very cute immediate draw. I can play b2, b1 here, or queen h3. Queen h3 is cleaner first, yeah, to make sure I don't have to calculate queen e8 check, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or this, yeah. Like queen h3, queen g6, king g6, I go b1 here. Queen b1, queen a6. And uh, very happily, we finally call it quits here. Yeah. From from a distance, I felt like you're gonna mention that queen g6, but then we can no, take with the king, right? Yeah, that would be that would be unnecessary. Yeah, yes. would be. No, but you, you remember I saved against Chucky in this uh, ultra marathon blitz game in time memory and 260 moves with queen f7 stalemate, uh, the the queen against rook and and bishop. Hang on a second, king h8, king h8, white can play king g6 here, and you ha and you have to give up the pawn. <laughs> Oh dear! Oh my God! Yeah, King G6. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! And uh, apparently, apparently, King G8 was completely drawn, but King H8 now. Magnus will play King G6, and I and mean, hang on, what what is the big difference? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, hang on, that is is the Queen G7 check and stalemate uh, the idea if it King <gasps> G8, oh right? My, oh my God! Show it, you, we have to show it to the viewers, right? Yes, I mean, let me get this. This yeah, that's is if, so cute. Yeah, if the king goes back to g8, then after king g6, we have this this kind of stalemate idea. Queen g7 takes, and then b1 queen. And if queen f5, we make We it play queen e4, or, or what? Yeah, we just... Yeah, we, we can continue. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cute. Wow. Oh. Yeah, and then Magnus goes King G6. Yeah, that, yeah that's B1. exactly the reason why we we're saying like, okay, just calculate the force line till the end. Just don't give all these practical chances. Yeah, and we, I think judging by the evaluation, B1 is still a draw. Uh, because it says like 160, and I think 160 in this position is not enough. But I think this one Magnus actually probably wins because... Now he can play forever and Georg is on 20 seconds and there is no forced draw because as far as I can tell, there is no perpetual, at least no immediate perpetual. It's just still a draw because as we know, G and H just doesn't win against, against the king on H8 with precise computer play. But yeah, I mean, try showing precise computer play on 20 seconds against the world champion. Exactly. No, this is... No, this I... is of course incredible and it shows yeah that the, the computer evaluation shows you that king h8 is a mistake but yeah why king g8 with this queen g7 stalemate ideas is is a draw what no no he yeah, obviously he played queen c6 check yeah like queen c6 this, uh, check yeah exactly yeah, it's uh, it's clearly uh, i will even correct it i will put it there i guess we'll just watch it full screen because we, we're not going to be we're not going to be uh, able to analyze it properly so if we can just full screen the full screen the board it would be good yeah, that's nice. Yeah, so queen, queen c6 check. And yeah, the machine still holds it, shockingly, but uh, I don't think you're favored to, to actually do it over the board anymore. Yeah, very, very scary. I mean, mm. absolutely scary. And uh, in the meantime, it looks like Hammer is maybe winning suddenly because his opponent blundered one of his pawns, but we, we shouldn't switch. It's just... Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm, yeah. I'm providing kind of uh, a, a ticker with the breaking news in that match. So 
Norway might actually in the end win 4-0 instead of 3-1, which would be quite a, quite a big turnaround. So actually now, how could this game continue? So your feeling would be King G5 or King H5? Yeah, and then we, we go like Queen E8 check and uh, if the King goes further, we can maybe even play like the machine. The, the funny thing, instead of Queen C6, the machine was also saying Queen C3, E5 without giving a check is still a draw. <laughs> <laughs> no human can even ever yeah, think like about a, it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a position which just kind of makes you, makes you laugh hysterically all the time because like, it just doesn't feel, doesn't feel right that you should be able to hold this, in particular with the pawns so far progressed. But yeah, apparently still a reasonably comfortable draw if you play it properly. But yeah, he's, he's going to have to play an increment for the rest of the game against somebody on 13 minutes, which is also incredibly annoying because Magnus, one of the most powerful weapons I think Magnus has right now is just randomly thinking for three minutes in, in some position and just make your opponent wait because there is no way you can calculate everything out. Like in some positions, it's a mistake to give your opponent like three minutes to calculate for free. But here there is no way you can calculate all the perpetuals properly. So what this does is just make you sit there kind of hating life and waiting for something to finally happen. And it just makes you more and more nervous and makes you less and less sure about what's going on. <clears throat> Yeah, and Magnus also for King G5. Yeah, this is what I said, mm -hmm. that maybe even you don't want to give this Queen A check possibility. Yeah. And and yeah, let, let's not forget that Georg is now in a state of shock. It was not planned that he has to give up the B pawn. He, he wanted Absolutely to use, not, no. Yeah, he wanted to use that pawn to guarantee I, the Also, also incredibly cute variation here, because the machine goes Queen D5 check. This one we can maybe show on the screen. Queen D5, Queen F5, Queen D8. It looks like it's an immediate blunder because Queen F6 check. And then we have King H7. <laughs> wow. Which is, uh, once again, like, how easy is this? And he's already not chosen this square, which means that after Queen F5, he can no longer give a check from this diagonal. Like, he, he, he gave a check from C5, and now Queen E7 actually does lose because there will be no stalemates. Um, and I'm not sure if this is a draw anymore. Might still be a draw, though. You go Queen E3, and then you go Queen E8 check. Yeah, um, Queen is the yeah, check apparently like, computer hates it. Yeah, apparently this is now gone for some reason. Yeah, I don't know why. I give up. So yeah, just Queen 14 now for some reason. Yeah, Queen of four, uh, Queen C5, and you just go King G6 and uh, the checks actually run out. So he had to see, he actually had to see the, the queen d5, d8, king h7 trick. Yeah, it, it was basically impossible because as we, as we yeah. said, he was in a state of shock, yeah. Yeah, this is just over now because queen c2, queen f5 and you run out of checks and you have to yeah. allow queen f6 check and you resign. Yeah, and, and you can see on the body language of Magnus, yeah, he's very pleased and Gauk designs. Wow. Yeah, very, very, very dramatic finish to this game because Georg defended really, really well. But as we were, like, after, after Magnus played G2, G4, we kept on saying that you really should try to invest the time in making sure that this is the last calculation you do in the game. And he had, an ob he had a very, very clean force draw at that moment. He chose not to even uh, look for it and uh, uh, ended up, it ended up costing him, costing him the game. Yeah, exactly. Because, okay, for example, this stalemate at the end or also with 30 seconds on the clock, discovering that if you go king, no, not here, in, yeah. in the other position, here, yes, that, that if you would have gone king e g8, then after, against king g6, you have this incredible stalemate idea. It's, it's already, okay, if you have 10 minutes on the clock, it's, it's very easy. With, with all this tension, it's very tough. Yeah, none, none of this, none of this is obvious at all. And uh, yeah, this is this is the problem about uh, with with defending positions like this against somebody like Magnus, who is going to ask you as many as many pertinent questions as uh, as there are uh, to ask. That uh, if you if you 
at the right moment if you uh, don't make the required calculations you, you eventually uh, the problems pile on and time gets shorter and shorter and you see what happens then yeah and let's just show this last escape yeah this this was quite incredible that after king yeah. g5 queen d5 check queen d5 is still a draw yeah because yeah, queen f5 queen d8 yeah queen d8 check i mean no but yeah very very difficult with fuse because it's so counterintuitive yeah your your brain just eliminates this this move at all because okay you can't do that because of this and yes you can yeah and if and if white doesn't play queen f6 if you play king h5 this is basically the position he was trying to get but in the game he wasn't allowed to now we go queen e8 and we have those like king king h1 queen e1 sorry king king h4 queen e1 and if, if if the king goes back to g5 i think it's important to once again give a check from uh d8 because queen e3 actually goes as gets us back to the game queen e3 is what he played in the game and that loses Exactly. So basically, I'm, I'm beginning to think that if you don't see specifically this mechanism of queen d8 and king h7, there will be a number of positions where this will be the only way to make a draw. This is what I'm, this is the conclusion I'm coming to, that basically, maybe not once, but a few times in a row over the course of this variation, you will have to see that this exists or you resign. And on 20 seconds, it's not fun <laughs> to find yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's really not fun to find it. Yeah, I'm unbelievable. Of course, you are very, very happy and, and proud if you save a game like this. But, uh, and, and rightly so, but with few seconds on the clock, it's just impossible. Yeah, it's uh, not, not very realistic to, to actually spot this. So Norway probably ends up winning 4-0 after this, yeah, because Magnus won and uh, Jan Ludwig is also... I guess just completely winning now. Yeah, now he's the knight just will, the knight will escape, and uh, he is just two healthy pawns up now, and I, I don't see how this isn't just completely winning. Yeah, this is completely winning, and th this brings us to two more games. Yeah, that were this Ibarra game against Setulaman. How did yeah. that game end? Mm, ah, mm. and Hari Ravi won. Actually, Hari Ravi won. Yeah. And David Hauer won as well. Wow. I mean, okay, finally, it looks like a smooth victory, but we know that it was everything than, than smooth. Yeah. It was very but, hard. Yeah, to... but, but uh, in the end, yeah, they win 3-1 uh, there with uh, uh, two draws on the, on the blackboards and uh, both of the white games uh, won by uh, the, the British players. Mm. Yeah, let me, let me find this set to the man's game. Ah, wow. I mean, what is this? Yeah, look, take g5. Okay, now it's, now it's a draw. So we came at yeah, the right a, moment. Yeah, not very, not very difficult anymore. And uh, yeah, India, okay. India will, will in the end uh, prevail, yeah, with... Yeah, but it just shows, yeah, how tough the competition is. Yeah, Mexico mm -hmm. pulling up an incredible fight. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so and, and Brukic see... lost as well. Brukic lost as well. So it's a total disaster. Whoa. I, he must have missed something there, yeah, like... Yeah, actually, quite a nice... Ah, Rook H3, Rook H3 is a very... Ah, it, it actually kind of wins by force. We, we left it on move 47 after Bishop F8, and uh, Stoyana found this very, very nice tactic, Rook H3, because the Queen cannot go to some kind of a normal square, because Rook H6 and Queen G8 will be just mate in two. So Black had to play Rook H4, which is already very sad, because uh, obviously you don't want to be trading pieces. But it even loses by force, I guess, because rook f1 attacks the bishop, and now we take on h4, we give a check from c8, and we just pick up a full bishop for not very much. Exactly. So this is then also so just, lost. Yeah. It's a complete disaster today for Croatia, who ends up losing three and a half half in a in a match where she uh, where they were basically much much favored. Uh, yes, on exactly. Paper. And, and this brings us to the last game that we have been following, yeah, and it's still in progress, yeah. the, the game of Vaisali. But I guess we don't, like, it might, it might go on for... Uh, this for might go on forever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is supposed to be a draw, right? This is a very, very classical FNH now, where the only way to continue playing for a win is to actually give up the pawn on h3, get the king to f2, play f2, f3, sorry, f4, f3, and then if white knows what they're doing it should be a draw but it's not always the case obviously 
Uh, yeah, you and know, in, you, in the practical game, I mean, yeah, anything can happen, yeah. Yeah, even very strong players have lost that endgame. It's a kind of a famous endgame for the amount of, uh, you know, casualties it has claimed over the years. I think Magnus lost it to Levon once in Moscow. And uh, I think it kind of made enough of an impression on Magnus that he, since then, he only wins those positions. He never, like, he draws them if he has to draw them and he wins them if he is the side pushing. Ah yeah, uh, but that game was with the e pawn. Yeah, it was the it, it was the e pawn in the time yeah, of two thousand six. Yeah, because <laughs> Levon made this last trick with rook d six. So yeah, what and, was uh, it? Yeah, something like that. In, in, in yes, Mangos, yeah, something Mangos. like that. Yeah. I actually recall that Kramnik beat uh, Aronian in Vikanze playing on forever, and it, there were no increments. That was F and H, right? I think that yeah, was an F and H. Yeah. yeah, and and he just went on, you know, playing more than hundred moves. That's that's what you do. And uh, he finally managed to to confuse Levon. Yeah, people people lose this these types of positions uh, all the time. But yeah, it, it could go on for, for for quite a bit. So I think we can probably be excused if we don't follow it to its uh, to its conclusion. Especially uh, because the match is anyway won already completely. Yeah, there is yeah? there is no there is no intrigue. Yeah, India India has won has won the match very convincingly. So uh, this probably uh, is uh, uh, the end for today. Once again, I encourage you to check out all the goodies on the Chess24 website. Uh, there is currently a 50% uh, discount on uh, ongoing premium on, uh, premium on Chess24, which gives you access to a lot of very, very interesting teaching materials and, uh, and videos and, and all kinds of things with the uh, uh, promotion code uh, Olympia2022 and there is also uh, just 24.com slash free before some uh, uh, nice uh, lessons and our new social media type project uh, chess24.com slash wall. So do check all of those things out if you have time and uh, we'll be uh, no, wait, party. hang on, hang on, no, not, not, not say farewell yet, because maybe Black is just about to win. Rook A1, right? Yes. Rook A1, and the game is kind of, oh, but why is it over? Well, I mean, then, then we will have H2, right? Uh, but not immediately, because if you, if you do it immediately, I can take, right? I guess we go, you know what? No, I, I think now the, the game will be about to yeah, we finish can, yeah, pretty I soon. Mean, after this, we can maybe stay uh, stick around for a bit. Yeah. Yes. No, so. because it's clear that White should have played King H2, yeah? It's uh, yeah. because the F pawn is nothing to worry about. You just go yeah, King it's H2. A, it's a very, and... very weird decision not to play King H2 here, yeah. Yeah. Because the H3 pawn is anyway falling, as, as already Peter explained, that why Black will anyway give up the H pawn, then you will need your look on, on far away. Start checking from the side, and and it's an elemental draw. But after King F2, now all kinds of things. Now, of course, Black has to calculate precisely, but uh, it feels that it should be winning. Yeah, I'm I'm still confused. Like even even seeing on my screen that this is a huge mistake, I am. We're being told that Rook A6 is winning here. Uh, and, ah, wow, yes, and then you and, protect... And, and, also, and also somehow Rook A2 check, but Rook A2 check, I, you know, I, I feel like I should be able to just calculate to the end, but... Like, why is this winning? I feel so stupid every time I have to discuss these, these end games because, like, this should be now a very manageable calculation task. Well, but maybe just because you can still return, right? Maybe, yeah. Maybe that, or you can still give Rook A3 check and then return. Sometimes this happened with us uh, when I played against Hikaru in, in London 2012 mm -hmm. in, the, in the Grand Prix. And uh, he spent some, yeah, he had, yeah, Rook A6 on the board. Yeah, Rook A6 very, on very the nicely, board. Very nicely done by, 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 by Shali. And the point is something that you pointed out earlier that if you manage to drive the king all the way to the back rank and then cut it off on the second, those positions are reasonably comfortably winning. And this is seemingly what is going to happen here because you cannot really avoid playing king g1 and then she goes rook a2. And then, uh, yeah, th those, are, uh, those are just uh, just winning because the king is so horribly misplaced. Yeah, the, still... those, those are just completely hopeless. Yeah, and, and just yeah. to finish my, my story with Hikaru, that he, he played a move like it was rook from a7 to b7 and it was somehow very unfortunate. It was the only move that was drawn. 
And then the people were coming that are according to computer, every move was winning. And then we asked because we were completely shocked. I also did not understand what is happening. And then it turned out that in every other case, he had the chance to return to the position where he didn't know how to win. Yeah. But I mean, come <laughs> on. It's a uh, it, yeah. few minutes on the clock impossible. Yeah, even this is, uh, I am, I'm sort of, uh, currently I'm sort of reading out what uh, uh, the engine suggests. It's still possible not to win this for black, even though it is now very, very clearly winning if you play king g4. The plan is, I think, the cleanest plan is to play king g4, then you play rook g5, then you play rook h5. And this... Uh, okay, so yeah, rook h, yeah, we, we're gonna see this, yeah? And then eventually you force, like, white just no longer has any options to stop the h-pawn without playing king g1 and once you play king g1 you're doomed because you you your your king is misplaced but yeah you're it's still it's still very very possible to uh to screw this up yeah but i i already feel the the strength in Vaishali because she had there this chance but it was still like something that she did not expect yeah but yeah. but now i think it's kind of logical in in her yeah. mind she <laughs> believes that now she is winning that's how i feel let me tell you something funny. According to my stream, King of Six now is winning, and King of Five is a draw. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't tell me this. Don't tell me. <laughs> Which I think is very enjoyable. Like, what the hell is this? Like, yeah. Well, it, yeah. it just shows that for humans, it's just impossible. Yeah. I mean, how? Yeah. Do you and and she goes. It? And she goes King of Five. And now if White finds Rook of Eight check, which is the only move you can even make because everything else allows a, a Rook trade. It is. Uh, but hang on. Then still after King G Five, she might be able to correct her mistake with King. No, F6. no. But then I go. Then I go King G One. I think. And you are okay. But because the opponent thinks that this was clever, it was correct. She will probably repeat. No. Maybe, yeah, it's possible. Rook of a check hasn't been played yet, but I mean, everything else you resign, so you kind of yes, have. Yes, exactly. Check, yeah. yeah, she's played Rook of a And now the big question, yeah, because if she continues running towards the queen side to avoid the checks, eventually, like, if the king goes far enough, then we go king g1, and we start at, yeah, king e5, we give a check from, we give a check from e8. No, actually, yeah, both king, king g1 and rook e8 now are enough for a draw. No, this is just. Uh, but I mean, I mean so this she did she make a move already? On my screen, she played king e five. Yeah. Ah, already she played king e five. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rook e check is played. It's I mean, fine. basically, I'm fine. I'm expecting her to give as many checks as possible, and only after try to play. Well, yeah, the, she wants to accumulate time. It's a very good practical decision by by Maria Jose. Yeah, I, I like this. I like this. It's just that. If if Vaishali realizes that going to to the queen side is pointless and goes king f5 king g5, it's important not to give a check from g8 because then after rook g6 you're lost again. <laughs> but yeah, I mean king f8 and yeah, and now it's time to play king g1 because rook f8 king g7 you resign obviously. Yes. Because the h pawn will will just win. But yeah, this is the big difference because there with with rook on g8 we would have been able to trade with rook g6 immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it's time to play King G1, but once again, because everything else loses on the spot, I think I think she should play King G1 quite comfortably, as far as you know those things go. Yeah, I mean otherwise you design. Wow. Okay, it's uh, it's super exciting, super tense. Yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, I've actually learned some things today because I've I've never really done any kind of proper studying of the FNH and game for to my shame. Um, you are not alone. I can I, I, I can I know. tell you. I know. So, somehow I felt like you know it's it's just such a thing. I mean I know that during the training camp, uh, Judith Judith Polgar and and Zoltan Almashi they both spent like one or two days studying this position from the Dvoretsky book. And I was like saying, oh my God, guys, what are you doing? I mean, uh, I, I know there are fanatics. Yeah. But, but I went biking instead. Yeah, uh, she, just, she, she, yeah. she, she, she's gone, uh, she's gone rookie one, so now she will lose, yeah. yeah. Such, a, such a cruel game, the, the, this, this chess game.
Yeah, chess is bull, and especially the end games. Yeah, without queens, when you you cannot hope for a chance. Yeah, yeah. now it's finished. Now it's gone because you you have to play rook h1, and obviously with the with the rook on on such a passive square, it's not even difficult anymore. Yeah, I guess she just did not believe she can draw with a king passive on h2, but because like her troubles began when she didn't play king h2 on move seventy nine. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so she she felt that putting the king. Uh, passively in the corner like this and allowing the f pawn to run is never a draw and uh it once again let her led to her downfall down the stretch because yeah like rookie one i mean she must know rookie one is losing so she really just did not believe in that setup with the king on g1 king on h2 but yeah this is just not difficult anymore because yeah, all the swung and then it's elemental yeah, yeah all the all basically all the pawn endings when you take on h2 are completely lost because the king is too far away giving black plenty of time to, you know, restructure somehow. It's just not difficult at all anymore. Yeah. Wow, I mean, it, it will be very, very important. And of course, if you can learn by playing and winning, this is the ideal scenario for, for Vaisali. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, for Maria Jose, it's it's heartbreaking. And uh, afterwards, when she will learn that, yeah, everything was draw and she could have held it, it will be it will be very painful, but she will learn a lot from this. Yeah, I, I think the biggest lesson is to to make sure that you are the one from the stronger side. Yeah, that that's yeah, you, it's, it's better it's better to be to be the side pressing. Yeah, just for your for your mental health. Yeah, yeah. No, just. I mean, she will play. she will play it out because it's a team competition, and you know. Uh, you, you you kind of should, but yeah. Now basically every every sensible decision is winning. Yeah, I'm I'm actually expecting rook h3 and king g4 very straight. Yeah, this is the simplest. Yeah, just go rook h3, king g4, and if the rook goes somewhere, you just go h1 check. You 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 don't have to be fancy. Yeah, it's on the board, and if king f2, then f3, and it's sub swung. Yeah. You can also play something like just just to illustrate how completely winning it is after king f2 you can also go like rook a3 and it, it also forces immediate resignation pretty much because the the pawn ending is completely lost and if the rook gets to a2 you also don't have very many hopes yeah basically yeah. just over and... and yeah she she actually took on h2 which i guess is what, what you do but yeah like you you you, you can and yeah they, and there she you see designed them so uh india wins uh three and a half three and a half half after this yeah three and a half half uh ukraine wins three one poland wins three and a half uh georgia wins two and a half because uh, uh maria rabidza did end up losing that position with the outside passer on the a file it wasn't enough in the end uh poland three and a half france there's still one game running, seemingly, but completely winning for Marisa Bach. So France will win 4 0. Azerbaijan wins 4 0. Uh, 3 1 for the United States. 3 1 for Germany. 4 0 for Armenia. 3 1 for Kazakhstan. There was some drama in the Abdum uh, Abdumali game. If we. Uh, uh, but I, you, I, we, we don't have those games. I think. Uh, you, this is too far, too far down, yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, apparently, in the Abdumalik game, in the final position, uh, uh, her opponent offered a draw in a position where first line is plus eight and the second line is plus five. Uh, but she is obviously outranking her opponent by about 400, well, 350. About 350, yeah. So you, you still see, like, this conversation will continue, uh, you know, being, being a topic during the Olympiad where uh, the the weaker players accept or offer draws or accept draw offers in positions where it feels like you know everyone should continue. But if if this is your first ever game against a strong grandmaster and suddenly you have an option of just ending it with a draw, a lot of people kind of freak out and take draw offers in those spots. Yes, I also wonder if, for example, in online chess, I don't think that uh, you would be influenced so much, yeah, because you don't see your opponent. But if if this super player is sitting in front of you, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and you feel the the physical presence of this uh, wonderful player, then 
I think it's it's even more difficult. Yeah, it gets it gets it, it gets harder. Yeah, it, it definitely gets more more difficult in that particular setting. And yeah, we I mean we we've already during the first two rounds we've seen plenty of those examples, and they will continue they will continue cropping up. Even though maybe there will be less of that because there will be fewer mismatches like this as the tournament progresses. The the field kind of compacts itself and. Uh, uh, you know, stronger teams start playing against stronger teams. So you will not get those games uh, where, you know, rating difference is so huge as much. But we will still be getting some and there will still be those those situations where people just uh, take seemingly completely absurd draw offers. Uh, and uh, yeah, the position that uh, Jean Saya had there really is quite something, you know, I mean, it's about as lost as, as you can get in a... Uh, in Italian. Yeah, well, in any case, today already we got a little closer to, to what we are about to witness in the next days. Yeah, mm -hmm. because now tomorrow we will have already many, many big, big clashes in both Absolute, the yeah. open and in the women's section. Uh, a lot, lot of dramas are ahead. I, I'm basically feeling like everything that we have witnessed so far was the warm up of, of what is about to come. Yeah, uh, it, it will only get closer, it will only get more exciting as the tournament progresses. And uh, yeah, a lot of fun covering it. Uh, so do tune in tomorrow for, for round three. We should have some proper, you know, uh, tight pairings at the top there with, uh, uh, with some very close clashes starting. I think from tomorrow we can expect uh, very, very close matches and it should be very, very interesting to talk about it. So see you then. Yeah, all the best. Bye-bye. With hundreds of players gathering from all over the globe, chess olympiads are something special. They're a celebration of diversity and friendship. And it really puts FIDE's motto into the spotlight. We are one family. With 187 teams in the open section and 162 in the women's section, the 44th Olympiad in Chennai, India, is the largest Olympiad to ever take place. In this course, I'm going to provide for you daily highlights, key moments, biggest upsets. 11 rounds. There's a lot of chess. <laughs> I am extremely excited about this tournament. What I like most about it is we've got our top tier guys. We've got the, the 2,700 plus crowd, including the boss, Magnus Carlsen. But you also have a lot of players that are north of 2,500 feet eh, that these guys are going to have to play against. And in the super elite tournaments, you see a lot of very solid openings. They have to take some risk. And as an openings guy, I'm super excited to see how the top guys handle those players a couple of tiers below them.